good morning all. It's a pleasure to welcome you all uh, here this morning. Uh, on behalf of IEEE Bangalore section, IEEE Signal Processing Society, uh, and also uh, the academia partner of this uh, uh, SPS forum, uh, BMS College of Engineering, uh, I would like to uh, uh, extend you a warm uh, welcome uh, for this uh, SPS forum, which is aimed at networking in the area of image and video signal processing. Uh, and, uh, probably during the session, uh, I definitely hope that um, uh, as we have the lineup of speaker who definitely uh, aim to bridge the gap between the industry and educational institutions. So with, uh, without much further ado, uh, we would be uh, kickstarting the session uh, right now. So I request uh, Mr. Bindu Madhava, sir, chair of IEEE Bangalore section to uh, formally uh, inaugurate this uh, forum and also um, uh, address us. Sir, over to you for the welcome address. Good morning, one and all uh, present here. And to welcome everybody for this uh, video analytics uh, processing, which is uh, very apt and uh, which has to be looked at uh, holistically uh, in the current scenario of applications which are there. So uh, I just thought that uh, with that uh, few initial uh, thing, I would like to welcome Professor Hari. Uh, of course, um, he is well known in our uh, section as well as uh, the IEEE at large. So, welcome to you, sir, for this particular uh, uh, workshop. And I would also like to welcome uh, the chair uh, of IEEE Signal Processing Society, Bangalore chapter, to this particular uh, workshop. And Basically, I saw went through the presentation, uh, the agenda thing. It is, uh, uh, I think, uh, the current which is there, which is being discussed, and it will be useful for all uh, the participants who are uh, present in this particular thing. So we would also like to in that section also we we have got a connect uh, uh, conference which is going on, and uh, a track is there in this particular area also. So, people interested, please uh, to uh, sort of contribute towards uh, that uh, connect conference uh, by submission of uh, papers. So, with this uh, thing, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee for uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Binduma Dava sir, uh, for uh, uh, welcome address. So, moving forward to the next agenda, we are elated to have with us um, uh, Professor KBS Hari sir, uh, who would be uh, providing an intro to IEEE Signal Processing Society. Uh, so, uh, uh, currently, uh, Professor Hari sir is uh, uh, associated with Indian Institute of Science, uh, Department of ECE, and also is serving uh, as Vice President membership of IEEE Signal Processing Society. Uh, sir, over to you. Uh, for your session. Um, thank you very much. Uh, if I can get the sharing privileges, I will be able to share my screen. First of all, congratulations to the IEEE Bangalore section as well as the IEEE SPS Bangalore chapter for uh, being able to secure uh, support from SPS uh, with this initiative of organizing this forum. Uh, the society did receive several such applications across the globe and uh, very few uh, could be supported. And uh, so I therefore congratulate the Bangalore chapter uh, to have secured uh, this support uh, from the society. So let me again uh, warmly welcome all of you. Uh, please do confirm if you're able to see my screen. Yes, yes, sir. Please. Thank you. So, uh, good morning to all participants. There may be some echo. Okay. So, I will present uh, a brief uh, overview of SPS and what it is, and uh, a quick uh, snapshot of various activities and possibilities. So who we are, uh, uh, so SPS is IEEE's first society established uh, in 1948. 
So we will be celebrating our 75th anniversary in 2023, and we would like to organize a host of events uh, starting uh, in that year. Uh, so I would like all of you to be uh, aware and participate uh, in this uh, celebrations. We are the fourth largest uh, society, IEEE society, and uh, we have membership across more than 120 countries. Most members are centered in regions 8 and 10, which means East uh, Europe, uh, Middle East, Africa, and uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, we have a large network of chapters and student branch chapters, and more than 1,000 volunteers uh, uh, actively work on various activities of the society related to conferences, publications, education, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we have more than 220 plus chapters and student branch chapters. Uh, there are uh, spread across the world. So in some sense, uh, this is, uh, you're all connected to a global network. And uh, a good idea is to connect uh, with each other and uh, learn from each other. And SPS would strongly urge uh, collaboration uh, or connection and working together across the globe, across uh, your SPS chapters and even other um, uh, Okay, so somebody wanted annotation. Okay. I don't know if that helps. Uh, it might be my mistake, sir. Okay. <laughs> so one by uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Fine. Okay. Yeah. So the chapter activities, of course, these are snapshots. So this is a global presentation. So snapshots of uh, what we can do: collaboration, technical talks, and social events. So SPS does allow you to have uh, uh, whenever the pandemic ends. Uh, or uh, allows you to meet uh, socially if you, in person, please, you can organize meetings. So what exactly does the society do? Uh, we do have uh, publications. So we have a signal processing magazine, which is um, uh, a magazine which is not like a research paper, uh, but uh, has information, uh, reasonably technical information for people to know what is happening, what is the cutting edge things happening in uh, the field of signal processing. The IEEE transaction journals are for research publications. And we do have a newsletter uh, where some of our volunteers from the Bangalore section, including uh, Professor Abhishek Appaji, has been, have been featured. Uh, we have a content gazette, which basically gives you the latest uh, publications uh, in uh, all the journals of our SPS. We have an SPS resource center where a lot of videos and tutorials of various conferences um, uh, distinguished uh, lectures, all these are stored in the resource center and members uh, can access it. Uh, and of course, there is a new journal of open journal of signal processing for submission. The, uh, we do organize a lot of conferences uh, and seasonal schools and workshops and forums. And this is one of the for one of the activities which you are participating. ICASP is a flagship conference and the first for the first time in India, it will be held in 2025 in Hyderabad. So I would strongly encourage all of you to start looking forward to it and uh, help us in organizing this. ICIP is the other flagship conference of uh, SPS and uh, ISB, which is a joint conference between EMBS and SPS. The first time in India, it will be held in 2022 in Kolkata. And the ICME is another conference which is jointly held with other societies like the Computer Society. And SPS does provide uh, discounted attendance for its members. Of course, now all the conferences are virtual. I would strongly urge all of you to register for ICAS 2021 uh, you know, in the virtual mode. and uh, participate and uh, take advantage of the uh, technical content and interacting with others. The student activities, uh, we do have student competition, signal processing cup, video and image processing cup, where teams from different uh, colleges can participate at the global level. 
We do also have a five minute video clip contest uh, where you can create videos on certain topics. And those are, uh, there is a jury and there is a public voting on, uh, public meaning uh, those who attend the conference will vote on what is a good uh, video clip. But Signal Processing Cup and Video and Image Processing Cup, I would strongly urge all of you to uh, participate, uh, form teams, get faculty members of your colleges to uh, mentor you and uh, make a bid because you can then showcase your ideas uh, at the global level. Of course, SPS also organizes job opportunities and uh, travel grants to SPS conferences. The shortlisted, uh, we, uh, let's say competitors or finalists for the Signal Processing Cup and Video and Image Processing Cup will also be provided travel support to go and uh, to the conference and uh, participate in the final competition. A lot of volunteer opportunities. Uh, we have uh, various opportunities. Uh, you can get associated with technical activities, membership, publications, etc. So please join SPS and uh, get involved. Students, it's just $1 membership fee. So uh, you, for all IEEE uh, students and graduate students, you just pay $1 and you will get uh, uh, the SPS membership. Of, and now there is a 50% discount for all uh, uh, students to even get um, IEEE membership. Uh, um, so therefore there is a significant reduction in the IEEE membership fee, student membership fee, and for SPS it's just a dollar. So please join and uh, uh, there is an app. We do have an SPS app, which gets uh, information from the website. So you can use, uh, download the app and see how we can uh, uh, get more information about this. The SPS team, which will globally uh, be responsible for interaction. We have uh, the following uh, people who assist me in uh, ensuring that all the information is uh, uh, sort of disseminated. We, of course, there is social media presence. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where some of these recorded lectures are being uh, uh, shared. Thank you very much. So I would li uh, like you to consider joining uh, SPS, consider joining IEEE and then join SPS. Thank you very much. I would like to again congratulate the organizers and thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to share a few words uh, about the Signal Processing Society. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Hari, sir. I think uh, uh, definitely a lot more students would be encouraged to uh, take up the IEEE membership and also be a member of IEEE uh, Signal Processing Society uh, with the insights that you have shared and all the events that is, uh, SPS is uh, doing throughout the calendar year. Uh, so now um, uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Uh, Sailesh uh, Sakri, uh, who is also uh, serving as chair of IEEE Signal Processing uh, Society Bangalore chapter. Uh, for folks who do not know Sailesh, uh, Mr. Sailesh has uh, 20 years of industrial experience in the field of audio signal signal processing uh, with uh, four approved patents and some more uh, in pipeline. Uh, so he has worked in the capacity of uh, director of audio algorithms in NOS, uh, formerly uh, Audience Inc. and manager in Amazon Lab 126. It is noteworthy to mention that uh, Silage was leading for delivering the Eco uh, Show series of products along with Amazon's first premium Eco product. Uh, Silesh was also responsible for delivering the EcoDot, uh, which is Amazon's leading Alexa device with close to 100 million devices sold worldwide uh, and also which has a user rating of 4.2 uh, uh, across uh, five star rating. So currently Silesh is associated with Herman International as senior engineering manager for DSP team responsible for delivering uh, car audio solutions like ANC, radio noise cancellation, noise, noise composition, audio equalizer, surround sound audio, and other audio feature, uh, features to major core audio manufacturers worldwide. So with this brief intro, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Silesh uh, to set the context and also share the opening remarks for this SPS forum. Uh, sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the brief introduction. Uh, First of all, um, I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, 
Abhishek Apaji for uh, leading this. Um, this is a very nice forum. When um, when he reached out to me for inaugurating this and uh, setting the context, and uh, I, the first question I asked him was that why not for audio and acoustics? <laughs> then he promised me that probably uh, next year we will have such a session. Uh, so I'll be very excited uh, uh, once we have that. Since I come from the audio and acoustics background, uh, so I think we should also conduct such thing uh, for audio acoustics. Uh, yeah, so uh, I've been asked to uh, set some context. I don't have a presentation, formal presentation like Hari sir did, uh, but I'd like to uh, talk about, briefly talk about um, um, on, I mean, uh, so what's happening with the video side and uh, how, I mean, it's progressing and uh, uh, the upcoming features and uh, all the applications that we are seeing. So I see that within this uh, forum, there's a, uh, lot of talks that have been organized. I mean, um, uh, talking about the medical image processing, uh, the 3D, uh, 3D video, uh, the acoustic source localization and uh, augmented reality. I mean, I, I wonder, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I wonder, I mean, uh, if we all look back uh, many years back, I mean, uh, the way how, uh, I mean, the do, there used to be only one channel, that's a Doodarshan, okay? And we all used to just glue to uh, those, some of those serials, okay? I, I mean, when I was a kid, we used to go to other houses to watch those serials, okay? Just one small TV with, um, and then the people, I mean, then it, the color TVs became popular, okay? And from there till now, look at the way no one would have imagined within a, a couple of decades it would have transformed to that extent right i mean we we have uh, uh, advanced all the i mean there has been advancement in the broadcasting there has been advancement in the display technologies there has been advancement in uh, the video processing itself and the broadcasting right just imagine so much of uh, i mean the, the kind of uh, video quality that we are able to see it on the televisions right now, it wouldn't have been possible without the advancement in all the video, um, um, the encoding that we have and uh, the display technologies that we have come all the LED display technologies, right? So, I mean, amazing, amazing uh, uh, research that has been going on. Um, so I remember when we started uh, as those pressures that, uh, we used to have those MPEG systems. The MPEG-2 video used to be very popular. And uh, the processes, the DSP process that we used to have was, I mean, the small. I mean, even running MPEG-2 with a 25 frames per second used to be such a challenging thing, okay? And now we have much more advanced technologies, which is the S.264. And S.264, even when S.264 was introduced at that time, uh, I mean, uh, the processes, I mean, were not able to catch up with it. So they used to, they introduced a special uh, um, uh, special processing to, um, I mean, hardware accelerators, introduced some of the hardware accelerators within the devices to enable the decoding of it. I mean, just imagine the S.264 encoding is much more complex than that, right? Now, I mean, um, there has been advancement in the semiconductors. There has been advancement in all the processing where we have the processing powers up to up one gigahertz, two gigahertz processors on the devices, which can easily decode. And the S.264 can go up to 30 frames per, per second or even 35 frames per second. And that's when you can, I mean, you will be able to see all those rendering with, with that precision. And not just, I mean, off late, there has been also advancement in the, the machine learning based, the DNN based uh, technologies where, uh, I mean, you can, uh, using the ML techniques, you can uh, do the inter-code prediction, the intra-prediction. Uh, so, I mean, you can do the probability distribution prediction. Um, so cross-channel prediction. So that's what uh, star 264 about. It was doing, I mean, adopting a classical signal processing method. Now we have a deep learning methods and now, the, what's happening is that there's always been a catch up with the research. The research introduces something, and to do that, to bring it to the reality, 
there are always the limitations on the devices side on the process side there's always a catch up going on between what you are doing on the research and what you are doing on the process side right so uh, they are all competing with each other but fortunately we are with all this competition going on we are able to get all the latest technology uh, i mean uh, i'm talking about just the video processing i mean the applications of all these video processing is uh, i mean not i mean the augmented reality after it has become a uh, i mean a key buzz within the industry um, just imagine i mean you have a live video going on and you're superimposing a virtual object within a live video to give that immersive experience where you'll be able to feel like a touch uh, i mean you you're wearing an ar glasses the ar glasses virtual reality and the, and the ar glasses and then you're moving around and then you want to see um, i mean instead of holding the uh, phone on your hand navigating through the google maps you can have the ar glasses where you can um, easily navigate you don't have to hold the phone it will easily um, assist you in where you want to go so you want to go um, grab something in the restaurant so you can easily go there i mean it will assist you and the same thing there's also been some work going on in the industry where they want to introduce these um, technologies on the car itself and where your the car glasses can you don't have to while driving you don't have to look into your gps just imagine i mean it's displayed on your uh, the window it's the the car glass on the front glass where it will easily guide you on take left take right right and then uh, say if you are looking for something um, on on your way where where are the petrol bunks where can i find the restaurants nearby so it can give you all those information and that will avoid uh, all i mean all the accidents i mean while you're driving you will have to focus on those gps as well as driving so that will take away your attention and you're superimposing the reality world along with the virtual world and that superimposition look at the processing and the precision the real time precision at which you will have to superimpose to give you the very very natural effect right so this is one of the application and one another application i mean i i think someone is talking about on the medical um, i mean advancement in the video processing in the medical field there's a lot of advancement going on over there i mean you can use this technology even say uh, an ambulance you have it or even in a car when you are going and uh, someone uh, um, i mean uh, um, someone fell sick and then you can switch within the mode hey uh, can you find the nearest hospital or can you find a nearest medical stores right then you are driving automatically it will say oh one kilometer from now is a medical store one kilo so it will easily look at the immersive experience that you are going to get out of it right so and then you will be able to save so many lives by doing that in going this way so these are the applications and the video securities right so the video securities uh, i mean you have the um, uh, you bring in the intelligence within the cameras i mean um, we have seen um, uh, i mean these days the um, uh, home deliveries the amazon home deliveries and flipkart home deliveries have become very popular and um, um sometimes they come and drop it at your doorstep especially in us it's pretty pretty common where um, they just i mean you'll not be at home you go and deliver it at doorstep and we have seen some of the cases where um, i mean uh, they pretend to drop it at your doorstep but they take back the uh, uh, but they take back the package so what they do is that whenever they drop it they take a picture and upload it okay and immediately they take away that package along with them it's a theft a lot of theft is going on especially once i mean with this pandemic coming in um, it's um, uh, uh, i mean all the people are working from home but still they don't it's a contactless delivery what we call it as a contactless delivery right so people come and deliver over there in front of it um, then they take away now how are you going to catch the thefts introduce some of those uh, security features within the camera with artificial with using the artificial intelligence it can uh, i mean it can easily see predict what is it going on and take the picture take the details 
and upload it to the cloud, right? Or intimate to, you know, no, hey, such a such theft has happened. You don't have to go and um, go back in the time and see at what time the someone picked up, right? So these kind of security things uh, are also becoming very popular. So bringing in a lot of intelligence in it. So um, there's, a, uh, I mean, um, all these fusion of the reality. I mean, it's not just limited to the video processing where you are um, able to see the entertainment, which is advanced entertainment. So there's a, you can use all these technologies in um, pre preventing certain things. Okay, so the, um, the I mean, with this pandemic, uh, government is trying to regulate masks within, um, uh, I mean, on the people on the road, right? So maybe you install a camera along with the AI, which will start predicting how many people are wearing the mask, right? How many people are wearing the mask and, uh, with that, I mean, um, it will. They will get a statistics. Look, there's a 20%, 30%, 40% people are wearing. Most of the people don't even wear the mask. Okay, so I mean, with that, you get the statistics, and you can figure out the way how we can enforce the people in uh, uh, wearing those masks. So uh, the applications are not limited. I mean, it's boundless. You can expand your horizons, right? with all those advancement in technologies. I think this forum um, is uh, definitely going to provide a lot of insight to a lot of people. Uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, the, all the uh, talkers um, who have uh, been listed over here, they are going to present uh, uh, the advancement in technologies. And more, more importantly is that how we can realize those applications, realize those uh, things the reality which is going to help the community is more important. Yeah, so like to yeah, end this talk. <clears throat> Abhishek. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, um, uh, very much for that insights, uh, Mr. Sailesh. Uh, and also uh, 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 sharing with us plethora of use cases and how you uh, image, uh, video, and audio uh, processing work in synergy to uh, bring out those use cases. Uh, and since we are doing this as a virtual uh, meetup, uh, so here's a virtual break, uh, thanking both um, Professor Hari sir and also you. Uh, we are uh, once again glad to have you as um, um, uh, the speakers in this SPS forum. Uh, thank you, thank you once again for uh, joining us and uh, motivating uh, uh, both the participants and also the lineup of speakers that we have for today and setting the context. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you. So, uh, uh, so, so moving on uh, with our first session uh, uh, from uh, Dr. Abhishek Apaji, uh, which is about uh, demystifying medical image processing. Uh, for uh, folks who are not familiar uh, with Dr. Abhishek Apaji, uh, he is currently associated uh, uh, with um, uh, BMS College of Engineering as Institutional Coordinator for R&D um, and also an assistant professor. Uh, he is also serving as a guest fac uh, faculty at uh, Maastricht University, Netherlands. Uh, he is a graduate of MIT Global Entrepreneurship Bootcamp specialized in New Venture Leadership. He obtained his uh, Bachelor's of Engineering in Medical Electronics with uh, university rank from BMSC, uh, Master's of Technology in Information Technology, and a Master's of Engineering in Bio, uh, Bioinformatics from University uh, of uh, uh, Vishweshwaraya College of Engineering, Bangalore. Currently, he is uh, a Chapter Coordinator Chair of IEEE uh, Bangalore Section, Treasurer of IEEE Computer Society Bangalore Chapter, Webmaster and um, uh, MD Chair of IEEE PES Bangalore Chapter and Advisor for IEEE e EMB BMSC Chapter. He is also serving as a uh, sorry for that. He is also serving as Secretary of IEEE Smart Cities uh, Marketing Committee. He has been a part of uh, more than 150 invited expert talks in various conferences, forums, and events. He has renowned laurels, including IEEE International Best Paper Award in Malaysia, Best Nodal Coordinator Award. It is noteworthy to mention that he is a recipient of Gandhian Young Technology, uh, Technological Innovation Award 2016 at Rashtrapati Bhavan, New Delhi. Uh, 
uh, elderly care hackathon uh, winner of class 5 uh, mit global entrepreneurship boot camp ieee mga young professionals achievement award uh, r10 yp achievement award and so more to the other laurels that he has got so with this brief introduction i would hand over this virtual podium uh, to dr abhishek appa ji uh, to share his insights on uh, the subject uh, uh, demystifying medical image processing uh, sir over to you yeah thank you chengappa Uh, so before i go on to talking about demystifying medical image processing i'll just tell you i'll take a minute or so to tell you about how this entire sps forum started so we applied from bangalore section we applied for ieee sps forum we had organized couple of events in 2019 uh, of, of ieee sps winter school on biomedical signal and image processing that was a huge success uh we thought we should again repeat it in different uh, for different kind of audience where we have today like mix of both uh, uh students academicians uh, as well as uh, uh from uh, industry participants also we have few of them so we want to bring these kind of forums to the participants doorstep so that we can do something really amazing in this space of uh, signal video processing uh so this was supposed to happen exactly one year back and uh, you know what happened one year back pandemic hit all of us very badly and everything became virtual and uh, now we are so comfortable with virtual that uh, we are used to it that's the new normal uh, it may go on till few more days or few more months we don't know when it will end uh, so we uh, we thought the pandemic will end by end of 2020 but uh, so we rescheduled this for november 2020 and it didn't happen and then we got directions from iep signal processing society saying uh, all the events have to happen uh, physical and it's not for uh, uh, i mean it can't happen physical we have to go on for virtual so this is bit little bit of story then i pulled up uh, ketan and uh, chengappa swarna and a few other people in from iep bangalore section prashant and we started uh, designing this event such a way that it will hit uh, a right audience as well as give right forum for people to discuss about very important innovations happening in signal and video processing uh, including images so with this uh, some of the things which i wanted to share before starting so uh, today i'll be discussing some of the projects which i've done over few years on image processing so i'll be just giving you clues because i've been given 20 minutes uh, in this forum so i want to use maximum uh, time on telling about some of the important things which i've done over the years in the uh, in the area of medical image processing and uh, then maybe uh, we can take you and a at the end of the session all the sessions so uh, yeah you already thanks chengappa for introducing me and i'll skip this slide so one of the amazing project which uh, we uh, we got funded from teng toxing hospital uh, i mean one of the neng teng fong healthcare innovation program from uh, uh, singapore and we started designing a smart eye kiosk for community screening where people can go around and they can get it screened just sitting at their doorstep or it can be uh, from uh, so this was some of the images which we had developed so what does it do is it will take images of your eyes and it will tell whether a person has some kind of very uh, uh, so very common kind of uh, eye related disorders like cataract glaucoma age related macular degeneration diabetic retinopathy and so on so forth the whole process was automated it's more like your atm machine you just sit uh, like how you go to your metro station with the metro card recharge or atm machine you just go and uh, just uh, keep your chin and get uh, your retinal images acquired and it will give you some of the uh, parameters about your eyes both anterior and posterior that is back of your eye as well as front of your eye completely non invasive no need of any drops or anything which we usually face this problem so we automated the entire process uh, by using xyz motion and there was a lot of image processing as well as optics involved in this this was the uh, first version of prototype uh, which we developed uh, it's really huge one uh, which we had developed and we have miniaturized it not really to the extent uh, but uh, a, to a certain extent and this uh, the first prototype we sent to singapore for clinical trials and later this uh, was taken over by one of our uh, research fellow and started his own company known as atoyos 
So this was one of the solution which was brought and more of automation and a kind of virtual reality and intelligence and artificial intelligence machine learning was incorporated. So the doctor can sit at his place and the patient can sit somewhere else and his, uh, uh, the doctor can invade into the eyes through using virtual reality. So that's what is the latest one which, which the company is trying to do. This is another product uh, project which we got funded from Department of Science and Technology uh, for uh, developing the indigenous X-ray machine. So X-ray, as you all know, it's the dangerous one. Very nice story. A short story to share was X-ray when it was uh, uh, discovered, uh, the Royan Gen by Royan Gen, he, uh, people started uh, going to his garage and getting his X-ray done for free. And uh, they even went to the extent that even the foot size, they wanted to check if their shoes is fitting in properly or not using X-ray. More like misuse of technology, I would call. So, but later when they got to know it's, they had rashes and all coming out, then they realized, yes, this is not really uh, uh, so, e so friendly. There is some plus as well as minus for X-ray. Then people started investigating more on this. Uh, so this, pro this particular project, what we developed was more of uh, uh, a kind of uh, portable one and very low cost one, uh, high resolution and very easy to use X-ray machine where we can uh, use the traditional X-ray machines. What we have in hospitals are the conical one where the exposure is around that organ where you want to, around that part of the body where you want to, want to take the images. But later we thought we will uh, do it more of a uh, linear wise that is uh, more of small, small line uh, detector. We started using it at only that particular part of the uh, body part being exposed rather than the surroundings so that the tissue is not harmed. So then we started stitching it at the images and we got wonderful images at the first uh, go and then we transferred the technology to our industry collaborator EHE for further development. So this was the actual machine. Uh, if you can see, uh, this was the actual machine which we developed and it worked only for extremities because it's so common uh, with the accidents that people get hit by uh, their uh, either legs or hands, they get uh, fractured and we wanted to image that. This was a room which we had to set up because of uh, multiple reasons that X-ray is, is dangerous. So this was our experimentation room, which was separately done in the college. And uh, so that was about two uh, products, which we have product kind of products, which we have developed. And uh, let me start some of the very interesting projects in, in the field of image processing, especially medical image processing. So we used uh, ECG as biometric for, uh, uh, you know, uh, ECG as biometric along with fingerprint and iris. So we took some of the ECG, uh, we acquired the signals of ECG from multiple people and started seeing if there is some similarity between uh, patients and how much is the dissimilarity. And we extracted some of the features, uh, the one which you can see on the image is PQRS complex. And then these features, we try to uh, see if there is some difference. And then also we try to see um, iris uh, recognition and uh, uh, we try to see what are the features we can extract. And also the uh, fingerprint, uh, the, the regular fingerprint, which is very famous in biometric. All these three, uh, three of them, we combined and we came up with uh, some multi, uh, multi-modality kind of uh, biometrics. So we usually believe in uh, BMS college, especially whenever we work with some of the projects, even for our students, as well as for our research, we always go along with our uh, uh, doctors who are present because they are the ultimate users. Uh, so we always believe that's also the Stanford Biodesign philosophy that involve your people at the start of your project rather than end of your project, who are, is the end users. So we developed a uh, system where <laughs> the problem which they pose saying that we have image, uh, thousands of image coming to us and we wanted to include, uh, we want to develop a database of those so that even when the doctor is not there, the endoscopy images are still saved and doctor can come and uh, come back later. So we started uh, developing, uh, we just put one image grabber and started acquiring thousands of image. Within a one week, uh, we had 20,000 such images of various kinds like polyp, uh, cancer, and uh, so on, so forth, different kinds of stages of tumor and things like that. After that, we started putting machine learning algorithm and we were able to classify those images. 
Another one which this was done along with the Stanford University Lucille Packet Children Hospital, where we acquired some of the images and uh, this was also another interesting project which we did was we acquired the images of pediatric cardiac ultrasound and we showed it to doctors by doing different kinds of uh, compression techniques. So we did singular value decomposition, discrete cosine transform and discrete wavelet transforms. And we showed to the images blind, blindly saying, these are three different uh, uh, compression techniques. Can you tell us which one is more uh, feasible for you to, uh, to use it for your clinical use even in future? So this, uh, we talked to around 10 doctors and they gave us wonderful feedback about each of the algorithm, what was they were trying to look, what they are not trying. Uh, apart from that, we did some of the vascular. Uh, so my research area is on retinal image processing. I worked on various modalities of uh, retinal images. Uh, this is uh, the image what you are seeing on the screen is retinal uh, images. That is optical coherence tomography images of the retinal layers. What you can see as different layers are the retinal layers. Uh, mainly this, uh, this is the part of, uh, which we, where uh, they are divided into different layers. Each layer is responsible for different kind of activities which is happening in the eye. So we extracted some of the parts in the sclera, sorry. Yeah, sclera, that is bottom part, which you can see yellow color. So basically in layman terms, we were trying to see what is the white part and black part. And can we differentiate it for the patients and the normal people like us? Uh, another one which we did was uh, uh, with uh, Dara Netrale about adaptive optics. This is again going to the micro resolution of the eyes. Uh, the images what we acquired from the retina that is going inside inside and zooming it to the maximum extent possible, we are able to see each of the retina vessels what you can see in the eyes. These are the vessels what you can see. The one which we wanted to do was wall lumen ratio. That is the wall what we have here and the lumen, the black color, which you can get, uh, the ratio of that will be different for patients and normals is what we wanted to do. So we developed a tool for doing this. Uh, this is again, another version of adaptive optics, still further zooming in out more into the vessels. We get rods and cones, uh, which are responsible for us to see the color images, black and white images and all. We performed Varna analysis. We, we found that uh, uh, there may be differences in the Varna analysis that is more like uh, the hexagons and pentagons and uh, squares, triangles, what you can form may be different for each of the images for normal people and also for patients. Uh, so this was another one which we did for uh, FFA, that is fundus fluorescence angiography. Uh, or it is uh, another version of it is OCT angiography, where we wanted to mark the one which is in between the size. Uh, some of the images of this, uh, uh, I mean, some parts of this uh, in between the eyes of three cross three or six cross three images. And we wanted to extract, extract again the black and white part of it so that we get some values. Again, this will be different for patients as well as novels. So this was some of the images we tried to take and we said, this is the affected area, this is a less affected area. And uh, we, once we extracted, we also published in one of the journals uh, to say about uh, how, how is this image is different for normal people and also with uh, macular type two disorders. Okay, so the other one which we did was uh, uh, oximetry. Oximetry is nothing but it's the uh, oxygen saturation. So if you remember uh, uh, now nowadays everybody is using oxygen oximetry machine just to finger pulse oximetry machine where they just put one clip to the finger and try to see how much is the oxygen saturation level. So similarly for even for eyes, the vessels if you take you can find out the oximetry value. So for this we are trying to develop a device for this, but uh, that uh, is out of the scope of discussions of today's session, but uh, already existing devices, we took some of the images and we tried to see if there is some kind of uh, difference uh, that we call it as ischemic index. That is the how much of the oxygen flow is happening throughout the uh, retinal part of the eye. Another interesting thing we started doing was retinopathy of prematurity. Uh, retinopathy of prematurity is nothing but uh, whenever a patient, uh, whenever a baby is born and if the baby is born prematurely less than like seven months, uh, uh, not exactly completing the term of nine months within the mother's womb. So they develop, uh, especially last few months of the pregnancy is when the babies will develop the complete eye. 
So the first few months is all other parts and last few months is uh, on, I mean, it will develop IE and all those things. If you see, there's a ridge here, which is formed because there is no for the retinal vessels, which is not going to the extreme of the retina. So this will form blindness and this became big hue and cry in India a few years back when a, uh, when a uh, girl went to the court and she approached saying, I was not detected with disease by the hospital. So we worked on this very extensively on different, different kinds of uh, 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 stages. So if it is early stage, uh, that is stage one and two, it will automatically get rectified. Stage three, four or five or plus disease is something where doctors should intervene and do some kind of uh, procedures so that they can correct it and they can try to remove this ridge and the, uh, the vessels can grow. Uh, Another one which we had done is age-related macular degeneration. This is also another kind of disease uh, uh, where if you see the image on the screen, someone who has AMD, they will look, uh, they'll see the image like this and someone who doesn't have like normal people, we see like this. So unfortunately, our brain trains our body such a way that anything goes wrong, it has auto-regulation property. It will say it is correct and it will get rectified. And many of them only in the advanced stage of their glaucoma or such kind of AMD, they'll get to know that they have problem whenever uh, they try to uh, see this. They, they think that this vision, which is seen on the screen is correct. That is unfortunate, but it's a uh, beauty of the brain that it tries to uh, solve automatically. Uh, that's why there are multiple, uh, this be the small things, what you see here are called as Drusen's. This Drusen's, uh, there are different kinds of sizes. Uh, based on the sizes and numbers, what you get, you can uh, you can you can classify into intermediate or large Drusen, medium Drusen, and, uh, a higher stage and uh, uh, you know starting stage of AMD. So we published few of the conf, uh, few of them. So these are last few slides. Uh, this is what I did for my PhD in Master's Universities. Uh, uh, so I used the retinal vascular features. Uh, can we use this as psychiatric disorder um, uh, for people with uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder is what, what I thought. So uh, we know that eye is an extension of central nervous system. So there is a lot of properties that eye uh, is connected to brain as simple as that. So there, the vessels within the eyes are connected to the vessels within the brain. So we try to see if there is some kind of correlation between them and if we can derive something in a lesser way, in a cheaper way, in economical way, and also more accessible way. Accessing brain vasculature is really tough, whereas accessing the retinal vasculature is just one photograph you take and you're, you get the image and you can do some kind of analysis. So this is me and my guide. Uh, we, we had around 100 healthy volunteers and 100 bipolar disorder, 100 schizophrenia. So you've seen multiple movies, right? Uh, like uh, the Onion movie or... Uh, uh, there is something uh, Apta Mitra if you are from Karnataka and there are a few movies where they have shown uh, different kinds of disorders. So we took schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, which is the early stage disorder, which happens around uh, uh, in very uh, uh, early stage of their life, like around 18 to 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Uh, so we took images of this and we compared with healthy volunteers. We took multiple features, the one which is listed on the right. Uh, so one of the features which we took was veins and arteries. What is the width of it within this range? So what was the width of veins and arteries? And we found that the healthy volunteers had veins, uh, which are of higher, um, uh, which are of uh, thicker uh, vessel caliber. That is the width of the vessel was thicker. Whereas in uh, schizophrenia and bipolar, it was uh, reduced to arteries. But whereas veins, if you see uh, for the, uh, veins, it was lesser and for uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, it was more, uh, more thicker. So another feature which we tried to take was vas vascular tortuosity. If you see the pattern at the bottom image, you see it's more like a zigzag pattern, which is uh, not uh, structured neatly like the one above. So these kind of patterns, we tried to quantify it using vascular, I mean, tortuosity. Then we found that for patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, they have higher tortuosity index than the healthy volunteers. Uh, another one was fractal dimension. Uh, if you see uh, the bifurcation or self-replication capacity of the vessels, there we saw that for the uh, one which is at the bottom, 
uh, it is less compared to the one at the top. So higher fractal dimension. So this geometrical patterns we tried to recognize and we saw that it was more in patients compared to healthy volunteers. Another interesting feature which we took was retinal vascular trajectory, which is the shape, what you can see is U shape. We tried to plot some points and come up with a parabola for this. And we found that the constant which was involved here had uh, uh, the constant which was involved in the parabolic equation that was lesser in, uh, in terms of arteries uh, for patients, whereas higher in terms of uh, for patients uh, in terms of veins. Another thing we tried was we took all these features and we wanted to classify using machine learning. We found that for healthy versus schizophrenia, it was giving 86%, whereas for uh, uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, it was giving 83 and healthy versus bipolar. So this was uh, kind of uh, even anything more than 80% is what, which we can use in psychiatry is what uh, some of the references have told. Uh, another test, what we did was memory test. So we use Cox State battery software to find out. We used to uh, put one card to the patient and as well as healthy volunteers and ask them, was this card same as the previous card? So in this way, we found out the speed and accuracy of patients and seeing if there is any kind of differences we could find uh, between patients and accuracy, uh, accuracy how accurately they had identified if the previous card is same as the present card and how fast they are able to identify. So we asked them to press a couple of buttons for that on the keyboard, on the computer. And we found that obviously this was anticipated. The patients had reduced speed and accuracy. But interestingly, there was correlation between the retinal vessel width as well as memory test. Uh, so another one which we recently have communicated for publication is we wanted to find out if there is some kind of correlation between the golden standard for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, that is MRI, if we can find out some of the parts of uh, uh, correlation between some of the parts of the brain versus retinal vasculature, we wanted to do. And we have uh, found that there is some kind of correlation and that's what we wanted to prove that there is a relationship between the eyes, uh, the vessels of the eye and the brain uh, vasculature. So this is what we had done. So this was some of the projects which I wanted to discuss uh, in this forum. So there is multiple opportunities in uh, uh, image processing, especially medical images. But one problem which I definitely everybody would agree is the problem with uh, data. So I I'm sure if there are some researchers here, somebody who's working in this field, uh, first thing they'll ask is sir, how to get the data, how to get access to the data. That's something uh, really challenging unless you have uh, some uh, very specific uh, uh, doctors whom you have collaborated. So mine was successful because I had collaborated with Maastricht University Hospital as well as here in Nimans for my PhD thesis. And if you see some of the hospitals like Narayana Netralaya, Narayana, uh, as well as uh, uh, Kim's Kempegoda Institute of Medical Sciences. So some of the hospitals really help us uh, to acquire the data, get us ethical committee clearance and so on and so forth. So with this, uh, thanks a lot uh, for your patient listening for around 20, 25 minutes. Uh, this is what I wanted to share in this forum and I'll be available till the end of this uh, entire uh, uh, event. So we'll have more of Q&A answers. And if you still have something, we can discuss on the chat window. So Chengappa, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rabhishek, uh, for uh, sharing uh, practical experiences and insights on some of the projects that you have worked on. Uh, the signal and image processing. So there is one question uh, from the participants uh, which says that, uh, is it advisable to compress medical images? So, Yeah, so uh, that's that's a really good question. I would like to take it right away. Is uh, medical image compression is one of the field. Now, uh, if you remember Moore's law, there is the, it's it's been growing uh, exponentially. The uh, technology is growing exponentially. Even the size where you want to share. You previously, uh, getting one GB of your space in your computer was like wow. Now minimum is one GB with everyone who are using computers. So the size of the technology is growing so fast. But still, when you see you want to do go ahead with the technology like deep learning and other things, of course your compression will help. But see, anything which is not field of your interest is noise, which you can compress and remove off. That's what we were trying to do in the pediatric ultrasound images. So we had certain images there, which is what 
were not clinical significant, we wanted to remove and use it. Yes, it is advisable uh, provided you have some constraints of space. Now, COVID-19 X-ray images is abundant images you have, but uh, if you want to really do some kind of processing, reduce the time of processing, do some kind of deep learning, machine learning, then your compressing will really help. But uh, yes, there may be some data loss that you have to do, uh, ensure that the important things are not lost. The unimportant things or that which is of not your interest are still uh, uh, removed and only the interested or important things are retained. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abhishek, uh, in explaining the nitty gritties of uh, compressing the medical images. Uh, so with this, uh, it's time to move on to the next session from Dr. Shivateja uh, Kakileti, who would be presenting a case or a case study of uh, image processing in uh, startups. Uh, here's a brief intro of Dr. Shivateja. Uh, Dr. Shivateja has five plus years of experience in AI ML for medical imaging. He is currently one of the key data scientists at Niramai. He previously worked in healthcare analytics group at Xerox uh, Center uh, Research Center India as a budding scientist for around one and a half years. Uh, he co-authored 18 international publications, one book chapter, and has seven granted U.S. patents. Uh, he was granted PhD degree by the Faculty of Health, Medicine, and Life Sciences of Maastricht University, the Netherlands. He received his Bachelor's of Technology degree with majors in Electronics and Communication Engineering and minors in Computer Science and Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. He is also a recipient of DAAD Working Internships in Science and Engineering Fellowship 2014 and was offered MIT ACS Global Link Fellowship in 2014. Uh, so with this brief intro of Dr. Uh, Shivateja, uh, I would uh, hand over the virtual podium back to uh, Dr. Shivateja for his talk. Thanks for the introduction. So, can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, but uh, if you are See having you. any challenges with the bandwidth, you can uh, try turning off the video. Okay, sure. Yeah. For some reason, my video is not displayed. Yeah. So, so we can see the slide decks. Uh, probably, if you can go to the slideshow mode, uh, it would be. Uh, all good. Yeah. yeah, good morning, everyone. So today I'll be talking about uh, mostly on the machine learning challenges when we want to develop an affordable and privacy awareness cancer detection. So this is basically what uh, we are trying to do at Niramai. And I'll briefly discuss about what are the challenges we have faced when we try to develop such a solution. The first question is why breast cancer? So breast cancer is one of the leading causes of cancer deaths among men. If you see the statistics, uh, approximately 627,000 women lost their lives to this disease in 2018. And uh, though the survival rates in countries like United States is 80%, when we see the statistics in India, 162,000 women were diagnosed in 2018. And 50% of the women lost their lives to this disease. And one of the main reasons for this is late detection of cancer. And in the research, it clearly shows that if we can detect the cancers early, the chance of survival is very high. Then what is stopping uh, in detecting these cancers early in, in countries like India? If you see the conventional imaging, which is X-ray mammography, ultrasound and MRI. So X-ray mammography is a gold standard currently, and it is applicable only for women above 40 years. As uh, Dr. Abhishek uh, has uh, clearly mentioned, that it images uh, the density between the tissues. So the principle here is that whenever there is a malignant tumor, it has high density. So what we try to find is a density difference between surrounding normal tissue and the malignant tissue. But for women less than 40 years or some women above 40 years, the tissue itself is dense. So it would be hard to find um, the density differences for younger women or women with dense breast. So it's only typically recommended for women above 40 years. But if you see the statistics in India, the cancer in, in uh, the cancer incidence for younger women is also increasing. So there's a gap in the screening modalities here. 
and also this x-ray mammography costs uh, very high and it requires dedicated space and dedicated voltage and since we're using x-rays so there is some infrastructure dependency um, so even though there is no cancer the repeated use of x-rays has can increase the overall chance of cancer so for these reasons uh, x-ray mammography has some of the limitations similarly ultrasound and mri if you see they typically recommend for an adjunct modality to mammography or for high density and again they have challenges of high equipment cost infrastructure dependency portability also uh, only ultrasound is portable uh, mri machines or x-ray mammography it's not easily portable but for ultrasound one of the reason why it is not uh, used in rural areas of india is that there's a chance of fetal sex determination due to this uh, we can't directly take ultrasound to a village and then do the screening and similarly to read all these images we need manual expertise and one of the reasons why women in india don't prefer uh, breast cancer screening is that they have to disprove whenever they go for uh, imaging they have to disprove in front of a technician which is not a comfortable thing for um, asian women so for this reason women don't prefer to go for imaging so what our problem we thought was can we develop an imaging modality which would uh, be suited more for an indian population so found that in the literature there is breast thermography so what breast thermography is that it just collects the temperature values that is emitting from a breast surface so the biological hypothesis here is that when there are cancer cells it requires more resources so for its metabolism it draws more blood through angiogenesis or formation of new blood vessels and pumps more blood towards the vicinity of tumor so this high metabolic heat would be tra uh, traversed to the surface through venous convection and tissue contraction so in the current uh, uh, in this last uh, two decades the thermal cameras have advanced a lot and now we are able to detect minor temperature variations up to 0.0 degree centigrade so with this whenever there is a cancerous metabolic activity we can uh, identify these variations using machine learning or uh, using machine learning so that is a problem which we are trying to solve and uh, the advantages uh, with breast thermography is that it can make the overall imaging a completely non contact and non invasive because what we are trying to do is just collecting the heat that's emitting from the body so we just keep a camera or infrared device and the technician or uh, uh, can operate this image from outside and the participant can go inside a room and sit in front of this device and without any contact we can get the temperature reading of the breast surface since we are not collecting any we are not sending any radiation we are just collecting the heat that's emitting from the body it's completely radiation free and these infrared devices are portable light small and low cost compared to uh, other existing uh, breast cancer imaging devices further since the technician is operating from outside the room it's privacy aware where no one can see the undressed woman and other uh, important thing is uh, breast thermography can work better for dense breast because what happens is when there is a dense tissue the conductivity of the tissue is more so even the tumor is deep it can traverse the uh, that heat can be traversed to the surface very quickly so for this reason women uh, it can work for women with dense breast as well so it can complement uh, the x-ray mammography where x-ray mammography which is good at uh, uh, for fatty breast the thermal imaging is good for dense breast but what are the challenges uh, when we try to interpret uh, this manually so these are two uh, thermal images which are captured as you can see the what the data we are collecting is raw temperature values so the, uh, in order to visualize we have to use some kind of false color palettes or pseudo color palettes to display these images to the doctor so here we have used this uh, rainbow color palette and uh, we have taken 25 degree centigrade and 39 degree centigrade and as you can see there is no uh, heat pattern or there is no abnormal activity but now if i change this uh, limit to 28 to 36 you can clearly see the significant increase in the heat pattern then how do you decide these temperature limits so that's a question here 
And this is the reason why there is a lot of subjectivity when um, in the interpretation of thermal images. And if you see the results in the literature, there is always a contradiction. Some, re some research shows that it's very good. Some research shows that it is very, um, it's performing poorly. And further, this high thermal activity is what we are seeing here. This can even be caused due to benign conditions. Now, how do we differentiate between a benign heat pattern and a malignant heat pattern? So for these reasons, manual interpretation requires high expertise and is subjective. So what we at Nehamai were trying to do is to develop a machine learning based solution, which can automatically interpret these images and generate a three page report, which briefly outlines different characteristics of the abnormality that is detected in the breast region. So to do this, we have multiple machine learning modules. I'll just show a brief demo and then walk you over what are the challenges which we have faced when we're developing these kind of uh, machine learning solutions. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, Dr. Shudhari. So this is a tool which we have created. So the doctors uh, or the technicians, whoever is using your solution, whenever they take an image, they will upload in this tool. And everything happens in the cloud so that whenever we update our machine learning solution, it is accessible to all the people, uh, whoever is using this solution. So for example, if there are patient ID, uh, some patient came and they will enter the patient ID. The scan day, age, and we also collect other clinical details, which would be helpful for the doctor, because whenever a doctor is giving a report, he would be uh, interested in knowing some of the clinical and breast cancer risk factors that are associated with the patient. This would help in giving a personalized re uh, screening recommendations for the patient. So it's observed that early menopause and uh, patient complaints and any kind of cancer history like uh, breast cancer, ovarian or previous uh, cancer uh, like breast cancer, ovarian or mastectomy and hormonal therapy, if they're going for hormonal therapy, there is a chance of, uh, uh, there's a high chance of cancer. And if the family cancer history also is present, then the chance of getting cancer is also high. So for these reasons, um, we collect all this information so the doctor can give a personalized uh, screening recommendations for the patient. So in this scenario, if I give some dummy values, so the next task is to upload the images, whatever we have captured. So the technician uh, will capture these images uh, remotely so that they don't have to see the patient. And uh, they upload the images. So these are the five images we capture and why we capture five images is that uh, as you can see in one view if you take frontal view we are not seeing the heat pattern clearly and in this view we are cle uh, we're clearly seeing the heat pattern so always one heat view or one one view itself might not be sufficient because sometimes the tumor can present inside in those scenarios frontal view would be better and in these kind of scenarios lateral or oblique views might be better and one of the challenge which we have seen is that whenever the technicians take these images, they might mislabel the images. And one of the main confusion there is uh, labeling these uh, left views and right views. As you can see here, the uh, breast region is present on the left side. Uh, uh, so they name it as uh, left oblique, but it is actually the right breast for the patient. So due to this confusion, uh, they just upload with the wrong label images and this might uh, cause uh, effect, this might uh, hinder the analysis. So we have an algorithm which automatically checks whenever they upload the five images, it automatically checks whether the views are correct or not. So this machine learning algorithm, what we're using, it's not predicting uh, this is left oblique is expected, but this doesn't seem to be left oblique. 
And similarly here, right oblique is expected, but doesn't seem to be right oblique. So it just throws the error and um, it gives an option to recorrect. If that is uh, correct, then they can recorrect and it automatically corrects the, the view angles. And we also collect some of the clinical test examination, which would again help with the personalized screening recommendations. And now the next task is uh, we are collecting the images from head to uh, from neck to abdomen region. But all we are interested is in the heat pattern that is coming from the breast region. So we need to segment the breast region from these images. So manual segmentation of these images uh, is laborious and also it takes a lot of time. So to automate this, we have an uh, CNN algorithm which automatically segment the breast region irrespective of you. So as you can see, the polygon ring which uh, is displayed here, it's automatically predicted. And if the technician wants to adjust, they can adjust it. If sometimes the algorithm is not predicting well, then the technician uh, can adjust these uh, polygons. And then they can save and then move to next. So as you can see, the algorithm is pretty accurate. It can segment the breast region as uh, close to a human segmentation. And uh, when we compare these results, we have seen that the dice index which we are getting when we are segmenting the breast region is close to a human expert. And now once we segment the breast region, we analyze it. So for analysis, what we do is uh, we extract uh, some thermal radiomic features uh, which describe and detect the uh, lesion that is found. So in this scenario, we are seeing on the right test there are two hot spots and uh, there's 4.9% uh, area and irregularity is 7 and the distorted is 7 and there is 1.46 uh, centigrade increase with respect to surrounding region. And when you see the left breast, there is only one major hot spot and it is occupying 37.3% of the region of interest and the irregularity is high which is 8 and the temperature difference is also high. So it means a little bit suspicious. So what we do is once we generate this report, the technician will submit to an expert uh, radiologist uh, who will be sitting somewhere else and uh, as soon as uh, they submit, it will be reflected in his system. So the, uh, the expert can then The expert can then uh, test this in, uh, can view this image in, his, in uh, their laptop. So they can see all this information, what uh, the technician has entered. And they can also see the analyzed images. And if he wants to do his own analysis, he can also do like, he can see the raw temperature values that is on the breast region. And he can change the temperature palettes. Uh, as I said, uh, different, different temperature limits might change the, the view of the thermal image. So this entire thing, uh, he can do his own analysis along with the auto-generated analysis, what we're doing here. And the algorithm also automatically predicts some right breast impression and left breast impressions, like uh, here there is ill-defined and mild speculated regions are found. Here there is thermal increase seen near aerolar region. And ill-defined and highly speculated markets are observed. And we also give that this is deep pirates file and a follow-up is required in these quadrants at these clock positions. So if uh, the expert also thinks the same, they can accept this and then they can certify the report. Once they certify the report, it is reflected at uh, the technician end. And they would be able to see this uh, a three-page report, which basically describes the breast region and uh, also the final conclusion given by the doctor. And thermal images, a set of thermal images are shown with all the markings. So we did the vascularity that is seen and uh, we did the uh, abnormality and we mark it with blue color uh, boundary. So everything is automatically generated and given to the patient. So this is the overall flow that happens uh, for the thermal imaging. So let me get back to the slides.
Yeah. Yeah. What are the challenges when building these multiple machine learning models, which you have seen? One is segmentation, one is uh, tagging of these images, and the analysis. So the main uh, challenge here is data collection. Since uh, thermal imaging is not commonly used, so we have to go and explain to the doctors about its usage and explaining it uh, also implementing is a difficult thing especially for medical imaging because we need to have an ethics committee approval which also takes time in some hospitals it can be as well as uh, six months uh, uh, we have to wait for six months for the doctors to approve the uh, study and once they approve we can't directly go and take the images randomly we need to take the informed consent form from the patients and we need to explain and only when they accept then only we can take and even when they accept, some of the studies require us to sponsor the medical insurance. So, so the, data, the overall study can be costly depending on the total amount of subjects we are collecting. And um, also that uh, since the breast cancer incidences are slightly lower in the sense that there will be only four malignant women if we are screening thousand uh, asymptomatic women or four to eight uh, malignant women. So in order to get even 100 malignant women, we might have to collect 10,000 women and doing collecting that study would be too costly and also it is uh, it requires a lot of time also because the incidence is low and the velocity at which patients come to hospitals are also low like you might get at most in good hospitals you might get 20 to 30 patients so even to collect 10,000 20,000 subjects we need to wait for months to get the data and the variety of data because we are talk, talking about uh, different breast cancers so we need to collect variety of data that is uh, for our machine learning models to learn and since we are collecting only few samples even for collecting 50 60 samples you need to uh, get for 20, uh, 10 thousand subjects or 20 thousand subjects so we'll be ending up with low variety of data so how to uh, improve the data is one of the challenge So the next one is uh, ground truth itself. So many of these imaging modalities, if you see, the ground truth is plays uh, plays a crucial role in validating any of the machine learning algorithms. So the subject uh, there is a lot of subjectivity expert annotation. So if you take talking about X-ray mammography, and if you consider the results of X-ray mammography from the radiologist, X-ray mammography with radiologist itself is not hundred percent accurate. It is only 90% accurate, so can't completely rely on the expert annotation. So we might need to follow up uh, the patient for the longer periods and then know whether they're really malignant. So that would be known if it is a positive case by radiologist, we have to confirm with a biopsy. But if it is a negative, we need to follow up for a certain amount of time so that we are ultimately sure that they're negative. So because of this subjectivity with the expert annotations, many times what happens would be in many of the open source uh, data sets uh, where uh, expert annotations, how they got the ground truth is not clearly mentioned. When we train the models uh, with those kind of labeling, when we test it on real world scenario, the results might not be appropriate. And because of the data collection, uh, which I have described, uh, which is uh, time consuming with low velocity and low variety, and also too costly uh, process, we see very uh, few uh, open source data sets that are available. For thermal imaging, there is only one publicly available data set. And even there, the expert annotations were not clear. So when we train the models uh, with those kind of expert annotation, and when we tested on a real world data set, the results were not uh, appropriate. So we have to collect our own data set uh, and uh, train the machine learning models. And as I said, uh, so it might require follow up for longer periods. And depending on the use case, this follow-up can vary from uh, a lot, like, uh, from some six months to one uh, five years. So if you're talking about uh, breast cancer, the doctors, whenever they get doubt, um, am I audible? Yes, yes, Dr. Shoteja. Okay, sure. Yeah. So whenever the doctors uh, follow up, um, if there is any abnormality, they typically recommend for six months follow-up just to check if it is uh, real and negative or it is standing out to be positive. 
But if you're talking about scenarios like uh, treatment therapy and these kind of things, we need to follow up to get the ultimate ground rule, whether the treatment is working or not, we might have to follow for five years. So, yeah, so it takes more time um, and to collect the data uh, for some of the medical imaging problems. And the data sets could be imbalanced because of the incidences itself. We have only four sample, four uh, positive samples, four to eight positive samples for 1,000, uh, uh, yeah, 1,000 uh, total images which were collected. So imbalance is a major problem and uh, we try to deal with these kind of uh, uh, medical imaging uh, problems. The next one is choice of ML algorithms. There are uh, recently, there, I mean, there are two main types of machine learning algorithms which are typically followed. One is feature driven approach where we extract some semantic uh, features um, which are explainable and there are data driven algorithms which are um, which directly learns from the data. So feature driven algorithms are uh, involves extracting uh, features from the images and then using traditional machine learning classifiers or neural networks to finally classify whether there is some abnormality or not. Whereas data driven algorithms for medical imaging it typically involves uh, directly feeding the raw data without extracting any features feeding to a convolutional neural network model or any other variant of the deep learning model to get the final output. So there's a trade-off between feature driven and data driven. So for data, data driven approaches, the data set we need to get good results is a little bit high when compared to feature driven because in feature driven, we are explicitly using domain knowledge or statistical relevance, we're extracting features. So due to this reason, the amount of data set we need might be low when compared to a data driven approach, which explicitly learns from the entire data. We are not giving any additional information. And the other trade-off is that uh, the use case of uh, when to use a feature driven a data driven approach. For example, uh, in the tagging and segmentation, we are currently using deep learning. So we use a CML architecture for, uh, for um, we use ResNet 50 for tagging the images. And we use VNet architecture for segmenting the best thermal images. In these scenarios, the use of deep learning is okay because whatever we're predicting, we are displaying to the uh, technician. And if they are not happy with the results, they can they can ignore the result what we are showing and they can skip it and then go ahead, or they can even modify the segmentation points and then go ahead. But when we're talking about analysis, if you directly give whether it's a positive or negative, it is very difficult for a radiologist or a doctor to take a judgment. So in this scenario, what we try to do is we try to extract feature driven approach. So we identify the vascularity. So we know that whenever there is a breast cancer, there is a high, uh, there is high amount of vascular activity. So we try to extract the blood vessels and extract the blood vessel features. Similarly, the heat pattern, the vicinity of tumor increases. So to capture this, we extract a set of features like fractal dimensionality, irregularity of the uh, tumor and temperature increase, asymmetry between the menstruations. So like that, we extract features and then we train different machine learning models for classifying whether it is a positive or uh, positive for malignancy or negative for malignancy. So what it helps is that uh, whenever we give a final decision of it is positive or negative, the doctor can also correlate uh, with the features what we're displaying. As I shown in the report, we mentioned this temperature increase. So typically, uh, the thumb rule for thermologist is that if it is greater than two degrees, then it could be a uh, malignant uh, heat pattern. And similarly, if the irregularity is high, then it could be a malignant uh, uh, heat pattern. So these kind of features we uh, extract and then uh, we give along with these uh, features the prior prediction. So that way it would help the doctors in taking cautious decision. At the same time, we also, uh, when we extract these features, we're also displaying the tumor boundary and vascularity that is seen in the breast region. This also aids in visual analysis uh, for the radiologist. And um, developing a solution and deploying is uh, a difficult task, especially when you're talking about medical imaging. So uh, this is one of the um, very good drawing from uh, the paper. So it typically, uh, when you have a use case, so for example, in uh, 
uh, in the scenario of the best cancer. So the, there's a use case. The next step uh, involves data access and anonymization because we can't, uh, due to the HIPAA compliance, we can't take any personally identifiable information. So whenever we collect the data, we need to ensure the data is properly anonymized. So that's also a task which we, when we try to collect the data, which we employ. And then annotation. Because we are collecting these images, uh, how would we annotate? And this itself is another, another challenging task because labeling uh, requires the radiologist to draw the markings or we need to follow up with the patients for the final ground rule, which are more costly. And then once it is done, we need to have an ML model development. So we'll come, we will either say feature driven approach or a data driven approach. We will build some machine learning solution. And then there will be an algorithmic audit where the expert clinicians, uh, they just review the overall algorithm, whether it is uh, proper or not. And then we need to show a multi-site validation. So this involves, uh, once you have machine learning model developed, you're not allowed to change any of its parameters. You just need to deploy uh, blindly in different, different hospital sites. And then you need to blindly evaluate your solution with respect to the standard of care. So in this scenario, when we try to compare our solution, uh, what we did in uh, Narayana Pradyalaya and the HCG. So we have deployed our machine learning models there, and then uh, we blindly compared with the standard of care, uh, standard of care uh, for the hospitals. And then after a uh, certain amount of subjects, which is uh, predefined sample size, um, we compare our results with respect to the standard of care and say whether it is inferior to the existing standard of care or not. So when, once this uh, non-inferiority is achieved, then we need to take the regulatory approvals. Like uh, if we are going to Europe, we need to take CE certification, or if we go to the US, then we have to take the FDA certification. Then a clinical integration. So where once we get the certification, we need to integrate with the hospitals and each hospitals have its own set of IT requirements. So some of the hospitals uh, might not uh, be interested to post in cloud solutions. So in those scenarios, you need to have solutions that are deployable at uh, the hospital side. Then the challenge is how would you frequently update uh, the models? Because the machine learning models, which improve with more and more data. And if you're not getting the data, then the machine learning model performance saturates. So how would we take this, how would we build an online offline mechanism where even though we don't transfer the data, how can we transfer the weights? So there is something called as distributed learning, which basically, which basically um, gets the weights from these hospitals instead of the data. So that is a uh, one uh, uh, integration which has to be required, and the other one is user acceptance. Because giving a uh, giving an ML solution for hospital is not sufficient. We have to work with the doctors and understand how we can make it better. So in our scenarios, when we started, we just gave the scores, and then doctor said that it's not sufficient. We need more descriptors that can tell us whether it's malignant or not. So we started showing the features. Then also they said, uh, okay, we're showing the features, but how would I correlate in the images? Can I show the images with boundaries and the vascularity? So whatever I'm showing, they can visually correlate. So we have developed. So this kind of uh, user acceptance, we have to bring in. And real world surveillance, where you continuously monitor your models and see whether there are any kind of potential bias that might be introduced in the training or any kind of flaws that might happen. So this is a 10 step machine learning workflow which is typically seen uh, in any kind of uh, medical imaging startup. And it is very different and very difficult, uh, especially for medical imaging, where uh, if you're talking about any other uh, use cases of machine learning, for example, face detection, you might not see these many use cases. You would be seeing only one, two, maybe four steps. After that, uh, they will be having direct deployment and they have user acceptance and surveillance. But for medical imaging, you need to follow this eight, seven, uh, these four steps where you audit the algorithm, you do the clinical side and uh, clinical integration. This is a major challenge for startups because these four steps take a lot of time because we are talking about multi-site validation and there's inclusion criteria. So it takes a lot of time to get this and similar regulatory approvals. You need to submit to different, different regulatory boards, which themselves take uh, six to one, six months to one year time and also integrating itself also takes time. 
So this is the reason why medical imaging startups require a lot of time for their growth. Yeah, maybe um, yeah. that's it. Thank you. But to take, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shivateja. Um, uh, for now, I don't see any questions. Uh, once again, I request all the participants <clears throat> to feel free to post in their questions here in the chat window so that uh, our panelists can take them. Um, also, we would like to keep the session interactive. So if you have any questions, uh, if you don't want to type in, please uh, raise your hand so that we can unmute and you can speak um, and uh, converse with our speaker. So uh, moving on uh, to the next session. Um, uh, so, so Dr. Shivateja, I, I hope that you would be hanging around uh, for quite some time. So if there are any questions, uh, we can we can take that or probably we will connect with you offline uh, if there are any questions pertaining to your session. Sure. Okay, so there is okay. There is one question as we speak. Uh, so, which reads, uh, where can we get the image data sets for the academic research purposes? Right. So, uh, recently, many of the conferences and journals they're increasing to open source the data sets. Specifically for radiology, there is uh, something called as cancer image uh, archive. So, you can just Google it, and uh, they have multiple uh, uh, radiology images. Uh, especially for cancer and these kind of things, they have open source the data set. Even when we're talking about uh, chest x-rays, NIH from US, they have uh, open sourced uh, close to 1 million data, 1 million chest x-ray images. So nowadays we are seeing this trend of where the journals and even the government is encouraging people to open source the data set. So you should be able to use those data sets. But Thank you, you. Thank you. Thing which you need to consider is that whenever you take any kind of open source data set, just check the ground truth. What is the, how they're getting the final ground truth and is it the ultimate ground truth? Because that, that is very important when we're trying to deploy your solution real world scenario. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, response, Dr. Shuteja. So moving on to our next uh, talk on 3D multi-view video. Pushing and expanding the envelope, we are uh, elated to have with us Mr. Sanmati Baram Gowda. Mr. Sanmati is leading the video team at uh, LIA Inc. headquartered in Silicon Valley. He has obtained his uh, master's degree from San Diego State University with a thesis focusing on region of interest video coding with H.264. He has been in the industry for over a decade with various aspects of uh, video domain, including real time streaming compression and transport. His current role entails video processing for 3D multi-view holographic displays for automotive, retail, medical, and consumer applications. He is actively working with uh, efficient encoding strategies for transport and storage of 3D videos on mobile devices. So, Mr. Sanmati, over to you. Thank you, Shengapa. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Please let me know if you can hear me. All right, and then I can share my slide. Yes, we can hear you uh, loud and clear. Uh, you also have the presenting rights, so you can try to share from your side. Yep. Okay. Okay, can you see my slide now, hopefully? Uh, no. Uh, 
earlier we could see it so we are not able to see it now yes it's coming up yeah all good okay Uh, we lost the screen again. Can you see? Yeah, we can. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm really sorry. So thank you so much again. Uh, yeah, I can also turn off my. Uh, yes, please. You yeah. mentioned, but uh, again, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the. Uh, to the organ committee, and you really and uh, this so the agenda uh, is mostly I'll be thinking about then uh, hope. Sanmati, uh, sorry to interrupt. Minute. I think uh, we are losing you Shorts. intermittently. Uh, I, I guess like uh, we are uh, seeing some bandwidth issues. Probably if you can okay. turn off your video feed uh, and uh, only uh, come on the uh, yeah. Probably you want to uh, yes. go over again so from start. Yes. So I've turned off the video. Hopefully the audio will be fixed. So I was saying it's it's a privilege. I thank the organizing committee again. I'm really enjoying uh, the talk, especially Silas Sirs and you know what with the two sessions which started off the forum. So in my uh, 20 minutes, which is really short, but I'll be painting really broad strokes of uh, video processing in general. Uh, first of all, before talking about anything involving pushing or expanding the envelope, probably I'll spend a few minutes talking about what is the status quo. You know what is the state of things currently, so that then I can quickly touch some. You know, which is involving, uh, you know, push this and trying to go beyond uh, the existing horizon. I also want to quickly show you a demo. I mean, given how it has started, I doubt. Uh, but I, just, I mean, by demo, I mean, I quickly want to show you uh, some 3D videos and some light field videos, which I have on the tablet. But hopefully, uh, you know, that will get through. Uh, and then, of course, questions, hopefully. So. Yes, I mean, I work for Leia. We are based out of Menlo Park. I lead the software team there. We deal with anything video uh, and we are a small startup. It started off from uh, a physics uh, PhD thesis of my founders. You know, we are basically a display company uh, around which we have built software to leverage uh, uh, 3D and multi view and light field and whatever uh, involves immersive view. And I'll be touching upon that. Uh, during the stock. Okay, so this is, I mean, uh, you know, I will be making a lot of generic assumptions and I'll be making very simplistic statements just to ensure that, you know, if there are member audiences in, in the stock who have, uh, you know, little exposure to video, they can also take away, you know, uh, some interesting uh, thoughts to, you know, ponder over after the talk. So this is sort of the big picture. So anything you see, anything you consume probably can be put in one of these bins. Uh, so video generation means, you know, wherever the video originates, you know, it could be from your cell phone camera, your web camera, uh, RTMP streams, you know, which, you know, or any, even uh, the stream, which is being fetched by the nearest CD and by your Netflix app, for example. So that's what I mean by video generation. Uh, video processing involves uh, transport, and anything which involves uh, transcoding and transmuxing. So that's when you're taking that stream and doing everything to ensure it reaches uh, the weakest network or the most uh, uh, oldest device, for example. So that means you're supposed to have an encoding ladder. You're supposed to transport it to different bits. You're supposed to set up the streaming configuration, for example. So that will all be in video processing. And then video consumption is, of course, uh, the eventual playback. You know, you might be looking at it on a TV, on a phone or a tablet, whatever it is, consoles. Uh, so that would be in this bin. So as every 
other technology in the 21st century, each of these bins influence the other. So if there is any progress or if there is any, uh, you know, breakthrough technology, let's say in the display, it immediately, uh, you know, it immediately forces or rather motivates the other two bins, for example, to catch up. So, so it, it happens in every other industry. So if there is a new display or if there is a new hardware, for example, which does 8K. So immediately your processing pipeline you know, where it generates the video, for example, the capture cards and your transcode latencies, everything needs to ensure that the latest uh, breakthrough in the technology is, is, is able to reach the end user. So that's, that's the whole objective. Uh, so that being said, uh, most of the video, so when you say video processing or video engineering for the longest time, the problem domain has been of compression. So the whole uh, the video dom domain has rested on the fact that the number of bits on the wire needs to be lesser and lesser by the day. Uh, given the fact that, you know, video has reached, you know, 4K and 8K are becoming normal now. So that would mean more number of bits uh, on, this, on, the, on the wire and more number of bits to process and hence, you know, more number of bits eventually uh, to be played back on the end device with, with you know, network constraints constraints or device constraints or memory constraints or whatever. Uh, so for the longest time, if you if you if you have no idea about video processing or if you're a layman to this field, so you can think of this as a you know a very simple problem where you're supposed to convey more. So it's a classic information theory compression problem where you're supposed to convey as much with uh, little bits. So that pretty much uh, sums up uh, the two the first two bins, which is video generation and video processing. So that that's uh, so there is AI and machine learning off laid and there is cloud processing. Uh, so, I mean, there are a lot of research and development and industry and academia projects happening, catering to this kind of a problem uh, where you're using whatever you can to predict or to detect what's coming up in a video so that you could be more intelligent with respect to the bits you, you allocate for that. So what I'll be talking on, uh, uh, I mean, today's talk will be about the last bin, which is the video consumption. So you can think of, you know, that's where I'll be talking about how do you push the envelope, right? So if you're seeing something on a phone or a tablet, so what would it mean uh, to actually go one step ahead, right? I mean, so bigger phones, bigger screens, 8K videos, HDR is a thing now. So there is so much happening with color signs because they want to show you, uh, you know, the darkest of the blacks and the whitest of the whites, you know, just to ensure the contrast is so high that it's it's a crisp picture wherever you're sitting. So that's pretty much uh, within the video consumption bin where you're trying to push that envelope. Uh, so one uh, other part of that is also the experience, which I'll be uh, touching upon, uh, but this is the big picture. So this is where everything, you know, which involves video would 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 be fitting into. So, so where are we? I mean, the picture on the left is pretty much the origin of anything which is uh, a motion picture today. So that's a bunch of photographs of, of a horse actually at different instances, which eventually became, uh, you'd be surprised, it's, it's a three second as about the IMDB rating is about 7.2. You can imagine the importance of that, you know, which it started, you know, what is video today. Uh, so on the right side, of course, I wanted to show you a very nice 8K display probably or a VR headset, but I just, you know, this is, uh, I think literally a couple of days back, this is one of the screenshots of, of a tech magazine where Zoom, which is a very popular, you know, thanks to, uh, you know, what has happened over the last year. Uh, so Zoom has used new SDK to help, you know, all the people involved with video to, to uh, uh, just tap into all the stuff uh, uh, a video tech stack can offer without having to code anything. So this pretty much sums up as to how far we have come. So, so I'm sure, you know, few of you must know, uh, uh, or you must have heard of, there are six Ds to any exponential technology, right? You're supposed to start with digitization and it ends with democratization, right? So that's when, uh, when technology becomes democratized, when everyone can use it, and, you know, be a part of that experience is when you really flag off a technology, uh, uh, 
you know, when you can really say the technology has gone through the full circle. So this pretty much was true with video today, where uh, most video used to be a very niche uh, area, you know, but now, you know, where everything, every company big and small does uh, video in some form of the other, you know, be it an insurance company, medical company, everything involves a video chat. So this has enabled a lot of video companies to provide off the shelf solutions. And that's a good place to be for a technology because that's when it means that, you know, it's democratized. So it, it's, it's gone through the complete cycle. As I say. So this is the video score, you know, it's extremely, uh, you know, it's everywhere. Uh, there are off the shelf solutions. You don't have to know video to put that in your app or in your web application or browser, uh, you know, so, so that's. That's a good place to be, but the research hasn't stopped. But and you know, whoever is in this group with what IT of fields, there is so much to be uh, dwelled into, and this is just the beginning. So, as I touched upon in the very first slide, so video engineering, you know, this is again very simplistic view, but this, you know, pretty much sums up whatever uh, involves video engineering in each of those things, which I showed you in the first slide. So reduction of bits, always a classic problem, H.264, HEVC, VVC. Uh, so all of these, if you haven't heard, are just coding standards, right? It's, it's you know, you're supposed to encode a video. There is temporal redundancy, there is spatial redundancy. Uh, by that, I mean, so there is redundancy within a video. You don't have to, you know, encode every pixel. There is redundancy. Uh, also holds good for every other frame. If you're watching a soccer game, pretty much most of it uh, is stationary. So that can also be uh, uh, encoded intelligently. Uh, maintain quality, of course, you do all of that, maintaining quality of uh, experience and quality of service. Uh, latency, a classic problem. Again, if you're real, you know, uh, streaming real time, if you're watching a match or movie, or if your uh, first responders or medical personnel or police personnel is streaming something from location to a base station, latency is very important. And all of this, as always, ties into standards and protocols because you're supposed to coexist. Uh, so all of this usually culminates into a body determining as to what is the standard or the protocol you're supposed to be using to uh, put whatever you've generated on the wire and eventually, you know, all the way. So it's an end-to-end -end sort of uh, strategy. A hardware acceleration, of course, to maintain, you know, for example, latency, even reducing bits and maintain quality. You're supposed to leverage, you know, smartphones in our hands are, you know, you know, more powerful than ever. Dr. Apaji mentioned about uh, uh, the Moore's law, so you can do pretty much uh, anything on your phone. So you're supposed to ensure that, you know, H.264, for example, Silesh sir touched upon that. Uh, there is hardware on your phone, which can actually, you know, make things work quicker with respect to decoding. Uh, so all of this is pretty much the envelope. This, this is what's happening. So if you look at video, like any other field, we are supposed to, you know, coexist and ensure it's, we seamlessly integrate into every other technology, you know, to give you an example, for example, if you have to put things on the cloud, uh, if there is a payment app, like we, we are supposed to ensure APIs and SDKs and, you know, everything involved, involving coexistence uh, is, is always taken care of. So research and development is, is fruitful when you can, you know, put this in a product, you know, when it goes into the hands of the people. Uh, so this is the envelope, like this is what's happening. So I'll talk about uh, the last one, which is being my current work area since about three years now. So that's the experience, right? Uh, so this sits in the last bin, which is the video consumption. So this is, again, a problem involving what you eventually see. So this very, uh, this is, extremely satisfying as an engineer or a researcher because this is what people see eventually they might not understand you know all the bullet points which are put before this but if they see a really crisp video if they see a really good video with good colors and you know now talking about 360 video we are you know there's mixed reality now which brings together augmented reality and virtual reality so all of this is to ensure that the end user you know is, is more immersed in the kind of content he's consuming. Because as and when, you know, we are progressing in every other direction, you know, cloud computing and machine learning and neural net, 
what really matters is the end user and you know the literally the video he's consuming actually you know is is immersive he's part of that storytelling be it a movie uh, be it a retail scenario where someone is trying to shop you know trying to buy a shoes uh, you know watching you know a movie which is 3 hour long so we have to ensure that the experience is is immersive you know that's that's the latest word now because you want to give the best you know it might be sitting in a car he might be sitting uh, in a bus with a very very restricted data situation on his phone on a small screen he might be wearing his vr glasses in a home and playing a game you want to ensure you you push that envelope as much uh so delving deep uh, as i told uh again resolution you can keep it's it's as good as the hardware so you can go up to 8k now so that's one space where there's a lot of research happening hdr again uh you know it's 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 the color signs it's the kind of colors you see on the screen ar vr mr again you know it's 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 the norm now for games and you know retail shopping and uh virtually going to museums given the pandemic everything you know comes out of that research 360 video again for games for live streaming all the way from a church uh, to a match you know everything uh, you know sits into that stereoscopic 3d is, is is the old world where you could wear glasses and sit in a movie theater and see uh, 3d and you know that usually means depth so you're seeing a movie and there is also a sense of depth where you can see uh, it gives you a sense of 3d but it's only in the depth direction so that's also been there for a while uh it it came to tvs but it didn't take off as much as the industry and the academia expected uh but it's making a comeback and the last two is what i'll be uh talking about uh in the next slide so stereoscopic 3d and light field video so light field is you know you can think of so that's where we are getting into you know the physics and the optics and the computer vision and the video engineering coexisting because the light field you can think of it as consisting of all the light rays in 3d space right flowing through every point in every direction so of course you need the hardware to uh collect them and ensure that they are directed to your eyes as intended so that there is a sense of immersion but that's that's the technology i work with to to ensure there is immersion in the kind of content they watch uh so so light field video as i told so this is this is one of the latest technologies uh holographic video and light field video again because of the area being so new there is a lot of uh terms which are used interchangeably but eventually for a layman it means more immersive content if he's watching a movie or playing a game or even you know there has been a lot of discussion about medical images and uh, so remote surgery i work with uh those companies a lot so eventually that means you're capturing uh phase and time information so that when you move in horizontal direction uh, so there is uh, there is more immersion in the parallax direction so if you move in the horizontal direction it gives you a sense of looking behind the object so there is more materials there is more light there is more immersion apart from just the depth because as i told stereoscopic 3d already offers that even google cardboard i think which can be i think it was retailing for 25 dollars you know you just put a phone on in the front and there are apps which actually give you that uh, you know sense of depth but light field video goes beyond that so so as always you know you it's only uh it's only clear when you actually hold a tablet or a phone in your hand it's extremely difficult uh to explain uh but again you know that's, that's all a good place to be because of the six d's i mentioned at the beginning so usually anything which is a uh, bleeding edge starts of gimmicky and it feels it's it's a very hard problem to crack because it's it's deceptive right i mean you it's there but it's not there and people don't get a sense of it people can't grasp what is happening and there is uh there is also unpleasantness in the experience sometimes it started with even smartphones right i mean when they came it was not uh you know it always started off as something you know which is which is for the elite or it's a luxury item right 
and look where we are today you know you can you can you know the food you order and you know even the cab you order everything is coming out of that database so it's a good place to be when when it's hard to explain and it's hard to market something because that's when you're traversing that journey of reaching a place where you can democratize it right where you make it almost seamless you know so that's that's the journey i am part of uh so what are the challenges uh so before that i want to quickly try and see if i can turn on my video and i can show you uh it's very i mean you can't see anything pd but at least i want to use it to explain so just tell me if this is you can see me uh, yes okay so so very quickly so this is actually a light field tablet which is already in the market so one thing uh, which i had to mention what i pulled this up was so when it comes to experience whatever i'm working on is without the glasses right so that's that's one direction of pursuing uh, the research because all of this you know 3d or whatever we are uh, trying to capture the market where you don't have to buy any hardware so there is no glasses so when you hold the phone which i will show you or the tablet you're getting to see emotion you're getting to see depth and then when the content is not light field or when you turn on the backlight it's it's a regular android 10 tablet right it's 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 a regular tablet so this is extremely important for us because we could have you know it's extremely because you're you know you're getting the best of both worlds so very quickly so this is the equivalent of your you know uh you know instagram because i wish i could show you the spoon you're seeing in the cereal bowl is literally popping out of the screen so that's the 3d and i'm not wearing any glasses if i you know if, I, if we were all in a room minus the pandemic i would have you know distributed this tablet so these are pictures again which were taken on this tablet and i'll quickly also show you uh so this is a stereo 3D movie which was converted to light field. Uh, so this is actually 3D. So this, you know, so if I move in this direction, you can actually get a sense of, you know, being a part of that experience. So it's it's it would have been really exciting to actually give you this, but again, hopefully if at all we get a chance, I can, you know, arrange for some meeting or something. But this is, you know, again, this is B2B. So uh let me turn off my video so that my audio doesn't. Uh, so this is B2B. So we work with uh, medical companies, retail, gaming companies. Uh, so this is not, we are still haven't pursued the consumer direction, uh, but uh, because the audience is, you know, is had a lot of interest in medical imaging. So we work with uh, uh, Da Vinci, which is, I don't know the exact number, but they handle most of the remote surgeries. So they are considering uh, this tablet to be one of the devices within the surgery room because it gives them, you know, because even for an endoscopy, right? So there are, there are actually two cameras with the probes which go into the human body. So that can be converted to light field in real time. And they're considering us, uh, they have actually shortlisted us for all the, uh, there was a good question about compression for medical images. And there was also a good question of data. And because we have already have a, device in the market and with respect to the pictures and videos we are very good with data set so we have done a lot of research with computer vision and machine learning so we are you know when it comes to accuracy so they were willing to bet on us for for replacing their 2d displays for example so the another industry which we are working closely with is automotive uh uh Silas touched upon that you know the dashboard and everything so we are working with a couple of companies continental is our you know one of our investors actually so we are working with companies where again you know it's, it's a self-driving car you cannot have the old school way of entertainment right i mean when you watch a movie when you listen to something when you're seeing your dashboard everything needs to go you know 10 notches higher and that's where probably displays like this come into picture where you know where there is an ecosystem of light field content you can buy stuff you can watch movies and you know it, it's you know it can be distributed to your phone your tablet so that's the kind of future we are looking at, uh, keeping in mind all of these verticals, right? You know, we are equally invested in medical. We are equally invested in retail. Given the pandemic, that has been a big boost. Education, 
you know, imagine someone sitting on their tablet and, you know, going through slides. And if they have to see an internal combustion engine, it becomes 3D, right? The backlight turns on. It's a regular tablet. They don't have to invest in a VR glass. They don't have to invest in something, uh, you know, more expensive exclusively for that. It's a regular tablet. But guess what? If there is a light field content, if they want to learn about internal combustion engine, imagine, you know, that becoming 360, that becoming 3D like and getting to, you know, turn and, you know, look at an engine in a completely different perspective. So that's something we are working with uh, as well. And of course, you know, when it comes to consumers, videos, games, so that's, 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 that's the ultimate, right? That's always existing, but all of these other verticals I mentioned are also as interesting. So, uh, so that's, that's pretty much, you know, what we are doing and the industry I come from, the company I come from. Uh, so we are, we are, you know, invested in enhancing the experience without having uh, the user buy another hardware. So, so that's our mantra, you know, without glasses. So you have your regular tablet, it becomes a phone, it becomes a tablet, which you're already using, but, you know, with light field capabilities, with more immersion and materials and light, uh, you know, as a part of the content. Uh, so any questions so far? I know it's too much, it's overwhelming. Uh, but any kind of questions I'll be happy to answer now or later or offline, you know, I'll leave my contact details probably, uh, but I'll be really happy to take questions. Uh, so Sunny, there is one question which says that, uh, uh, the cost of this, uh, light field devices. So are this light field devices uh, expensive? Uh, good question. <laughs> uh, they are. Given the fact that, given the fact uh, that we haven't reached the consumer is yet, so we are in a B two B scenario, but uh, we are retailing it to. We did release a creators edition because we wanted to get a good sense of you know content creators, right? I mean that's that's the uh, that's the quickest way of you know getting a sense of where the market is, right? So people who create content for you know Snapchat and Instagram and how do they perceive this field? Uh, and this, uh, uh, so for that we retailed in the U S it was about $1,300. Uh, but that price point is going to vary as in when this becomes more and more closer to consumer. Uh, we are also planning, uh, an extended monitor. We want to bring on the phone, uh, tablet is already there. Basically we want to, you know, we want to be on every display because once this goes past the stage of being extremely R and D like, this is going to be on every display. People will get used to this, like they have gotten used to smartphones now. So this this becomes they'll never be able to look at uh, a flat two D image or a video again. I mean, at least there will be room for this. I mean, again, everything is going to coexist uh, because images has already made has already been going through this trajectory. It's pushed the envelope sort of, right? I mean, there were, you know, images which would progressively download. It would take minutes to look at one image and now look where we are. You know, it went through a similar trajectory where there are 3D photos, there is a GIF animation, there's a wiggling animation uh, on your screen, right? Because images was pushing that envelope, right? You know, filters, uh, making 3D photos. It was a way of enhancing that experience because you can't just put up an 8K image and stop there, right? Because the researchers in the academia is going to keep pushing and same is true with video, right? Again, video is going to be difficult because it's not a software update, right? I cannot just, it's it's tightly coupled with the hardware. Uh, so you have to have a layer display. I mean, with images again, if you have a layer display, probably you'll see a 3D, you know, probably if you open it on your device, probably, you know, we have made a solution where it becomes a 3D wiggle animation. But for video, you have to be on a layer display or on a light field display, for example. So, so that's why, I mean, sorry for the elaborate answer, but that all ties into the price point. No, uh, that definitely helps uh, Sanmati. So thank you for uh, sharing that response. Uh, I again encourage all the participants to uh, drop in your queries so that we can uh, reach out to the respective speakers uh, for them to respond. I already see that uh, 
uh, Dr. Shiva is engaging quite a few participants uh, responding to the questions. Uh, I once again thank uh, Sanmati for uh, sharing insights on video generation to video processing and video consumption, uh, the nitty gritties of video engineering, and obviously uh, the aspects around uh, experience uh, with respect to resolution, AR, VR, MR, uh, 360 video, stereographic 3D, and all the way to light field video. Uh, and also sharing uh, deeper insights into what light field video are and what uh, the latest and greatest technology that they are currently working in. So, so it was uh, a pleasure having you, Sanmati. Uh, and if there are any questions, uh, probably we will uh, share that with you. Um, then, like, um, also you can respond to our participants offline. So, with this, uh, I uh, we would be moving on to the next uh, session from Mr. Abhinav Jain, uh, who would be sharing his insights on uh, modern video, uh, modern image and video processing. Uh, Mr. Abhinav Jain uh, graduated from IIT Kanpur uh, with a B.Tech in Electrical Engineering with an interest to work in the domain of uh, machine learning and computer vision. Uh, he joined and worked with uh, IBM Research Lab India for around three yeah. years as a research engineer. Uh, recently, he joined VideoCan as a machine learning engineer and here is leading uh, the development of a new and unique AI-enabled uh, services uh, for VideoCan. With this brief intro, I would hand over the virtual podium to Mr. Uh, Abhinav for the next talk. So, Abhinav Jain, it's all yours. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, uh, I'm really privileged to be here and uh, deliver my thoughts on uh, some of the uh, key components or areas uh, that are uh, there in uh, modern image and video processing. So let me just see if I can quickly share my screen. Okay. Okay. All right. I uh, I hope you you all can. Uh, yes. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So hi. Uh, 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 so in this particular talk, I'll be going over uh, briefly touching over this mod the modern image and video processing. It's a uh, broad area and uh, it's uh, 30 minutes or 15 to 30 minutes. It's not enough to touch everything, but I hope that I give you an idea about what's currently happening in this domain. Uh, so let's quickly go over the outline uh, that we have for this whole presentation. The initial, my, first I'll present my initial thoughts on uh, what applications are there of image and video processing. Second, uh, Secondly, I'll go to over like how video processing some basics over how video processing is more complex than image processing from the perspective of a, a machine learning model. Uh, the third, we'll have some uh, active areas of research. We'll go through over some active areas of research in this video analysis domain. For instance, the Chaba, we'll have a quick overview of uh, object tracking algorithms and tracking uh, recognition and action classification networks. And lastly, we'll have a brief look at some of the recent research papers in the domain, which are promoting new lines of research and uh, have some recent breakthroughs, right? So, so for instance, uh, in the, in the whole image and video processing domain, there are, um, lots of applications. Uh, uh, some of uh, the speakers already have touched the medical image processing. Uh, where uh, if you want to look at as a, through the perspective of image processing, you can see if you want to identify or localize a particular disease in X-rays or whatever and data that you can collect from medical image processing. Secondly, we have something called as, uh, which I personally worked on for two or three years, which is a uh, document image processing for text extraction, where the whole idea is you are provided with scanned document images and there is text present in it and you want to extract the structure text in a structured form for any downstream processing uh, that involves querying or retrieval or anything, right? So that's another application. And in video processing, especially it's a very common known application where you are localizing the objects and tracking them through uh, the video, which can happen in an online or offline fashion, right? So like, uh, so these are some of the applications that you can f quickly find or like commonly find of uh, image and video process in the whole image and pro video processing domain. So as you know, like uh, video processing is closely related to image processing, but uh, there are especially 
uh, some issues when we when uh, as a mod when a model has to deal with uh, videos instead of images, right? So the first and most core uh, core problem is the spatio-temporal complex complexity. By this I mean that uh, in images you only have uh, spatial information that corresponds uh, uh, to the uh, Speech, uh, to the image's uh, height, width, and um, there is no temporal component to it. But in videos, the frames are present next each uh, present to next to each other, and there is some sort of temporal dependency between objects. So, for example, multiple objects might interact with each other. Some objects might go uh, come and go in the pre given video, right? So, all these interactions you have to monitor if you are going to deal with videos and uh, analyze them, right? And it's specific and, and especially uh, uh, depends on what type of application that you are working on and what uh, how do you want to uh, uh, capture the interaction between the multiple objects that are there present in the video, right? So this is something that's a very uh, that's a very basic thing about uh, like video processing. And uh, secondly, is the huge chunks of data that are there uh, when you are processing a video. For instance, when you are processing an image, you are present with a presented with a single image. But when you are processing a video, uh, even a 10 second video, which is captured at 30 frames per second, then it would involve around like 300 images uh, that you have to deal with uh, at a time, and uh, that too in a reasonable time. For example, if you are deploying any video processing module online, then it will be presented with some longer videos, and the video and the model has to process the videos and uh, make sure that the processing is done in reasonable time so that uh, the customer or the client on the uh, opposite end can actually see the results, right? So you have to make sure that you are able to do that in reasonable time. The How do you do that? You have to deploy more GPU computational power uh, to process a particular video, which is significantly more than what you do for images, right? And sometimes the computational power that is required to process the videos um like uh the r the hourly cost to run it is might be expensive and might make your whole module uneconomical to run right so these are some of the key um, um problems that are there when you are uh, ad, uh processing videos so each uh, so any uh, essentially each of these problems serves as a potential area of research right so some some re research area, uh, some uh, papers recently have focused on how how to modify the particular architecture or model or training of a model so that it consumes less computational power on how uh, and, or is its uh, processing time is very fast or uh, the interactions between the objects that the uh, user precisely wanted to capture are being captured by the model. So these all serve as a potential area of research and people have been working on that. Uh, like first of all, uh, then uh, first of all, I would like to like go over some of the uh, active areas of research in video analysis. Uh, the first being uh, optical flow estimation. So optical flow is essentially uh, you try to uh, identify the pixel shift between two frames when uh, they are provided as an input. This particular network architecture, which you can see on the left, is called as FlowNet, which was uh, previously introduced in 2015. It's a very basic structure where you provide two uh, images or frames of a video uh, simultaneously to the network, and the network tries to predict the uh, optical flow. Right, and there are multiple ways to go about it. It's still an active area of research. Uh, uh, whether you want to provide it uh, together, whether you want to in embed the two frames separately and later on predict the optical flow. So there, there are, as long as you uh, restrict, if you don't restrict yourself, you can like explore everything in this particular domain and like we come up with uh, your own models for uh, optical flow estimation. Uh, second is basically this visual object tracking, which was also like, for instance, I have picked up very basic paper that was uh, introduced in 2015 for to like to track an object. The idea here was to, if you have a current frame where then object is localized, you have the location information of the object that has to be tracked and you want to track that object in later frames, then how do you do that? It's very simple. You, according to this uh, particular paper, you just uh, simply embed the frames and try to predict the location of the object in the next frame using the location of the previous frame, using the location of the object it's in the previous frame, right? So this is something, uh, 
you have two neural networks and you specify the region to search, right? So this is one of the earliest papers that we had in this uh, area and this particular research area is still uh, being researched very uh, steadily. So you will have find very new papers in the recent uh, and some of which I'll uh, uh, go over uh, later in the slide, right? And uh, the lastly, we also have in video analysis something called this action classification. So the idea here is you are give, given a given a video and there are multiple actions or uh, present in the video and you want to either detect them or localize them or just identify them, right? So how to do that? So there are multiple ways to do that. Uh, one is using either you can use an optical flow. So there was this uh, recent paper which was known as action flow net, which simultaneously um, predicts the optical flow as well as the action label that's of a, a particular object that's present in the video. Uh, the idea was that uh, the optical flow information essentially provides you the uh, information regarding the movement of particular of the pixels, which can help you determine what action a particular object is exhibiting in the video, right? And uh, so the common thing uh, that you would find in video processing is that uh, uh, to monitor to uh, to the, so there is a temporal dependency between frames. So how do you make the model actually learn that. So there are multiple ways. For instance, on the left in the action flow net, you have a 3D convolution network, uh, which is uh, different from a spatial convolution, 2D convolution, which is commonly used in images. 3D convolution is essentially um, con convolves al also along the time dimension. And there you have the, and similarly, you uh, all the remaining um, mathematical formulations of the convolution remains the same, and there is a, just an additional dimensionality. Uh, also, you can also you can what you can do is uh, embed the images using simple 2D convolution networks and later use a recurrent neural network to monitor the temporal dependencies. So these are some of the basic ways to embed a particular video and generates this feature vector, right? So, so you, optical flow is one of the way to you can use to uh, classify actions. Uh, the second is obviously very the earliest paper that came in this particular domain was uh, using an end to end network where you provide the input video and you have uh, again here we are using um, optical flow information, but we have two different networks. One is the spatial stream network, which takes an input image, a single input image out of the video as an input. And uh, another is a temporal stream convert where you have the information from uh, optical flow, which is computed from a particular video, and you use both the networks uh, to finally predict up cl action class, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, and lastly, you also have something called expose estimation, which is very active area of research in this domain, in the whole computer vision domain, where you estimate key areas in your pose and uh, determine uh, uh, in what direction they are oriented. So this is also one of the ways, uh, this is one of the papers that uh, post-based CNN that was introduced in 2015, which essentially captured, uh, which essentially said that uh, you can also use the, uh, you can also estimate the pose and later on use that uh, as a feature vector to determine what particular action is uh, there in that video, right? This particular, uh, paper presented a network where uh, you had to where you, where you can generate feature vectors uh, for the poses of a particular object that's there in the video, right? So like uh, these are these are some of the key areas that are there in video analysis, and uh, they are being actively researched as of now. And uh, you can pretty much uh, take a look at uh, there's a huge repositories which uh, essentially covers all uh, the research that's there in this, in these particular domain, right? Uh, but now I just want to briefly take a look at uh, some of the key areas of research or uh, uh, directions in which uh, uh, the research in modern image and video processing is progressing, right? So uh, as you all know that uh, the, uh, or must have heard that the transformers are something that are uh, revolutionizing the natural language processing domain owing to the fact that they were introduced because uh, uh, simply using recurrent neural networks was too time time consuming and uh, resource com uh, consumption was relatively higher than its computer vision counterpart. So they wanted to motivate a similar structure that can you can parallelize and uh, can have significant performance in natural language processing domain. So they introduced transformers. And now back, uh, the researchers are, uh, 
uh, uh, researchers are dealing with how to how we can we use the transformers in uh, computer vision domain also. And there are very recent papers like published last year only uh, on this in this particular field. So one of them paper is from the Google research, which is uh, an image is worth 16 plus 16 words which inspired the use of transformer architecture for embedding images. Another paper that came from, out from OpenAI is, uh, examines whether unsupervised representation learning from natural language can inspire similar model training for learning image representation. So idea here was uh, um, always when you're training a, um, a pre-training a network for any image embedding learning method, uh, you always have like a supervised data set. So can you use unsupervised representation that are the, that's there in transformers in the NLP domain? And uh, so these are some of the uh, uh, papers that I believe can revolutionize uh, the whole computer vision domain. How do we look at processing videos and images? And obvious and other areas of research that I briefly touched upon previously in my previous slides, like uh, optical flow. It's still being worked on. People are still trying to improve the state of the art accuracy or trying to achieve stronger generalization because in optical flow, you generate, you train on a synthetic data set and uh, test on a real time data set. So you want to have like a stronger generalization, which is something called as a cross domain generalization. And efficiency is essentially what we want uh, out of any system that it should consume resources less. And it will always be an active area of research because people can, if you can think you can minimize the resource consumption and achieve the same amount of results in many, less time, then it would be a significant add to the uh, research community, right? So this particular paper, recurrent all papers field transform is essentially a deep network architecture that they have introduced to determine the optical flow, right? So, uh, so I'll just quickly go over uh, one of the few papers uh, that I've recently mentioned. Uh, first being this in image is worth 16 for 16 words. So the idea is very similar to how you how transformers process uh, tokens in natural language processing domain. Uh, the idea here is uh, like how to parallel, uh, how to mirror that in this particular uh, computer vision domain. Suppose we want to embed a particular image or want or to classify an image. So we'll split the image into fixed size patches. Each patch can essentially act as a token uh, that was introduced for the transformer encoder. So transformer consists of uh, a sets of encoders and uh, for each encoder network, we have a normalization layer, a multi-headed retention, which is essentially uh, self-attention. Uh, there was a recently paper like the attention is all you need paper that came out in 2017, 2018, if I'm not wrong which uh, is which is which is, which is at the core of a transformer encoder then you have normalization layers and there is a feed forward neural network which just passes on the net, uh, feature embeddings learned in this particular encoder to the next layer of encoder right so similarly to mirror what we have in natural language processing domain we split the images into uh, patches linearly embed each patch and uh, similarly we also add the position embedding just like we do in natural nlp domain and feed the resulting sequence of vectors to standard transformer encoders, and the series of encoder will just encode the whole uh, image and generate the feature embeddings. And uh, also similar to what we had in NLP, we add an extra learnable classification token, which is at the beginning, and you want to determine which helps you determine what class a particular image for belongs to, right? So like this is a basic, this is the basic uh, functioning of any transformer network, which is there in NLP and now it's being tested for computer vision, right? And this is being called as something called as a vision transformer. Uh, so uh, how, were, how were the results actually? So if you take a look at the paper, uh, it's still being uh, reviewed uh, in, I believe in ICLR 2021, uh, but it has like huge uh, number of uh, rating in uh, the github repository so you the, the, owing to the fact that it has performed significantly good uh, and uh, as compared to standard resnet baselines so the pre transform pre trained vision transformer you can say it performs on par with whatever resnet baselines uh, resnet based baseline they have taken into consideration uh, while using substantially less computation resources to pre train so you can actually see how much flops they are taking. Um, if you take a look at the paper, it's still it's out. And for instance, it achieves an accuracy of 88% on image and 94% of C400. So, so the idea of this particular paper was not to beat the state of the art. It was like, can we achieve something similar in uh, 
uh, in computationally less expensive way and uh, is it something that's worth devoting time to and uh, i believe it's in my opinion i believe like um, it's something that surely can promote future research in this domain and i can revolutionize the research in computer vision also right and some of the future work that you can say that uh, you can use or that you can do in uh, the whole applying transformers to computer vision domain is like it's what whatever they have do, uh, done is corresponding is essentially uh, classifying images so can we also use kind of transformers for other computer vision tasks or, or can we use uh, transform or can we pre train transform and self supervised methods so if you remember if if you read some of the transformer networks that are there in the nlp domain uh, the objective training objective defined does not use uh, do not use like any annotated data sets it's self supervised enough uh, uh, self supervised so you want to uh, motivate something similar in this domain also right so these are like some of uh, like you can uh, open areas in uh, com uh, computer vision when it comes to using transformers here and lastly there's this, another paper that came out uh, last year only in icml which is like generative pre training from pixels precisely what i was telling that can we motivate uh, training objectives um, which are self supervised in a fashion similar to that of nlp so here also we are using something similar to see if any pre training of the network can be used later on and uh, results good results can be achieved when you using transformers right so uh, here you something called as a generative pre training uh, which uses a sequential transformer sequential transformer essentially means you have encode the uh, image and uh, you encode a particular input and decode outputs in steps in, in a timely ordered fashion so so it involves a both an encoder and decoder structure so what we, what they are trying to do essentially here is they are uh, when they are embedding an image the image can be viewed as pixels and uh, you just uh, reshape the pixel image into 1D sequence and uh, like mask some of the pixel values and try to use the transformer network to predict those uh, mask values similar to the similar to self supervised training objective that was introduced in for in the BERT, which was uh, essentially a transformer network that uh, introduced by Google, I think, for in the NLP domain, right? So you can also use uh, another training objective, which is like the auto regressive next pixel pixel prediction, which I essentially talked about, and mass pixel prediction there, uh, and uh, evaluate and eva later on evaluate the representation of the image uh, learned by these objectives with linear probes on fine tuning, right? So the basic idea here is still the same that uh, you have to introduce some self supervised training objective. What can they be, and how do you think will they work out in this particular? domain when you are using transformers to embed the learning to embed the images right and uh, the experiments demonstrate that it does perform good well uh, you can uh, the network the igpt network that has that that's the name for this particular way of uh, training uh, outperforms the supervised wide resonant residual network on cifar 10 object uh, like the object uh, and the cifar 100 data sets it achieves decent accuracy on ImageNet, which is competitive with the recent contrastive learning approaches that require fewer parameters, uh, and achieves like high accuracy only li with linear probe and fine tuning on CIFAR 10. So the idea here, I would still say the same. The idea here is not just to improve the accuracy. The accuracy is uh, achieved by if other models on the ImageNet is very high. What we want to do is can we do it with less number of parameters, low computation power. Uh, less time consumption and uh, so for these we are studying different ways to achieve that so it's a still an open problem and a lot of efforts are being made in this particular domain and i hope uh, that you all can uh, i I, have, I hope that i have given a quick overview of uh, different methods that are there for processing images and videos i know it's uh, i have might have left a lot but uh, this might give you a good starting point uh, if you want to uh, pursue your own line of research in this particular domain. Uh, and uh, I would be happy to take any questions online, offline. Uh, after the talk, uh, you can also reach me, reach out to me. And yeah, uh, so thank you for uh, this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abhinav, for uh, sharing insights into modern image and video processing.
uh, I am definitely, uh, I am sure that uh, the participants would uh, have a lot of key points to take away. Uh, yeah. At this point, yeah. I do not see any questions. Uh, however, I encourage and request all the participants once again uh, to post any queries uh, that you have here in the chat window, or even you can um, raise your hand so that like uh, we we would keep the session interactive and our speakers can answer to your queries. Uh, so with this, uh, uh, it's time to move on to uh, next session uh, from Dr. Uh, uh, Prashant Mishra on uh, robotic acoustic source localization with aerial drones. Uh, so uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Prashant Mishra is currently working as a scientist at uh, Corporate uh, Research and Innovation Tata Consultancy Services Limited, Bangalore, and is passionate about building systems at scale that can extend human and mission capabilities with uh, newer and better ways of uh, observing and managing the physical world. As research cut across various uh, aspects of uh, computational sensing, maximization, and control of cyber physical systems, his current focus is on smart mobility management, uh, and he has also a background in middleware for wireless sensor networks and uh, low power network embedded system. Uh, he has more than 10 years of experience in scientific and industrial research. Uh, he has worked in different roles and capabilities uh, for uh, keening a unit of entity data corporation, uh, Bangalore uh, between 2006 and 8, uh, CSIRO, uh, Sydney and Brisbane uh, from uh, 2008 to 12, uh, Robert Bosch, Center for uh, Cyber Physical Systems in the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore uh, between 2013 and 2016. So with this brief intro, uh, I would uh, hand over uh, the virtual podium to uh, Dr. Prashant. Uh, to share insights on uh, this topic. Uh, Prashanji, we can uh, see your slides, uh, but I guess you are on mute. Yeah, transition is Yes, 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 all good, sir, yeah. Okay, great. So yeah. thank you, Changapa, for the introduction. Um, so I have the next 30 minutes to me, and I think this is uh, a talk. Uh, uh, this is an outlier talk in some ways because it is a little bit away from the major theme of uh, image and video processing, right? So I have tried to take up a topic which is in the sound domain. Uh, the reason uh, I chose this was just to bring in a lateral view on signal processing the, in the audio domain. And maybe from there you will see how parallels can be drawn because uh, a lot of the work that I'll talk about does talk about um, what's a very fundamental thing processing. But uh, from there I will try to uh, link how these fundamental thing processing techniques can be tied into the newer um, uh, machine learning driven thing processing as well towards the end of the talk. Even though I'll not speak explicitly about it. So this uh, particular talk uh, today that I'll be presenting is on uh, uh, acoustic source localization with aerial drones. And uh, uh, I will motivate this with this particular application. So essentially, if you look at uh, the way drone technology is being used today, is uh, it's, it's, it's a technology that is used to cater to uh, high stress environments, right? It's not used for regular environments uh, as of now, but they use it in very specialized cases, right? Why, uh, of course, the, the day is not far away when drones will become very ubiquitous. Uh, but uh, if you look at uh, the way we use drones today is uh, places where humans really cannot uh, reach and uh, we use them to facilitate that. So just to motivate this entire talk, I have taken up this uh, two use cases. Uh, one, uh, the picture that you see on the left hand side is basically a, a scenario where a building has collapsed and there are people trapped. And the scenario that I've taken on the right hand side is uh, basically that of mine, which has, you know, an unknown a blast due to, let's say, excess uh, accumulation of methane in the termine tunnel and so on and so forth, right? So the common uh, problem here is that, you know, whenever a disaster of this kind strikes, uh, you have people that uh, get uh, uh, buried underneath the rubble. So if you look at, if you take the example of this building that has collapsed, uh, you have people under the rubble and um, they are they typically and you want to rescue them for, and for rescuing them you first have to identify where people are trapped and then based on once you locate their position you want to then do something to remove the rubble on from from over them and then rescue them right 
Now, yes, the way it is currently done is that you know you have uh, people who do manual searching. Of course, robots are being ground robots are being used in 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 certain ways. Uh, and what we are pitching here is that you could also use uh, dro aerial drones for that purpose, wherein the dro drone can hover above above the scene and uh, try to locate where people are trapped. And based on that, they can give a signal back to the command center saying that, hey, see, this is where a person trapped. Why don't you go and rescue? Right. Now, if you look at uh, the major challenge in trying to use a drone technology for this purpose is that the state of the art drones that you get these days are very vision dominated, right? Uh, so essentially you have a, let me move on to the next slide. Maybe that will help to motivate that. Yeah, so it's very vision dominated and that's what we call that. Uh, we have drones with eyes these days, right? And uh, what I mean by eyes here is. Uh, Essentially, you have a, a drones normally come with a, a camera attachment, right? That is the sensor that drones normally have these days, right? So what happens is when you have a camera mounted on drone, now and when you're trying to monitor a scene such as a building that has collapsed, it is it is difficult for the drone to actually sense the physical environment to the best of its abilities because uh, you no know, people are trapped underneath, so a camera cannot uh, go beyond the line of sight, isn't it? Uh, so you, it may, so using a camera it is very difficult to locate where people are trapped. But what the scene actually gives out is essentially you know this acoustic cues, right? People may be shouting out for help, and that is something if you can capture that sense information, then it becomes useful. So I have tried to outline what are the limitations of using a camera-based drone system in scenarios like this, and uh, why I pick up uh, why am I trying to pick up the specific case of uh, this camera based drones because that is what is currently available. If you try to buy any drone these days, uh, you will probably the best uh, uh, sensor that you get, uh, official sensor that you get is a camera, right? And a lot of applications are, are driven using this camera on the drone. Now, typical camera limitations are is that you no, know, it cannot work on obstruction, which is the case that we are looking at, uh, cannot work on occlusion, uh, cannot work on a low visibility, uh, let's say when the light is compromised like the tunnel environment. And of course, it cannot work in places where it doesn't offer visual cues, right? So wherever you have non-visual cues, that's where you typically, uh, you, a camera cannot pick up the signals, right? So the way you could, we could possibly address this uh, gap is by what we call as using drones with ears. And again, what we mean by ears is essentially using microphones to hear the scene, right? Now, so essentially on a proposal level, it is fine thing that, hey, rather than using a camera, let us use a set of microphones to pick up the acoustic cues from the scene. But uh, having this, uh, putting down this proposal to actually making it work, I think it is a long way uh, that we need to get to. Uh, let me outline the challenges that we face while trying to implement or build a technology of this kind. Uh, by the way, check up. I'm audible, right? I'm clearly audible. Uh, no, no disturbance in the line, right? Uh, check up. Avishay, can you just acknowledge no disturbance in the line, right? Hello. Sorry, I was uh, speaking on mute. Uh, go ahead. No? So there's yeah, no yeah, disturbance in the line, right? Yeah. Oh. No, 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 no. You're all good. Okay, great. So uh, moving on, mm, so this is what uh, I would say the major roadblock or to making uh, uh, acoustic system or a recording or micro system work on the drone, right? Now what happens is it's a very simple uh, uh, simple uh, uh, analysis here. So essentially, uh, the biggest challenge we face in these conditions is basically what we call as ego noise. Uh, what do we mean by ego noise here? It's basically self noise of the drone. So you have the recording device, the recorder here, and you have the interferer also here. So when the when the blades of the drones uh, move at very high speed, it creates a lot of self noise. And this self noise, uh, so that is one. Secondly, there is a lot of mechanical noise that also peeps into the system. And all of these noise sources actually cl are clubbed into what we call as ego noise of the system, right? And this, and you, as you said, this noise, this is the noise. And uh, this is the, and this is the recording device, right? Recorder here. If you look at the noise uh, source is very close to recording device. So the signal noise ratios are very, very low. 
Now we we try to do some characterization around it. So what we did was that we tried to see if we have uh, the recorder placed somewhere here. Okay, how would that look like? If you place the recorder on top of the drone, how would that look like? And so if you place the place the recorder at the bottom of the drone, how would that look like? So as you can see, this is all recalculation studies done by placing recorder on uh, above the drone, below the drone, and on the side. And in either of the cases, any of these cases, you see that. Uh, so this is the noise. The red line is the noise, and blue one is the signal flow. So in any of these cases, we are some we are actually encompassing an, a noise which is around uh, 30, 25 to 30 dB stronger than the signal. Okay, so it's basically around close to minus 20 to 25 dB of noise you are dealing with. Uh, and I think that is a big challenge. So if you look at the acoustic literature, I think uh, these are very, very tough conditions uh, in the acoustic, even in the acoustic literature to make systems work. If you look at a lot of the experiments that are done in acoustics, uh, typically 0 dB is, if you look at a lot of the results that are reported, around 0 dB is the results are reported and they may go maximum to minus 5 dB, not beyond that. And here we are de trying to deal with a system that gives you a noise uh, which is around 25 dB stronger than the uh, signal. Right? Now, how do you overcome that? So essentially, again, if you look at the way you, it is done, uh, traditional done is you introduce what we call a spatial temporal diversity to boost the received SNR. So what is that spatial temporal diversity here? It is nothing but essentially trying to, you know, rather than putting uh, one microphone, you try to put an array of microphone. Right. So you put a cup, an array of microphones. So let's say, for example, here, let's say we are talking about four microphones here. So this is one microphone array, which consists of four microphones, right? So, so what we are trying to do is that you are trying to sample the space both in time and space. So essentially, using more than one microphone tries to sample in space, and then of course you have the temporal sampling, right? So that's how you try to you know, increase the spatial temporal diversity. And by doing some very interesting uh, uh, processing uh, using that type of a recording, you can boost what we call as a received signal noise ratio. Okay. Now this is well known in literature. Now to appreciate again what is the problem by using this technique, I'll, I'll let me give you some slight hints into it. So as I said, uh, the basic this, this is what I would call the basics of microphone array. So A is essentially a distance between the first microphone element and the last microphone element. And B is the inter microphone separation distance. Now, the, the signs uh, of microphone uh, array acoustics uh, signal processing says that uh, the larger the A is, you will get a very narrow B. Okay, so if you look at this part of the figure, so I have so essentially I have taken lambda as a unit of distance here. So uh, lambda is the separation distance between uh, the first microphone and the last microphone. Lam lambda, of course, is the wavelength. So I said that this A is. Uh, Two lambda, two wavelengths away. So distance between. So A is two wavelength, uh, and then five wavelength, fifteen wavelength, right? So if you look at the red line, which is basically a very large, you get a very narrow beam. And then as you decrease the wavelength, your beam starts to start becoming thicker. So the benefit of having a narrow beam is that you can resolve sound sources better. So that's why you want to get a very narrow beam, right? So essentially, they will say that the sound signal is coming from this end. Whereas this two, when two lambda will tell you, in that you'll be unsure. It may so happen that you may, you may be tricked to believe that the sound is coming from this end, this end, this end, right? Similarly, there is some dependency on B. So if B is less than the wavelength by two, we, uh, we avoid what we call as grating lobes. So again, look at this figure on the left. Now, if, uh, so essentially, if this wavelength is uh, B is less than or equal to lambda by two, this is the blue curve, you don't, you get the main lobe. And then you don't get this unwanted low. So unwanted low power are very low. Whereas if it exceeds, if B starts to be greater than this particular value, let's say two lambda, you get this grating lobes. You get the main lobe and grade, grating lobes also here. Now, what is the problem with grating lobe? Again, the problem is that you do you are unsure as to where the sound source is coming from. So if, if you look uh, for the system, it will uh, it will appear that as the sound source is coming from here, here, and here. So again, it ca causes a lot of confusion, right? So that's where these simple uh, due diligence uh, has to be done because the science already well proven. So that there's nothing to go and prove back again. So we need to stick to the stick to the to the engineering part of it, right? So again, uh, given that we are trying to mount this microphone on a drone, we had we this is the rationale we came up with. Okay, we said we we'll use a sparse array design with a very large aperture, which is A. So having a very large A gives uh, will lead to a very narrow beam, which is good. 
but then uh, the b is the part that will actually make things go uh, bad here so essentially we said that we we need to use fewer alloy elements so as i said if you mount some 100 uh, microphones uh, in that array it will actually uh, it, the weight of that array will be very huge and it may not be suitable for the weight uh, the drone to take it up uh, uh, as it flies so you want the array which is lightweight so because of that you you are constrained to put some few elements over there and as soon as you start putting few elements, the B becomes larger. So essentially, it's, it's, it is like saying that rather than putting this six uh, microphones, we will just put three microphones. So if you take out these microphones from the system here, the distance between the inter-element distance between these two microphones increases. So that's a that is something that creeps into the system naturally, right? So so the next part of the talk uh, tries to address how we resolve these particular challenges. Okay, I hope I am clear. I hope the, what I am saying is that well, this problem is solvable. And uh, given the system limitations that this is, this array has to mount a drone, this is the design we have gone with. Wherein we want to we want to have a very uh, the apparatus length we want to keep it large, but uh, we cannot uh, have too many microphones in the array. And because we cannot have too many micro micro elements, uh, naturally the distance between each of the micro elements increases, and that is what we have to take because there's increase in this B. We will run into this problem of this additional lobes, and we have to somehow try to negate that off. Now, before rather than getting the math of these things, I will just try to explain the concept uh, visually. I think I think the math is to just to prove, make make sure that we prove what we are doing is correct. But I think overall the technique is very simple. So here we try to piggyback on the mobility drone. So I've given you a space here. So let's say this is where the sound source is coming from, and this is the drone here, right? So what we do is that we divide the space into different cells. Okay. And then what we have, and and then uh, we do, we beam form into each of these cells. So I've given a very simple example of beam forming to this particular cell. And uh, what we do is that we do the exercise not at uh, at this cell. We do the exercise at this cell, this cell, this cell. So we do the exercise over all the cells that we have gone over. Okay, and do it along both the dimensions. It's more like uh, the drone hovering over this entire area. So we do the exercise over this entire area, right? Now what happens when you do this exercise? So let's say your sound source is here. Okay, let's say this is my sound source. Okay. So when I'm here from, and I'm trying to beam form, of course, the main lobe will cover the sound source. But recall, I have a large B, which is greater than lambda by two. So what will happen is I'll get this very strong grating lobes also, okay, along with that. Okay, now, and let's say this is, this, this is corresponding to this position. Now, when I move to this, and I would have done this exercise over all these cells, and let's say I'm at this position. So how would the beam pattern look at this position? So beam pattern typically, again, we'll get the main lobe in the direction of the sound, and then you will get all these very high grating loops, right? So this is the mess that you look at. But there's really something very interesting in this mess. So when you actually try to, you can do the independent beam form exercises, but when you try to add the powers of powers together, what happens is that because the, the power uh, what's it, spikes where the beam form beams overlap, so the power actually spikes in this in this zone, okay, and the, all the other 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 lows typically negate out, okay, and because they negate out, typically the power dec decreases substantially. So what happens finally after if you do the exercise, you will actually see the major power concentration on around the sound source, whereas the other places it starts to die down. And that, and typically, this is a math to actually show how that will actually work uh, from from a syntactic point of view. Okay, but that is the uh, overall idea of this entire technique. So as long as the drone moves, and as long as you do a beam forming, and after you do the beam forming exercise over each of these cells, and when you try to add the powers together, you will try to you will actually be able to localize the sound source, whereas the other higher what's the grating lows, which are also a very high power, they typically uh, die down because they don't add up constructively. So that's the key idea here. Um, so again, this is trying to show saying that so essentially, uh, because you're using you're dealing with human sound, which again the, the audible range would go typically from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, but human sound would be somewhere between 500 uh, hertz to some 5 kilohertz. That's the frequency range we typically will be dealing with, right? So as as I said, no, if you typically if you look at the look at a look at how the beam would look at 500 hertz. Uh, you say it's it's quite uh, wide, uh, whereas if you look at the higher order fixed of a spectrum of five kilohertz, uh, you get very narrow beams, but you get this grating lobes. And when you do this, uh, when you run this algorithm that I mentioned here, uh, you as you say, you get the you get a very 
sharp beam at the desired location, whereas the other noisy beams actually go down. The power goes down, and that's the benefit of the spectrum. Okay. Now, again, how does that look visually? So, typically, again, as I said, uh, if you do do a beam uh, beam forming in a in a very uh, in a couple of uh, locations along this route, you will probably be able to see the power concentrated at the at where you, where the sound source is. But you also go get this very undesired uh, grating lobes, this red zones around it. So you, you are not you are not sure exactly where the sound source is. This is another manifestation at the where you move along this direction. So you can see. Even though you somehow get a sense that the sound source here, but because uh, and because the high grating lobes, you uh, no, you don't. It may it could be somewhere in this region. It could be somewhere in this region. Somewhere in this region. So you're unsure, on it, right? But when you actually try to combine measurements from various uh, uh, various cells together, uh, this is the outcome of that. Your your blob, the 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 blob, the where the sound power is, it's actually quite sleek. Sorry, what happened? Hello, sorry. No, no, I think that would be uh, my mistake. You can discard it and carry on, Prashant. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Okay. Uh, so, and then you, as you can see, uh, uh, oops, sorry. And as you can see, the power in the other lobes have, have died down, right? So you don't see that uh, reddish uh, lobes in anywhere. It's basically yellow, which means um, from from a absolute value point of view, the the powers are lower compared to this where the main sound source lies. So that's where you actually able to localize it. We have also done experiments where rather than having one sound source of the scene, we wanted to see if we can localize two sound sources, three sound sources, four sound sources in the scene. So what our results say is that um, we are able to localize. Uh, Multiple sound sources, as long as the separation distance between the sound sources is quite good. Okay, if these sounds are very close to each other, we cannot really do a good separation of the sound sources. But as long as they're far away, we can do. So, for example, here there are three sound sources: one here, one here, and one here. And since the distance between them uh, is they are quite well separated in space, uh, we are able to localize them. And similarly, with four sound sources, even though now it starts to uh, starts to actually get very trickier because the 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 this math says that no you can localize the it depends on the number of microns that you use in the array okay so if the number of microns that you use in the array is n and the number of sound sources that you want to localize is n1 um, so essentially this n uh, so the number of sound sources has to be n1 has to be less than n so let's say the number of microns is 5 you can localize maximum of four sound sources not more than that right uh, so that's the limitation on number of elements you use okay here are some uh, results that show how good our algorithm works. So essentially, this is our algorithm, and uh, we have compared that with fixed beamforming techniques, adaptive beamforming techniques, um, blind source separation techniques, and music algorithms. So we see a significant bump. We see all these other techniques; they typically, uh, as I said, the SNI improvement, receive SNI improvement is not that great. Whereas we typically get close to some 15 to 18 dB improvement uh, compared to all the state of the art techniques. Okay. And uh, part of the reason is that we are able to piggyback on the mobility of the drone. So the, there is no rocket science here. If it was a static setup wherein the system was not moving, we wouldn't have been able to do better than what the state of art techniques do. Okay. Uh, we would be somewhere along this line only. But because we are able, because the system is moving, the drone is moving, and we are able to take a snapshot from different uh, points in space, and we are able to, and we are combining uh, the information very smartly, we are able to get a good bump. Okay. And that translates to a good location localization accuracy. Now, here's the trade off that I want to uh, finally talk about. So, essentially, as I said, uh, so essentially, if this is the space that I'm trying to monitor, and I, I and I typically as a, and the drone has to go around this space, right? So, at every at certain time intervals and certain points in, in space, it has to do a measurement. So the question to ask is that how many measurements is good enough to actually resolve uh, a sound source in such a scene? Uh, and recall that we are trying to work in the in the presence of strong ego noise in the drone itself, right? So as you can see, if you are trying to work uh, at a SNR level of minus 25 dB, right? Uh, you need at least uh, at least 20 measurements to get some decent results, if not more, right? 
whereas if you are somewhere along the minus 10 db line uh, somewhere less than 10 measurements is good for you to get uh, a good result right so so the, the so essentially the point i'm trying to make inside that there's a trade off here uh, so because you are dealing with a system that uh, has very strong uh, 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 noise and you want to somehow subtract that noise out and want to localize the sound source in the presence of that strong noise you have to do you have to work hard which means that you have to take multiple measurements and, and those measurements should be somewhere excess of 20 measurements whereas if, if you are below that minus 20 minus in somewhere if you are dealing trying to deal with the sound source which is around minus 10 db anything below 20 measurements should do well in fact anything below 10 measurements should do well so that's a trade off you need to decide depending upon how many array elements you're using how how what is the set of how at what point you are you are suspending the recording device are you trying to suspend the recording attach the recording device right below the drone or you are you have let's say a, a, a half a meter separation distance from the drone body uh, and hang it from there so all these things help you to take this call in a very calculated manner right so just to summarize my work uh, as i said uh, uh, this uh, the potential impact of this work is that of course we do acoustic scene, scene analysis but uh, we are trying to do this on a drone platform um, and we are trying to uh, what's the enable a new sensing modality for the drone platform which is very division dominant these days we are trying to do it in acoustic domain and i think that is the key takeaway of this work of course we look at it uh, currently the application scenario has been motivated to more like humanitarian applications and uh, in those applications we are able to localize sound sources which are uh, with very low snr levels but uh, th this this particular technique can be very used in other uh, uh, applications as well and i think those in the, those application scenarios has to be uh, has to be dug out as as of now i think i haven't uh, when i speak to different uh, uh, people about potential problems i still don't find as to how i can use this technology in the industrial application as such right uh, uh because i think uh, when you're working in a very uh, in a very in a, in a very confined setting of this kind there are multiple um, uh, what's the mechanisms you can piggyback on you don't have to rely solely on the drone but there may be other systems in the plant floor other places where which you can piggyback to actually resolve this issue whereas so i think what i'm saying the motivation of using this particular technique in a in a setting that is already well instrumented uh, uh, may not uh, cut the bill well, but in a in a very open-ended situation like search and rescue, emergency response, where you have you where the the where the space is very uh, large and you really have no control over different points, these places, the this type of a technique really can uh, uh, give you some good results. Okay, so this work was uh, done somewhere in the year 2017. So it has resulted in uh, two publications: one early early publication in a core magazine of IEEE, and then. It made it to IEEE ICRA, which is basically the flagship conference for robotics auto automation. And in this tech technology was very well covered. It essentially it was covered in the MIT TR uh, under 35 uh, reviews. It was covered by Mint. It was covered by CNBC TV 18. And uh, this particular uh, and typically there's a talk of this technology that I've had given, which is typically archived in uh, in this particular link. So what I'm saying is that uh, uh, this technology, when this technology and this particular uh, uh, system was introduced, it did attract a lot of attraction uh, from the ecosystem uh, and it was well covered. Uh, but I think from there, I, th I still am trying to see a potential very strong applications technology in a, in a, in a use case that is highly used. Okay, I'm sure that will come in the near future, but as of now, I'm, I'm still searching for it. But nevertheless, it's a neat piece of technology, neat piece of system work, neat piece of signal processing work. And uh, and I think it, it, it has reverberated well, I'm, and I'm waiting for some new breakthroughs to happen in this. So with that, I'll probably rest my talk, and I'll, I'll open the uh, floor to any questions uh, from the audience if they have, or we can also connect offline. So thank you, Chengapa. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing the insights, uh, Dr. Prashant, and uh, also bringing a uh, much more newer perspectives, uh, uh, typically with uh, drones with ears. So I am sure uh, this would um, probably be of interest to many of the participants here. <clears throat> uh, as of now, I do not see any questions, uh, but uh, I encourage the participants to uh, drop in any questions. Um, all our speakers are still with us. Uh, so if there are any questions uh, with respect to even the previous talks, you can post them. So presently, one question. So uh, with many advancements happening with uh, 5G and beyond, uh, how much of this would be a 
boon to uh, the technologies uh, that you just covered. Uh, so if you can share some insights to it, that would be helpful. Yeah. See, essentially, uh, okay, if you look at uh, the, the, the system that we designed now, the system is designed with the uh, uh, with the aim that we, we want to do all the signal processing on the drone itself, right? With the compute that the drone has, right? And and as I said, because we are trying because we are trying to consider the system and system operation in this way, uh, the, the trying to mitigate the let's say the the noise uh, on the system and trying to do a good job localization because very challenging, right? Now with 5G, so you can think of alternate model wherein you can just let's say collect data and then push the data to a backend uh, uh, cloud system where you could have much more muscle power to run uh, much more sophisticated algorithms, right? Um, and uh, I think that's where 5G can really play a big deal, wherein uh, it can give it, it can actually give us this sense of real timeness, wherein you know, we can just use the drone with a uh, with a drone added to just collect data, send it at super fast speeds to the backend, and where you have the entire muscle of the cloud to really crunch numbers and uh, give results out, right? So I think uh, 5G would be a big enabler of this way, but uh, but I think the rationale of doing these this particular uh, type of system design work and this uh, and the associated processing with it was that you are trying to deal with a very a very harsh environment, a certain risky environment where you may not have access to all the technological goods and merits. So how do you try to how does the drone itself uh, equip itself to actually solve the problem? So that's where the angle we're coming from. So we I just uh, showed the motivated it with the applications in the building was collapsed. Or it could be an application where there is, there is uh, the entire town is flooded, right? And all your cell towers are down. So how do you, you know typically uh, make uh, this technology work? So essentially, the idea was that can we make this system self-reliant, wherein everything runs on the drone? But again, we have realized uh, uh, certain limitations in doing it, and uh, and I think uh, that's where the research should flourish from there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Prashanji. So there is one question from one of our participants, Vignesh, uh, who's uh, asked that. Uh, drone ears is based on what kind of algorithm and uh, how better than the adoptive al algorithm such as LMS, RLS, and CMA? Yeah, so Vignesh, I, so essentially, if I, I have just stopped sharing, but it's, it's essentially a beamforming technique, what we call as mobile beamforming, right? So the crux of the basic uh, algorithm is a beamformer, and uh, what we have come out with, what we call as a mobile beamformer, wherein uh, so if you look at how standard beamformers work is that you assume that the, you know, the, the sensing device or this recording device is static at one point and then typically you, you beamform and get the, get the information and then you try to do some processing on it, right? Here we are trying to piggyback on the mobility of drone. As the drone is moving, you're trying to basically beamform and get the information out and do that number crunching, right? And that's why we call it mobile beamforming and, and the, the single processing we've designed is to support that mobile beamforming approach, okay? Now, see the, the techniques that you have mentioned over there, all these are state of the art techniques. As I said, they're very highly used in, 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 in speech processing and acoustic uh, uh, literature. Uh, but uh, the limitation of all these techniques, even if you pull out results, uh, uh, if you just pull out these papers and see their results, uh, people report, uh, uh, you will see that none of the results are reported below minus 5 dB, right? Uh, and because this, uh, these uh, algorithms are limited in that way that they cannot really compensate for very high uh, uh, noise levels. As I mentioned, the, the typical noise levels so we are dealing with here is somewhere around to minus 20 dB, right? So typically all of these algorithms, like which are very well known in literature, acoustics and speech processing, typically break down. And that's what we uh, we, we uh, understood in the entire exercise. And that's where the need of designing, coming up with a new algorithm uh, uh, came up. And uh, we also looked at what else can we piggyback from the ecosystem. So we said that, hey, you, if you look at the system that we're considering, it anyways moves around. So can we use this movement to advantage to do, to actually help the single processing algorithm? And that is what worked for us. And that's what we name as mobile beamforming here. Okay. Hope I'm clear, Vignesh. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Prashanji, for uh, patiently answering for another question. Uh, for now, at least I don't see any questions uh, with respect to your session. Uh, so if there are any questions uh, going forward, we would definitely share that with you. Uh, and now uh, uh, we would be taking a 10 minutes of uh, bio break and we would be converging at 1 p.m. Uh, nevertheless, we would not be closing the bridge. So the participant can still be uh, uh, can still stay on the bridge. Uh, so we would be resuming at sharp one o'clock uh, with a workshop on uh, augmented reality with MATLAB. 
Um, so it would be from MathWorks. Uh, so let's take a 10 minutes bio break and converge back at 1 p.m. People have People have been altering photos nearly as long as photography has existed. Retouching, cropping, and compiling photos can be done for many reasons. To improve the aesthetics, to clarify a message, or perhaps for more questionable reasons. Now, as we enter this uncertain era of fake news, we are often reminded that what we see may be inaccurate. Social media feeds are full of altered photos and video, causing us to constantly question what is real and what has been, as they say, photoshopped. Today, even an inexperienced user can easily obtain sophisticated image editing software for their home computer. In the hands of a professional, this software can make it nearly impossible to identify manipulations by the naked eye. Multimedia Forensics uses signal processing to examine multimedia documents to identify their source and whether they've been altered or manipulated. In digital photography, there are always inherent traces left behind from the process of taking the photo. All devices leave a specific fingerprint on the photo they capture. This fingerprint is related to the specific optical system, color sensor, and other properties of the camera. By analyzing these details, we can identify what kind of device was used to acquire the photo. All commercial cameras include metadata tags in their photos. These tags are the first and easiest way to identify the make and model of a camera. However, these tags are not always reliable, as they can be modified or deleted, such as when images are uploaded to social media. There are still several ways, however, of identifying the digital acquisition device. Every camera senses color in different ways. Light enters through the lens and is filtered through a color filter array that creates a pattern. Each device will use a different method for creating this pattern, which at a minimum allows us to identify the brand of camera that was used. Another way to identify the digital acquisition device relies on that model's unique sensor imperfections. These imperfections are referred to as photo response non-uniformity, or PRNU for short, and it creates patterns within the images known as noise. Referencing the noise print of each camera allows us to univocally identify the camera or device. Now, once we can identify the device used for acquisition, we can then look for evidence that there are images from multiple devices that exist within a single image. This is almost always an indication of image manipulation or tampering. When digital identification is not enough to identify image manipulation, there are still ways that signal processing can be used in multimedia forensics. First, all digital images use compression, with the most common format being JPEG. When an image is saved, compression artifacts are formed within the image, and these are compounded each time the image is saved or manipulated. When two images are combined, the compressions become dissimilar. Signal processing can also be used to look for areas within an image that have been copied and pasted. 
often to disguise parts of an original image. Another detail that can reveal image manipulation is when different parts of an image seem to contain different light sources. This can be done by examining the light sources reflected in eyes or the direction of shadows cast on various objects throughout the image. By building a model of expected light direction and searching for differences when compared to the image in question, manipulation becomes more evident. All of these techniques apply to video as well when analyzed frame by frame. Signal processing can also be used to reconstruct 3D trajectories of movement and compare them to expected movement based on real-world physics. Signal processing is a powerful tool within multimedia forensics. And, as amazing as these examples are, they only scratch the surface of what it's capable of. For instance, did you know that a sound can be analyzed using the power line signal to determine where in the world it was recorded? Yeah. All of these technologies are widely used in forensic applications. Police can validate photo and video evidence. Lawyers can authenticate documents. The military can deconstruct propaganda and many other uses. As we continue to search for accuracy and integrity within the news, multimedia forensics and signal processing will have an ever-expanding role in all our lives. Now, more than ever, we need to know when seeing is actually believing. Signal processing gives us endless potential to leverage data science for social good. Let's take a look at just one of those areas of potential, global health. In 2015, an outbreak of Zika virus caused a scare throughout the Americas. In the aftermath, IBM's researchers launched a project to predict where diseases like Zika might be most likely to appear. Zika virus is carried by reservoir animals. These animals, typically primates, show no symptoms of the disease, but the virus is spread to humans by mosquitoes that bite them. IBM's researchers analyzed data gathered by ecologists on 400 different species of primates worldwide. They looked at factors like gestational age and forearm length, which might not seem like they're related to carrying Zika virus, but are important for clustering related species together. By applying new Bayesian multi-label learning algorithms to process the data, they pinpointed which species had the highest potential of being reservoir animals for the Zika virus and created a global map showing which regions of the world had the highest possibility of seeing Zika develop into another public health crisis. These algorithms combined multi-label learning and Bayesian inference statistical signal processing techniques. 
Multi-label learning takes a single instance of an example or problem and simultaneously associates it with a set of labels, such as Zika virus and other similar diseases like dengue and St. Louis encephalitis. Bayesian inference can overcome the problem of not having a large amount of data by incorporating prior probabilities and updating them when new evidence is provided. This information could be used to decide where to commit medical resources, where to avoid traveling to, or where to more carefully screen travelers from. This project required engineers to create the algorithm which processed the data sets through machine learning and statistical signal processing techniques. But the potential of signal processing doesn't stop there. The age of big data produced tons of information, which if processed intelligently can fight global health problems, including the U.S. opioid epidemic. IBM's researchers applied a similar process to understanding opioid addiction, this time through causal analysis of the problem and understanding of the effects of specific treatments versus a predictive perspective. Researchers process data from health insurance companies using the combination of propensity score modeling and treatment effect estimation. Propensity score modeling leverages observational data to estimate the causal treatment effect and relies on observing two groups of people with the same or similar characteristics. One group is given the treatment under study and the other is given a placebo, which has no therapeutic effect and is used as a study control. The researchers pinpointed people who were most at risk of becoming addicted after being prescribed opioid medication, including which types of treatments and prescriptions led to adverse events like long-term use. This information and knowledge helps doctors make informed decisions before prescribing certain treatments and ultimately mitigate opioid addiction. As governments and other organizations try to tackle this public health crisis, this acquired information could potentially be used to prevent further cases of addiction. By processing the data and extracting the useful hidden information from it, signal processing engineers have the power to contribute to society in ways yet imagined. The IEEE Signal Processing Society can help you understand this exciting profession and build a career that can make a major impact on the world. Learn more at www.signalprocessingsociety.org. Okay, so we as <clears throat> as we are almost uh, around 1 p.m., so we would get started with the workshop on augmented reality with MATLAB. Uh, so again, it's our uh, pleasure to have with us uh, Mr. Amit Kamath, uh, who is working as an educational technical evangelist at MathWork. Uh, uh, so uh, and works with uh, academic institutions in India on the adoptions of uh, MathWorks workflow in curriculum and research. Uh, Amit has been uh, with MathWorks for um, more than seven years and has previously worked with uh, engineering development group and software development and image processing and computer vision uh, areas, focusing on workflows for image uh, registration and pixel labeling. His area of interest include computer vision, uh, software engineering. Uh, Amit has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from uh, NITK Suratkal and a master's degree in electrical engineering from University of Minnesota. So this, uh, with this brief intro, I would uh, like to hand over the virtual podium to uh, Mr. Amit Kamath uh, for the workshop. Uh, so, Mr. Amit, over to you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, and um, if you could, uh, uh, yeah, so so I am the presenter now. So, let me yes. start sharing my screen um, and hopefully make sure that this uh, works okay. Um, uh, you should be able to see my screen now, right? Uh, yes, we are seeing the screen, uh, Amit. Uh, so, okay, we see the slide which says demonstration yes, yes. on augmented reality. Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, all right. So, uh, so thanks again for the uh, introduction and for um, uh, inviting me to 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 to, uh, to present at this event. Uh, really excited to see all of you here. Um, so, so this is a workshop, right? So, so what I mean by that is. 
uh, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, some or most of you are going to also follow along and um, run some of the examples or um, 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 you know demonstrations that, that that I'm going to run on my computer. Okay. Um, so I'm just posting um, a, a link to a document describing how you can get access to MATLAB if you don't already have it. Okay. Uh, so if you already have um, uh, a license to, to MATLAB and have access to our tools, um, that's great. You can just um, uh, you know download the the files that I'll be sharing uh, as and when I uh, present um, um, and show you how this is done. Um, and, and you can run it on your own on your own computers. Um, if you don't have a license and if you're not familiar with MATLAB uh, already. Um, uh, I could try to walk you through uh, some of these steps, and uh, you can get a license um, in the uh, you know with instructions in the link that I'm sharing here. Okay, so uh, for those of you, I, I see a, a, a large set of um, the attendees here. I believe uh, are on mobile devices, uh, and, and so it may be slightly difficult uh, to 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 um, to to run code on your devices uh, along with me. Uh, so apologies for that. Uh, I'm hoping, though, that uh, uh, you know, for those of you who are on your mobile devices, uh, you can see my screen, um, and I'll try to make my, uh, you know, the fonts as large as possible, and and you can follow along uh, as well. Okay. Uh, the other thing I'd like to uh, kind of make um, uh, clear is uh, I want this to be uh, sort of interactive. Okay, so um, you know, if you have questions at any point in time, please do. Um, you know, post in the chat window. I'll keep track of uh, uh, every now and then questions that you ask. Um, and um, if, if you prefer not to type, and if you want to uh, ask uh, a question with audio, um, uh, I guess we'll figure out how to um, um, allow you to unmute yourself uh, and then uh, ask questions in that way as well. Okay. Um, so with that, um, let's get started. So uh, the topic we are going to try to cover for the next two hours um, is um, uh, going through a few demonstrations of um, how you can sort of get started with augmented reality with MATLAB. Okay? Um, clearly, you know, augmented reality in itself is a fairly broad topic. Okay? Um, and in two hours, we can't do justice to, to everything. Uh, so we we'll look at this from a computer vision perspective, right? Um, and, and what I'll try to do is show you um, sort of from the uh, uh, sort of a fundamental computer vision perspective, how you can get started with some of these topics. Right? Uh, I, I will also uh, clarify that uh, none of these methods here are state of the art. Okay, there are um, uh, you know this is a hot and active field. Uh, and uh, as you may have uh, seen in previous talks, there are uh, deep neural networks that can do a variety of things for you. Uh, I won't delve too much into those. Um, my my uh, intention here is to, uh, as much as possible, have you learn the fundamental methods of doing this, and then uh, you know if you're interested, I can point you to some of the more advanced um, uh, neural network uh, kind of methods to do uh, some. Um, in terms of sort of the, the the structure of this, right? So we have about two hours, okay? and so um, and I understand uh, some of you are probably um, uh, grabbing lunch along with this. And so what I thought I'd do is for the first um, um, maybe forty minutes, uh, uh, plus or minus um, ten fifteen minutes, right? Um, I will demonstrate some of these um, uh, some of these examples for you. Um, I, I'll do a quick introduction to to to, to MathWorks and MATLAB uh, for those those of you who may not be familiar with what uh, exactly we do, uh, and then I'll jump right into uh, three demonstrations here. Okay. Um, we'll then spend some time for open Q and A, uh, and then we'll take a break because I you know I, I want to make sure you're all um, energized and awake uh, throughout the event, and so we'll take a short break after and. Um, uh, uh, then we can jump into sort of the hands on part, right? Um, for the hands on part, um, I can dive deeper into um, some of these uh, demonstrations and show you in code exactly what happens. Um, and, and I'm hoping that those of you who um, want to uh, also follow along and, and, and run this on your own computers, 
uh, I, I, I'll share uh, links to the code with you and uh, you should be able to uh, do this on your own uh, along with me as well. And, um, uh, you know, if there are questions in the process, I'm, I'm happy to try to address them. Okay. Uh, so, all right, so nothing in the chat window at the moment. Uh, so then we'll get started uh, right away. Okay. Um, all right. So um, I have three takeaway points for you. Okay. So if everything else is um, uh, kind of dry and boring, uh, I, I want you to remember at least these three things. Right. Um, the, the first one is um, there are these well understood, well researched, well um, uh, implemented um, uh, feature detection, extraction, and matching methods um, that are broadly applicable in computer vision, which can uh, uh, enable several of your AR workflows. Right? Um, and, and that's relatively easy to, to build in MATLAB, as you'll see uh, in some of the demonstrations going forward. Right? Um, these are um, classical methods. Uh, they, they don't use, well, they, they do use a little bit of machine learning, but, but not neural networks. Um, and these are very well known and, and very well understood. Um, the second takeaway point is, um, you know, I, I, I found the, the, the title of this event very interesting where, where, where there is mention of image processing and video processing, right? And, and um, you, you may um, uh, think of videos as a um, you know, sequence of images over time and uh, and so what you do on one image, you can sort of repeatedly do on the others as well, right? Um, that's true, but um, for the performance constraints that there are in, in kind of real world applications, um, we, we make heavy use of temporal correlations, like right, between frames. And so you can't simply, um, uh, you know, run your algorithm on one image and then uh, assume that you can simply do it uh, on other images, uh, keeping the performance uh, requirements in mind, right? So you'll have to adapt. There's a lot of tracking and, and reuse of, of your um, uh, inferences that you make from one frame um, to apply to the uh, subsequent frames, right? Uh, and so I'll show you uh, how this kind of works in, 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 another, uh, in, in the next example. Uh, finally, um, and this is uh, something that came up in the, in the previous talks as well, uh, and in the um, uh, video that was playing uh, in, in between, which I thought was uh, uh, really cool about uh, how you can access the metadata uh, from your camera, right? Um, and, and so, you know, there's a lot of physics and a lot of optics involved in um, in, in capturing data uh, through your cameras, and um, you need to have this information. Um, um, by this information, I mean the the camera parameters, right, um, uh, of, of your of your sensor, uh, to estimate real locations of objects, and this particularly is important in the AR world because we are trying to uh, 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 you know, augment um, uh, reasonably well uh, what you see in your scene already, right? Uh, and to augment what is in your uh, scene, you need to understand uh, real locations of objects in the scene first, right? And then you can add more details on top of it. Uh, and so, you know, knowing these camera parameters uh, is important and can be used to to, to overlay interesting uh, objects on top of uh, uh, your your scene. Um, all right. So, so these are the three takeaway points. Um, and what I do over the course of this particular talk uh, going forward is uh, reinforce each of these points through uh, the examples that I that I showcase. Okay. Um, and um, again, once we're Done with me demonstrating this for you. Uh, we'll then jump into sort of the hands on part. Okay. Um, just as a uh, way for me to figure out how many of you are considering doing this hands on bit, um, could you just please type in the chat window and say why um, for yes, uh, if you want to um, uh, run the code along with me? Um, uh, and, and then I guess, depending on the number of people uh, who want to run this on your own, um, I, I can then uh, tweak and modify uh, uh, how we go about doing this. Okay. Um, so if I see a lot of yeses, then I'll probably go a little uh, faster with the introduction bit. 
so that we'll have more time for you to um, actually do this on your own and uh, for us to debug things together. Okay? If I don't see very many yeses, uh, I'll then assume that most of you just want to listen to me, and then I can go a little slower and actually show you uh, during the demonstration itself how things work. Okay, so I see uh, not very many yeses at the moment, but I'll wait for a bit. All right, so, so let me finish the introduction bit and then uh, we'll see how many of you are actually going to do this now. Right. Okay. Uh, all right. So, a um, little bit about the MathWorks, right? So, so MathWorks is the name of the company that makes MATLAB and Simulink. Um, and uh, we are headquartered um, uh, on, on the map here uh, on the east coast of the United States uh, in this little town called Natick, um, uh, a little west of Boston. Uh, we have several offices all over the world. In fact, if you know this year in India, we have uh, four major locations. Um, so I'm based out of the Bangalore office, uh, but we also have a pretty large office in Hyderabad, uh, Pune, uh, and, and New Delhi as well. Okay. Um, there are more than 3 million users in uh, pretty much all the uh, major countries, uh, 180 of them. Uh, we are now uh, more than 5,000 staff members um, uh, in all of these offices in the world. And uh, uh, we've been a, a private company all this time. Um, the two big platforms that we uh, develop and, and, and we um, uh, share with all of you um, is MATLAB and Simulink. Right? So MATLAB is, uh, we'd like to call it the language of technical computing. Right? Um, so it's not just meant to be a, a programming language uh, uh, where, where you write code only. Um, we invest a lot of our efforts in um, making your workflows easier for engineering applications, right? So um, uh, graphics like this, uh, visualizations, uh, uh, parameter evaluations, um, uh, algorithm development uh, in the engineering world in general, right? Uh, numeric computations for, um, you know, MATLAB, uh, you may or may not know, is an acronym for matrix laboratory, right? So um, from a programming perspective, uh, a matrix is sort of our, our base data type, right? And 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 hence you can imagine that our, uh, our level of abstraction in terms of uh, how you think is at the matrix uh, kind of level. And so everything you, pretty much everything you build, uh, is on top of a matrix, right? So so that's the um, level at which we want our users to to think about their 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 kind of problems. Uh, that they want to solve, and 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 we, we try to make it as easy as possible to analyze these algorithms. Right? On the other hand, a simulink is uh, a simulation environment. Uh, the, the broad term in the industry for this is called model-based design, where we have these blocks um, here, uh, where you don't have to write textual code. Uh, you can, but you don't have to, um, and you connect these blocks uh, in in a certain sequence. Um, and, and set up simulations of your uh, dynamic systems uh, on that way. Right? Um, and in terms of applications, uh, as you may see here, uh, you know you can design things like a lane departure system, um, uh, analyze its uh, properties and its runtime and so on, uh, uh, debug them, and, and, and finally uh, if deploy them onto embedded systems directly. Right? Um, so broadly, uh, most applications in control, signal processing. Um, uh, this thing we call physical modeling, where you, you want to simulate um, a, a robotic arm, for example, uh, you can do stuff like that in Simulink. Okay. Um, several industries use our tools. Uh, I won't dive too deep into this, um, but uh, you see it's fairly broad in in uh, in its uh, uh, reach, right? Um, and several companies also uh, make use of our uh, uh, products for. for Analyzing their own uh, data. Um, the other thing that that um, you know I particularly represent is uh, the academic team, right? So so we believe very strongly that the three kind of pillars in in the technical space are uh, sort of the undergraduate teaching kind of uh, uh, institutes, uh, which which many of you I believe represent. Um, uh, some of you also represent research universities where. Um, uh, you know, the cutting edge uh, research uh, is done uh, to sort of um, share with the industry where finally uh, most of your graduates 
if you are um, uh, teaching faculty uh, go to right? um, and, and so you know there's a lot of correlation and and, and sort of uh, um, you know uh, there's an ecosystem around uh, around these three right? uh, and we believe we are right in the middle where we can try to enable um, better collaboration and and better um, uh, progress in, in this kind of work uh, and so that's uh, sort of where we want to be at and where we stand, and and hopefully we can uh, we can help you accelerate your, uh, your your research and your your efforts. Right. All right. So so that was the quick introduction. Uh, let me just quickly check uh, how many of you said you want to uh, work on uh, your own computers. I don't see too many yeses, um, which means then uh, unless you want to type in a yes very quickly. Uh, in, in the chat window um, that, that I'm going to probably go a little slower in my demonstration here and um, and, and hence, you know, uh, I'll, I'll probably try to uh, make this a little more uh, 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 you following along my screen kind of a workshop. Okay. Uh, for those of you who said you want to uh, actually do it on your own computers, I'll not let you uh, uh, be disappointed. I'll share the uh, um, documents or, or the code that I'm uh, using uh, as and when I'm demonstrating it, and um, uh, and, and hopefully you can you can uh, follow along uh, once you uh, set things up on your own computers uh, based on the link that I shared earlier. Okay, um, all right. So um, you know one of the one of the themes of this particular event was image processing, right? Um, and so I'd like to. Sort of very briefly define what we believe that is. Right? Um, so, so image processing from our perspective is uh, obviously manipulating images uh, which are made out of pixels uh, to extract some information. Right? And and you may be sort of familiar with these two uh, uh, sort of broad uh, topics. Uh, and and in our mind, the difference between the two is uh, in image processing, typically it's a image in image out kind of a function or kind of a uh, a, a black box, right? Uh, so, for example, with this, um, something like this, you have here as the input image, you could do something like thresholding, right? Which says, uh, give me only the pixels which are greater than this value. Uh, and then the output is something like this, uh, where the uh, values smaller than what you chose uh, are, are kind of masked out, right? Uh, so, image in, image out, and so image processing, typically, right? Um, sometimes we break that rule, uh, uh, but we still think it's image processing. Um, where, for example, you can count the number of pixels that uh, conform to some kind of uh, a rule that you specify, right? Uh, how many red pixels are in this uh, uh, block, right? Uh, and so you can count it and you can say, okay, so there are five pixels here, right? That's also to some extent uh, uh, in the image processing realm. Okay. Um, on the other hand, computer vision. Uh, in our perspective is, um, you know, more of an understanding or, or an inference out, okay? Um, so if you'd like to, for example, say, this shape here looks like the letter A, right? Uh, by looking at this image. So at the input, you have this image here. At the output, you have some understanding of what that image contains, okay? So that process in general, uh, we term it as computer vision, okay? Uh, you know, this is fuzzy uh, out there in terms of, uh, you know, some people uh, say image processing is a kind of a subset of computer vision where you start with this and then you uh, do other more advanced things. Uh, it, it really depends on, on, on who you speak to, but this is our interpretation, right? Um, and, and so uh, to kind of uh, uh, tackle problems in this space uh, from the MathWorks and MATLAB perspective, uh, each of these areas have uh, uh, something called a toolbox. Okay? Uh, and so a toolbox is uh, just like the word describes, a set of functions that we've put together um, uh, that can help you do uh, your analysis in these areas uh, easier. Right? So we have an image processing toolbox and a computer vision tool. Okay? Um, let me actually, um, uh, just to showcase directly what, uh, uh, what you can do with MATLAB. Right? Let me uh, just copy this link here and uh, share the chat with you. Okay? So, introduction. 
um, so this is, um, you, you may notice I'm, I'm in my browser here, uh, and this is something called uh, MATLAB Drive. Okay. Uh, so the idea is, um, uh, you could think of this as an online storage um, kind of uh, space where you can share code and um, um, your data and, and essentially uh, collaborate on, on your analysis. Uh, entirely in the browser. So these days, given that most of us are remote and, and working online, uh, we think this is a great way to, to sort of get started. Okay. Um, so, you know, if you uh, set up your MATLAB trial, um, uh, like I sh uh, shared earlier, uh, in, in fact, the, uh, the, the document kind of, uh, for those of you who may not do this right away, but if you want to try it out later, right? Uh, so there are about four or five steps that you can you know, create your MathWorks account, uh, and then uh, you know, uh, set up some details, share some details with us about what you want to do with MATLAB, uh, and then request a trial life. And this is instant, right? So uh, the whole process takes probably less than uh, five minutes if you do it uh, in one shot. Uh, and then you can get access to uh, something called MATLAB online. Um, so, you know, once you follow through with this process, uh, you will end up with something like this. Okay? Uh, so let me just uh, uh, refresh the page. Um, so it's it's called matlab.matworks.com. Right? Uh, and so this is running on my browser at the moment. Um, I don't need to install anything uh, on, my own, on my own computer. And um, the link that I just shared on MATLAB Drive right, allows you to open whatever code that, that's there uh, on MATLAB online, okay? So, so once you open this drive link here, uh, you can just add and copy this folder to your own MATLAB drive, okay? So, uh, so I'm just gonna make a copy here and show you how that works. Uh, and, and what's happened now is this particular uh, uh, code uh, file uh, has been shared to my MATLAB drive. And so if, if you do this on your own, uh, you should be able to see this folder called introduction here uh, in your own browser, in, in your own MATLAB. Okay. Um, by the way, at any point in time, if we have questions, uh, you know, this is meant to be a workshop. And so uh, if you're stuck, uh, that is not where I want you to be. Uh, I want you to be following along uh, with me. And so uh, if you're stuck, please do not just, uh, uh, give up and, and, and just stay there, uh, uh, either post a message in the chat window or uh, uh, you know, try to unmute yourself uh, or, or, or somehow uh, get my attention. Okay? Um, um, ideally, I think the chat message is, is the right uh, route. Uh, and then I'll try to uh, try to address any problem that you have. Okay? Um, I don't see messages at the moment, so I'm going to assume that uh, you're all uh, either able to follow uh, these steps or you just want to see my screen uh, and, and see how this works. Okay. Uh, so at the moment, I'm going to assume that's uh, that. Right. Um, so um, let me quickly run through for some of you who may be relatively new to image processing um, uh, in MATLAB particularly. Right? Um, this may be very basic um, for, for uh, those of you who are already familiar, but but uh, please bear with me and, and I can show you uh, some interesting things. Hopefully you'll learn something new uh, as well. Um, so let me just go into this folder uh, and uh, this is a live script, right? So this is, uh, you may have seen notebooks in, in other uh, frameworks and other languages. Uh, this is, you can think of this as a notebook uh, in my language. Um, and so let's get started. So I'm going to clear my workspace uh, currently uh, I have nothing, but generally it's a good practice to clear your workspace before you get started. Right? Um, so let me zoom in a little. Uh, let me zoom in a little to uh, show you uh, this clearly, uh, and, and hopefully uh, you can read text uh, okay on your mobile device. Right? Um, so to read images in MATLAB, uh, you may already be familiar is this function called IMG, right? Um, I'm gonna run this and um, you can see what happens here uh, in my workspace, you get an image uh, object, right? Uh, or a matrix. 
um, it's as simple as that, right? Uh, to, to read images into MATLAB. Now, you may observe a few properties here uh, of 256 by 256 um, that the resolution of your image, right? Uint 8 is unsigned integer 8, right? Um, and uh, if you want to know where this particular file that you read is, um, uh, you can type in which cameraman.tim. So that's the file that I read uh, into MATLAB at the moment, right? And so this particular file is, uh, in, is in this location, here, right? Uh, and if you have your own uh, custom image files, you can always drag and drop them into this folder, and then you can just simply uh, uh, give that file name here, uh, and I am read, assuming I am read, can read that type of an image, uh, can, can, can create a matrix out of it in that. Okay. Um, to understand what the contents of this image contain, right, or, or what some of these properties, uh, you, know, you, you could think of these as metadata that come along with the image, right? Um, is you can look at the size of the image, obviously it's 256 by 256, right? So it's a square image, right? Uh, I see a question, uh, thank you very much, uh, about what image file formats are supported, okay? That's a great question, right? So I'll try to address that immediately. Um, it depends on the kind of function you use, okay? So IM read is uh, the sort of the base image reading function in MATLAB. Um, Here's a link uh, to the documentation page for IMD. Okay? So let me show you different ways of opening documentation. So you can just type in doc IMD in the command window here, and uh, it will show uh, the help page here. Okay? Uh, it will take a moment to come up. And then uh, what you can see here is the syntax and the way you can invoke this particular function. Okay? Um, now, the formats that you can read um, are uh, specified uh, here, right? So FMT is uh, the, the format of the image that can be read. Now, uh, I think there are, uh, there's a table of the type of formats you can read in, in time read, uh, and that will come up here. Okay, so here are all of the formats that I'm read can read. Okay. Uh, and so typical formats that you may be aware of, JPEG, uh, PNG, uh, JIT, uh, uh, HDF, TIFF, you know, all of these formats, bitmap can be read uh, using IMD. Right? Now, this is not the only, hopefully this answers your question, but this, these are not the only formats that can be read, right? Uh, some of you may be working in uh, medical image uh, kind of um, applications, right? Uh, as you may have heard in the morning, uh, so, so maybe you're working with, uh, let's say, uh, functional MRI data, right? Uh, so there are functions like uh, Nifty Read, right? Uh, 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 this is I spelled it wrong, but it's N I F T I uh, uh, And so uh, uh, you see there are um, functions that that you know in these two boxes. Uh, that that let you read uh, these custom kind of image formats. Um, Nifty is for functional MRI data, right? uh, and in fact there are um, uh, several other image file formats that you can read, right? like DICOM, for example, uh, it is one other type of uh, format. Uh, uh, there are draw um, um, uh, camera uh, files, right? Uh, that, that have more information than just the JPEG uh, converted or, or PNG converted files. Right? Uh, so there are several other, uh, in, for, for medical imaging, you can there's the analyze format, which is an older version of Nifty, right? Uh, uh, Interfile, there are several other formats that, that can be read. Uh, and so our documentation is probably the best place to, to go through. Okay? Uh, I'm read is typically the, 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 the sort of the big bucket Kind of function, uh, and, and so that's what we're demonstrating here. Okay. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. And, and again, um, please, if you have any questions uh, in the in the process of, of me walking through this, please let me. Uh, all right. Um, so, right. So 
so so now uh, the image is of size uh, 256 by 256 right uh, and it's uint 8 right uint 8 is obviously unsigned integer 8 bit and so you can index into your matrix just like uh, you would in uh, any other language uh, and you can look at the actual pixel value here very easily okay? so 156 here is the uh, is the numeric value of the first pixel on the top left uh, MATLAB is one index, uh, it's not zero index, right? like most other languages. Um, you can look at what the class of the uh, uh, data type is, it's uint, uh, but medical data, for example, is typically in 16, right? Um, uh, and, and, and so you can have uh, uh, change the type, for example, to uh, dub precision if you're doing some interesting mathematics, uh, which I'll uh, showcase later on as well. If you're computing gradients, for example, right? You might want to convert it up. So there are helpful functions here uh, that you can uh, very easily convert data types as well. Okay. Uh, so I'll run this here. And so once you convert the entire image here to double, now the class of this new image or this new matrix IMP is double. Okay. Uh, so uh, you can in fact also uh, uh, look at uh, IM2 tab, right? Uh, uh, so in, in the command window, um, uh, you know, it'll list out as you type, right? Uh, it'll list out all the different conversions that are uh, possible. Okay. And, and this is one way that we try to make it easy for you to uh, explore the, 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 the breadth of functionality that's available. Um, you can do mathematics on your images, right? Uh, compute the maximum pixel value. Uh, you know, the maximum uh, value in the double precision image here, right? Uh, or the minimum value, right? Um, in the interest of making this more interactive, um, I'm wondering if any of you can explain how this works, right? So you see the max of this uint 8 image is 253, okay? But the max of the double precision image, IMD here, is 0.9922, okay? What's happening here? Uh, Anyone, uh, if you if you care to, uh, uh, you know, you may have expected this to also say 253, right? Um, uh, so so clearly we are doing something more than just changing the data type, right? Um, so I see an answer in the chat window. That's absolutely correct, right? Uh, it's 253 by 255, uh, which means that we are normalizing, right? Uh, so that's a quirk in MATLAB, right? That uh, uh, Floating point um, image data is typically normalized, right? Uh, between zero and one, right? So, so thank you for for uh, responding. Um, uh, it is yes. So, so eight bit is two fifty five, right? Zero to two two fifty five, and um, for double precision, essentially uh, the range of numbers could be anything, right? Uh, it, 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 it's infinite, right? uh, theoretically, uh, but we don't want the numbers to be um, just anywhere uh, for uh, several reasons. Um, and, and so um, in the process of conversion, we, we make sure that we normalize the data. Um, and so the max value of 253 here uh, divided by the maximum value of that particular data type here, uint 8 is 255, and that's why it's 0 0.992. Okay, so thank you for, uh, for uh, uh, paying attention and, 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 and responding. Uh, so exactly, this is what it is, right? So okay. um, obviously, then you want to show uh, this image and you want to see what the cameraman looks like, right? Uh, and so you can I am show uh, this image, uh, and then you'll see it kind of looks like this. Okay, so this is uh, let me zoom out a little here. Uh, so so here's how the cameraman uh, looks like. Uh, a little bit of trivia: the 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 uh, Building here in the background is the MIT dome uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, so that's where this particular image was taken. Uh, recently, someone uh, on, on Twitter posted a, a, a 2020 version of the cameraman uh, image. And, uh, it's quite quite funny for, uh, for for them to reenact this, right? So this is a sort of a classic image. Uh, image. Um, you can also uh, I, I'll, I'll try to be a little faster here because I want to show you some uh, augmented reality stuff too, right? Um, so uh, uh, bear with me if, if this is faster than you uh, you, you uh, expect. 
uh, but you can index into images fairly easily here, right? So one pool in hundred means give me the first hundred rows. One pool in fifty uh, is give me the first fifty columns, right? Uh, so now you have only the top uh, hundred rows uh, from the top left here, and uh, you have the top fifty columns here, right? Uh, and so you can see the shoulder of the cameraman here is just about making an appearance. Uh, so we are really in this section of the image. In fact, it's the elbow it looks like it's over here. Right. Uh, so you can index images. And so the, the point I'm trying to make here is really um, it, it's very easy to kind of um, get started and uh, uh, analyze and just, just look at what your data is, right? Uh, with images in MATLAB. Okay. So here is, uh, you know, you don't have to start at the top left, right? You can start at any index screen right? and, and then uh, print out a bunch of pixels here. Um, you can make a copy of the image if you'd like uh, by just assigning like this. Uh, and then you see the pixel values here. If you want to look at the values themselves and not the pixel as, as colors, uh, you can just uh, display them like this. So we're looking at the first 10 by 10 values. Um, now, now, here's another interesting bit, uh, right? Um, so I'll scale down uh, the top, uh, uh, you know, 10 by 10, uh, top left corner, 10 by 10 region of this image by 0 0.1, okay? Um, so I'm multiplying, you, you see the math on an entire set of pixels is easy to do, right? Uh, you just do it in, in one shot or the entire matrix here, okay? So there's that level of uh, abstraction that's, that's, that's being taken care of, right? Uh, imagine doing this in CSC++ where, uh, you know, you have to loop through the 10 by 10 pixels um, uh, in, in two for loops uh, and then do this math on each pixel, right? Um, what's happening here is something called implicit expansion, meaning we are uh, expanding this point one to be a 10 by 10 matrix and hence applying it entirely, right? Uh, element wise, right? Um, but, but notice what's happening here um, is. Um, these values here seem flatter, right? Uh, so notice here, for example, uh, we are 156 on the top, uh, 156 multiplied by 0.1 uh, uh, is 16, right? Um, is that what you're expecting? Um, if, if, if you're expecting something else, um, uh, do post in the chat window. Uh, and if this makes sense to you, also, also post in the chat window, right? Um, it, it looks odd that, uh, you know, mathematically, 156 multiplied by 0.1 should be 15.6, right? Uh, but you're seeing 16 here. So, so what's happening? Uh, if, if any of you want to uh, uh, quickly take a guess and 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 and, and post in the chat window, that uh, I'd really appreciate that. Okay. Uh, and and in fact, it's it's sort of a uniform behavior here, right? Uh, uh, so, all of these pixels also are. Uh, being uh, converted in the same way. Um, so I see a response in the chat window and that's you can absolutely correct. Uh, remember again, the data type is important. Okay? This is uint8, unsigned integer 8 bit, right? Uh, integer, right? Meaning that um, when you do math like this uh, for point one, um, we don't care about the no, uh, you know, non uh, integral part of what remains, right? Uh, and, and so that's something to keep in mind too is, um, you know, 15 point something, um, 15 point six in this case, rounded up becomes 16. So, so, so uh, these are little details to keep in mind uh, while you work with data like this. And so, you know, if this wasn't you in data, if this was double, um, uh, multiplying by point one would have retained uh, the, the, the fractional part. Okay. Uh, so just a very quick uh, image. Uh, and now you can show this modified image and notice that uh, these pixels here, the 10 by 10 on top, have darkened significantly, right? Because the pixel value we've, we've uh, scaled down uh, by, by 10. Okay? And so you can see the effect of, of what you've done uh, mathematically uh, in the image right here. Okay. Um, and you can do other interesting things like inverting the image, which is essentially subtracting from 255. Uh, and so on. Okay. 
um, and you can write the images back to disk by using I am right. Uh, so you read using I am read. Now you write using I am right. Okay. Uh, so there are a few other details in this uh, document about uh, JPEG compression and uh, compressing uh, artifacts, right? Uh, so if you compress at different levels of quality, uh, you can see these artifacts here around edges, which are very interesting. Right? Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into those details, uh, but but I strongly encourage you to please. Uh, look through uh, uh, the rest of this uh, document uh, to see uh, how, how these things work, right? Um, and and the, the, the takeaway message for this really uh, is for you to uh, understand that it's uh, fun and easy to work with images and, and sort of visually make out what might be happening, right? So there's a blocking artifact here, I can zoom in with you. Uh, you know, if you notice here, you see these blocks here, uh, but you don't see them here, right? Uh, so these are JPEG compression blocking artifacts uh, that you can observe uh, in the uh, analysis that you do with images. Okay. Um, all right. So so hopefully that was a reasonably um, detailed introduction to images in MATLAB, right? Um, we'll now sort of graduate a little and and talk uh, start going towards the AR uh, component. Okay. Uh, so, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to hopefully give you a picture of uh, of, of how uh, uh, augmented reality can can sort of be be, be explored. Um, so, one of the important steps uh, in uh, in AI right, is to identify what your current scene contains, right? Um, and um, to do that, uh, a fundamental method is to uh, uh, extract features of specific localized regions in your image, okay? Um, it is important that these features are invariant to, uh, uh, you know, these common um, transformations, um, uh, be it, uh, you know, zoom in, zoom out, or rotations, uh, or, or even brightness and illumination changes, right? Um, so there are different levels uh, from dense to sparse here, right? So the image pixels themselves could be thought of as features, but these are dense features, uh, and we, we we like to more compactly represent uh, uh, details in this image here, right? So we'd like to move towards the sparse areas. Um, one way to do that is to use something called HOG, which is uh, which stands for histogram of oriented gradients. And you'll notice here that uh, you know the, these the gradient orientations here uh, along the spokes of the wheel here, right? Uh, they are aligned uh, along the the the, the 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 gradients themselves, right? So so the handlebar here, for example, is is horizontal if you see here, right? Um, when, when you plot it as a histogram, um, here you can see the spokes kind of make that kind of a pattern here, right? Uh, so you can replace this entire image by uh, this slightly more sparse representation, uh, and that way you can understand what might be happening in these localized regions. Right? Uh, but you can do more. Uh, you can do things like SERP. So SERP stands for speeded up robust features, uh, and these are point feature detectors or point feature um, um, descriptors, right? Where you can say, okay, this region here has this kind of a, a signature or this kind of a pattern in it, right? Uh, and this region here, for example, where you uh, put in your water bottle here, uh, has another different set of features, okay? Um, and by using these, uh, we can then understand the local um, contents of that particular image, okay? Uh, there are more interesting ones uh, like bag of uh, visual words. Uh, and these days with deep neural networks, you can do object, um, uh, detection and localization as well, but we won't go into that at the end. Okay. Um, so what we do then with these features is we find corresponding points between two images. Okay. Uh, so in this particular example, um, the image on the right here is an old map, uh, an aerial satellite map of a particular area. Okay. Uh, you see these roads here and you see uh, these houses here and so on. Okay? 
Now, imagine, uh, let's say, 10 years uh, after this image is taken. Um, you know, these days we have drones, like, like uh, you know, with cameras, like, like the previous speaker mentioned. Um, and, and so imagine you took a drone shot of that same region here, right? Uh, and you see the same road here, um, and, and, and also you see uh, some changes here, okay, uh, in, in, this, in this region. So what you'll want to do with um, this kind of a feature detection extract uh, uh, method is to find points of interest in both these images, right? Um, once you do that, you can um, find the descriptors or the um, features or, or the signatures of those particular regions uh, in both the images. Um, and then you can match one to another. Uh, so this matching that are, uh, you know, this is one of my favorite algorithms it's called uh, randomized sample consensus, okay? A random sample consensus. Uh, it's such a, a, a simple kind of formulation, but it's so powerful and so uh, phenomenal in, in, in how it works, right? Uh, so if you're interested to learn more, uh, please uh, just, just look up uh, RANSAC. It's called RANSAC, randomized or random sample consensus. Um, once you do this, and once you know the matches, uh, you can discard the others because because you don't care about them, right? Uh, and once you have these correspondences, you can then estimate this transformation between the two, okay? And say, okay, so this image here, the drone shot, uh, can be overlaid on this with this kind of a transformation, okay? So that's really what what's happening with this. Um, uh, you know, th this is typically also called the that's image registration workflow, right? You try to register positions of particular uh, objects from one image to another. Okay. Um, so I've, I've shown you all of this uh, to uh, kind of build up um, to this particular demonstration. Okay. Okay, so let me uh, open this particular uh, um, demonstration here. Um, I, I'm running this on my MATLAB uh, uh, desktop. Uh, let me actually uh, share a link uh, to this with you. Uh, for those of you who want to uh, run it on your own computers, uh, and, and you should be able to try to do this uh, on, on, on your MATLAB online. Okay. So let me just post this in the chat window here. Uh, Um, and uh, you should be able to then, uh, you know, if, if, if you're running MATLAB online like this, uh, you, you open up uh, that particular link that I just shared with you in your browser here. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as, as, as you did earlier as well, you can add to my files here and copy the entire folder. Okay, so you say copy folder, and then what will happen is these files will be in your MATLAB drive uh, going forward, okay? Um, so now I should be able to, uh, if I go here, I should be able to uh, bring it up over here as well, okay? Um, all right, so I, I, I'll show it here on, on my MATLAB because I think it's uh, easier for you to read uh, because most of you uh, seem to be uh, following along with me and not running it on your own. So I can zoom in uh, much more easier here. So, so let me show it here. Okay. So uh, the, the concept that I've sort of quickly demonstrated is uh, to uh, 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 to do this feature um, uh, extraction, uh, uh, detection, and matching. Right. Um, so what we'll do is we'll apply that concept to uh, a very simple kind of uh, an augmented reality kind of application. Okay. So we'll load uh, a, a reference image here uh, and, and uh, detect these features, okay? So I'll show you very quickly what the uh, reference image looks like. Um, and uh, we'll overlay um, the, the points and the features that we've detected. Uh, SERP stands for speeded up robust features here. Uh, and so we're detecting those features using this particular function here. Okay. 
Uh, we do a few other things here. For example, we convert the image to grayscale. Uh, these are sort of uh, uh, some of these other methods that, 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 that you typically do with images, right? Uh, because you don't want to extract uh, or detect these features. Uh, uh, you don't need to do that in, in color. Uh, you do it on the grayscale image. Uh, and so here is the image uh, that, that we, uh, you know, is our reference image. It's the queen of diamonds, right? Uh, a playing card. And um, we've also um, extracted features um, and uh, we know the location of these features, okay? Um, and what you can do next is you can uh, sort of move this slider around and plot more and more uh, features on it. Okay, so notice that the number of features that we've detected here increases as I change the number of uh, features to plot. Okay, um, so now we are plotting 80. Now we now we've got 20, right? Um, and, and these are in fact the strongest features, uh, strongest in, in 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 some kind of metric that we've uh, uh, designed. Uh, and if you notice here, uh, hopefully you can see in the queue here. Uh, we, we sort of detect these features, right? In the uh, center of this big red diamond, we detect these features, right? Uh, in, in these circles here, uh, we detect features, right? Uh, and, and so on. Okay? Uh, so this is really what feature detection and, and extraction is. Okay? Um, hopefully this is clear to all of you. Uh, if you have any questions, again, please, uh, Please do post in the chat window. Let me check. Uh, if there are any questions. There are no questions. Okay, great. Um, all right. So then, what we do is we load a scene. Okay. So what we've done so far is we've loaded a, a reference frame, right, um, of, of an object that we care about, which is the Queen of Diamonds. Okay. Now let me load a scene here. Um, and um, what I've done is I've uh, written a, a helper function um, to find the same set of features in this scene right here. Okay, so let me actually uh, open this in the figure window that you can look at it uh, more clearly. Uh, so this is our scene here. Okay, so I've anonymized this person. Uh, he happens to be my colleague. Uh, uh, and uh, what he's doing is he's held in his hand this reference object that we know and we care about. Okay, so the queen of um, uh, uh, diamonds, here, right? Uh, and what we've done also is we have um, detected and extracted the same kind of features uh, in this scene image as well. Okay, so so hopefully uh, you know it's clear what we're doing here. Uh, we've uh, done this feature detection and and extraction on the scene image as well, uh, and, and we can do this for you know with lesser number of Features and you'll see maybe the, the, the scene a little more clearly. Okay. Um, I, I'm hoping so far all of this makes sense. Um, the idea, uh, as you may have guessed now, is to augment this or to change the reality in the scene. Okay. Uh, so what we want to do is um, we want to find this particular object, uh, the, the Queen of Diamonds, that my colleague here is holding up. And we want to replace it with another card. Okay. Um, granted, this is not augmentation. This is to some extent obfuscation of reality, right? Uh, so you you may not want you to, to 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 do this uh, uh, in, in several circumstances, but but this is purely uh, a demonstration of of the uh, algorithms and the uh, methods behind this. Okay? So so please use this uh, obviously responsibly. Um, we, we, we'll then having these two images, remember in the uh, slide here, right? We had to match uh, the points between the two, right? Um, and to do that, um, we can use this function here called match features, okay? So we are getting the features from the reference, the features from the scene, and then we're matching them, okay? Um, remember the, the features from the scene come from this function here, the feature from the reference comes from this function here, extract features, uh, which we've run on the reference image. Okay. Um, and then we match the two. Um, 
and then what we can do is we can show the max features. Okay. Um, we know the pairs that correspond to uh, each of them are pretty much like like this, right? So so we'd want to know that this point in in my scene uh, or, or my reference in this case is this point in my scene. Okay. Uh, this other point in my reference is this other point in my scene, and I want to kind of uh, uh, visualize it and see how 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 they match, how they look. Okay, um, so this is how it looks. Okay, so let me uh, zoom in a little and show show this here. Um, hopefully, this makes sense to you, right? Um, so the way to read this or interpret this is um, the red points here that you see are uh, the points of interest in my scene, okay? And the green squares that you see here are my points of interest in my uh, reference object, okay? And the yellow lines that connect them uh, indicate the, um, the correspondence, okay? Um, now, what you notice here is that there is something interesting happening. Um, given that it's 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 about an hour since I've spoken, I, I'll I'll take a, 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 a maybe a few seconds, um, and, and I'd um, encourage you to please um, think about what what might be what might be off or wrong here. Okay, um, uh, I'll pause for a few seconds. I'll I'll get a, a quick um, a gulp of water. Uh, but if you have uh, some thoughts about what uh, what might be happening. Uh, so I see a message in the chat window. Uh, that's interesting. Yes. Right. Right. So um, yes. Yeah, so so I'm seeing a few messages. Thank you for uh, for uh, uh, interacting. Um, there's a question also. Let me take that up at this point in time. Uh, the question is: Are the identified features randomized for each iteration, or do they remain the same? Right. Uh, so, sir, is deterministic. Um, there is no uh, randomness involved here. So, um, if you rerun sir um, multiple times, you should get exactly the same features. Uh, there is no uh, randomization uh, in case of sir particularly. There could be other methods that are randomized. Uh, so um, you'll have to keep that in mind. Yes. Um, so a couple of other uh, comments are absolutely correct, right? So if you notice here, uh, some of the lines are sort of um, direct matches here. But if you notice, there's a big clump here, which uh, seems to think that the um, features are inverted. So if you notice, the top matches with the bottom. The bottom here matches with the top. Right? Um, uh, and, and so there's an interesting set of. In fact, there seem to be more features that uh, that, that that are uh, kind of um, inverted or rotated uh, upside down uh, than the left. Right. So that's an interesting thing to notice. Okay. Um, Notice that, that these are all matches, right? So, so these are not, um, we aren't um, filtering them um, with, with Ransack yet. These are all the matches. Okay? Um, what Ransack does um, um, happens here in this estimate geometric transform function. What it does is it, it chooses in layers, meaning um, a set of, of, of matching pairs that are self. Um, Help reinforcing in some way, right? Uh, meaning that they, they 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 all conform to this particular estimate of the transform. Okay, and hence they are known as in layer points. Um, so you can do that using the transformation uh, estimate tra geometry transform function, and what it return to you is also this affine transformation, uh, or in this case, projective transformation object. Okay, and if I run this, um, you should see here then. That um, it's showing only the inlines. Okay. And now notice that all of these matches here are consistent with each other, right? Are, are, are they all point to this one estimate of, of our transformation? Okay. Um, so hopefully that, that, that makes sense, right? 
um, here's the interesting bit, right? Uh, what we've done by this process here is we have successfully identified that this particular reference object is in this scene and its location can be estimated using this transformation object that we now have. Okay. Uh, what we can do next is we can insert a new card into this scene. Okay. Um, so let's say we have a Joker card, okay, uh, which is right here. Um, we apply the same transformation that we have estimated earlier. Um, and um, what we do then is we say, for this Joker card, um, if we had um, put it in this scene using this transformation object here, uh, where would it be, right? Um, and, and, and so the, the code is here, it's, it's very easy to read. It's essentially saying, what my Joker image using this transformation object, okay? And my output has to be in this reference of my, um, of my original scene, okay? Um, and, and so that's that's what's happening here, uh, very briefly, okay? Uh, and so you can now see this Joker uh, card, uh, where it would be in the original scene, okay? Uh, assuming that we've identified what this transformation is. Um, finally, what we do is we sort of add the background back, okay? Um, uh, this is a very naive way of doing this, but but literally, it's just adding the scene plus the Joker. Okay, so so this is sort of what's literally happening, and you can see that in code it looks similar. Okay, and, and that's the beauty right, of, of thinking at this level of abstraction is you don't have to worry about these nitty gritty details of you know pixel from here and a pixel from there. You're working in the image uh, uh, space, right? Uh, and finally, you you kind of show this image. And when I run this, uh, you should see that um, here um, we have kind of replaced that particular um, card, um, the um, uh, Queen of Diamonds. We've replaced that with this particular Joker card. Um, obviously, uh, you know, it's uh, it, it, in this age and day of fake news and and things like that. Hopefully, it should be clear to you that this is fake, right? Because there is this contrast uh, and color difference. Uh, we've not accounted for any of that, right? So these are uh, little things to keep in mind with with AR as well. Uh, you can't just simply do something like this, where you just put in another object uh, into your scene without um, accounting for things like that. Uh, but 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 the intent here was to not show you something that. Um, that you can use um, in the in the real world directly, but is to focus on the mathematics and the uh, method that, that that's used uh, behind the scenes to to even set something up like this. Okay? Um, so uh, if you're familiar with the uh, if you watch cricket, for example, you see these days um, uh, you have these cameras which uh, uh, are on drones, for example, and, and they have the entire stadium uh, in view, right? And then the names of these players come up like, in these kind of islands in the sky, right? Um, all of those things are uh, are sort of done um, from a, a foundational perspective. This is the math that goes on behind it. Okay? They have to identify the, the, the positions of objects uh, in your scene already. Uh, and then they have to kind of overlay these other things on top, right? Uh, uh, on top of those things. And, uh, and that's kind of, you know, this is the math behind the scene uh, to do that. Okay. Um, so hopefully this makes sense, and um, and, and, and this was a good um, good first start uh, in some way to uh, to explore uh, augmented reality. Okay. So um, let me go back to the presentation here, um, and we finish this. And um, so so the takeaway point here really uh, to reinforce again is this detect, extract, and match, right? Uh, so remember, we detected surf features, we extracted these surf descriptors, and then in our two images that we had, the scene and the reference, we matched them, right? Uh, 
uh, with which we identified the transformation, uh, the projective transformation uh, between the two uh, uh, images, uh, and that way we could uh, uh, kind of inject a new uh, new object into a known scene in some way. Right? So that was the first uh, takeaway point for you. All right. Now um, remember, surf that I mentioned is just one type of feature point, right? Uh, but there could be very many of them, right? Uh, so you could uh, treat edges as interest points as well. Uh, there are corner uh, points. You could use an entire template of an object if you know. Uh, this is what we used earlier. Uh, MSER is maximally stable external regions. Uh, so this is another very interesting uh, blob uh, feature uh, point. Right, um, and, and so um, you know there are several of these, uh, and uh, uh, you know it, I'd be happy to share this presentation with you later if you're interested to learn more. Uh, uh, in fact, our documentation has a long list of these. Uh, there are more beyond this as well. Uh, in fact, in the robotics world, there's something called an ORB feature, right? ORB. Uh, that's very popular due to its speed of uh, of execution for real time kind of applications uh, and its accuracy as well. Right? So ORB is very popular. Um, now, single image versus a video, right? Um, so we'll try to now jump into the kind of the video processing uh, world, right? Um, there are things to keep in mind, right? Um, you could, for example, uh, if if your uh, application is to detect a face in a in a video, right? Um, what you could do is you could treat each frame in the video as an individual frame um, and then, you know, do the same analysis of detection um, in each frame, right, um, independently, and that would be fine. There, there is nothing technically wrong in doing that. Um, the, the problem is that's not good enough, okay, uh, for the runtime performances. Uh, let me play this video. For the runtime performances that we expect, um, that's typically not good enough. And so uh, this is uh, uh, he's, he's a, a good friend and uh, my colleague um, uh, who is sort of intentionally moving his space um, around in this video. Uh, in, in this video frame, right? Uh, and, and so what you notice is happening here is we have this um, Phase detected, right? Uh, let me play this again. Uh, the, the yellow box around the face is where the estimate of his face is that's automatically detected, right? Um, the other thing that's happening here that allows this to run fast enough is that we're in fact not detecting the phase on every frame, okay? So this is uh, sort of a uh, in some sense, you, you, you could call it, um, uh, uh, we, we are cheating in some sense, right? That that um, what we could do is we could um, detect the phase in one frame, um, and in subsequent frames, we just track the existing phase, okay? Uh, and, and these are like also very uh, well understood, very well known uh, algorithms. This one particularly is called the KLT tracker. Uh, the Kante Lucas Tabasi uh, tracker. Um, and what that does is um, if you detect the phase in one frame, um, or in the video processing world, they're called key frames, right? Uh, and you keep doing it every once in uh, uh, you know, uh, a finite amount of time. Uh, you can track these white points here, if you notice. Uh, you can track these points over the video frame here. Um, and, and the the, 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 the thing is that the tracking of these points is faster than um, redetecting the phase each time. Okay. Um, and so this is the uh, sort of the you know cognitive jump we are making from detecting or or doing something in one frame and redoing it over and over and over again. Right. The, we are not doing that in favor of are tracking and making use of this temporal um, uh, correlation between frames, okay? Uh, and we do that purely out of performance reasons, right? Um, and, and so 
this is the workflow to do this uh, across frames, right? So we first detect uh, the face or, or the uh, object of interest. Uh, in this demonstration, it's the face, uh, and, and we use a traditional method here, uh, the Viola Jones uh, algorithm. Uh, and then subsequently, uh, we use point tracking, right? Uh, and point tracking is is much faster um, than redetecting the face, right? Uh, so that's really what's happening. Now, you know, we've added this track bit uh, now to this detect extract match, um, and this is particularly meant for videos. Right? Uh, there are many algorithms here. Um, uh, in fact, Viola Jones is not a tracking algorithm; it's it's a detection algorithm. But the rest of the ones here, uh, most of these here, uh, can be used for tracking. Camshift is another popular uh, tracking algorithm. Traditional tracking. See, these days, with uh, you know, as you may have seen in the previous talks about uh, uh, visual object tracking and so on, uh, deep neural networks have really pushed the envelope uh, much further. Right, but uh, just for showing you and demonstrating this quickly on our computers here for you to better understand how these things uh, uh, sort of came up, uh, we, we look at some of these traditional methods. I'll show you some of the uh, more uh, fancy ones uh, in the deep neural network world at the end of this talk. Okay. Um, now let me switch over to MATLAB and uh, while doing so, let me also share the link to this particular uh, demonstration that I'm going to uh, use next. Uh, so I'll copy this link here. And post it in the chat window. So this is phase one. Um, so we, um, so this is what I'm going to show again on my desktop here. Uh, but you should be also able to run this on the online uh, versions. Okay. Um, okay. So let me switch over to this other project here. Um, and. Uh, so, so the interesting part in this particular demonstration, right, is um, I won't enable that particular uh, mode uh, purely out of uh, bandwidth reasons. Uh, I don't know if uh, sharing my screen plus my camera and my audio is going to be handled well by my uh, by my network here. But uh, there is a mode in this where you could use a live webcam feed. I've set it to false. Um, if if you want to try this out on your own and change it to true, uh, what MATLAB will do is it will try to pick up your webcam um, feed and then run it on live video. Okay, so this way you can also see um, uh, some other effects of it running uh, live. Right? Um, for the purpose of demonstrating here, though, uh, I'm going to make live to be false. And read from a pre recorded video. Okay? Uh, the algorithm is still the same, uh, but it just won't run uh, on your video. Okay? So uh, if you're trying this out later on your own, um, uh, do also attempt to uh, switch this to okay, and see how it works. All right. Um, so in this particular case, I will not go line by line in the code, uh, but I'll show you blocks of regions which do these. Uh, a variety of things. Okay, uh, I do this in the interest of time. But if you are interested and if you have questions uh, about exactly what's happening here, uh, please do let me know in the chat window. I'll be happy to uh, dive deeper into into any. Okay? Uh, so let me. Uh, okay, so I, so I see a question here uh, about um, uh, is it possible to. Uh, Flash or, or deploy these algorithms onto hardware like Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and FPGAs. Um, that's a great question. Um, um, yes, there are ways to do this. Uh, in fact, our you know, our documentation. Let me just bring this up again. Uh, so there is this thing called Phase Track Raspberry. Uh, so another colleague uh, has, has in fact uh, done this uh, uh, right here. Uh, so let me just open this thing here. So, so we have this documentation example of uh, of how you can deploy this particular uh, algorithm um, onto uh, any ARM target uh, generally, but specifically in this case a Raspberry Pi board. 
uh, let me actually get the page address uh, and post it in the chat window so that uh, you can all read it uh, later on. Um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so Raspberry Pi is one example. Um, if you're looking at Arduino, uh, in my experience, typically uh, uh, image video algorithms, um, you know, the Arduino hardware is not not particularly great at, at doing that. A Raspberry Pi, in my opinion, is, is just about right. Uh, FPGA boards uh, wise, uh, we have a toolbox. I can point this um, to you here if you're uh, uh, It's called the HDL Vision uh, Toolbox. So Vision HDL Toolbox, um, where uh, we can generate uh, HDL or, or very long code uh, to be deployed on FPGAs. Right? Uh, I'll also paste the link here in the chat window if you'd like to read more about it. But um, uh, uh, you know, this is um, one of the workflows that that's available to um, process um, uh, high throughput, high data rate uh, algorithms like this uh, onto your uh, onto your HDL uh, FPGA boards. Um, Depending on the kind of processing you do, uh, this may or may not work very great. Um, but um, uh, you know, again, depending on the hardware as well, you can do things like uh, up, up to 8K resolution for high frame rate video, right? Um, so, so, so it is possible, uh, but but your mileage may vary depending on what you do. Uh, so that's uh, that's another option. So thank you again for the question. Hopefully I, I was able to answer um, uh, these to be well. Uh, and, and please, if you have more questions, uh, uh, please do uh, bring it up and I'll try my best to uh, to respond. Um, all right, so um, in this particular example, um, uh, what we are doing is, um, I think it's better shown um, uh, by, by running it, uh, and then I'll explain what's happening. So let me try to uh, cross my fingers to make sure nothing breaks. And uh, uh, hopefully you will see what's happening. Um, okay, so let me. So, so hopefully, uh, this is the same video as the last time, right? Uh, and what we've done now is uh, this is just a fun. Uh, I apologize to my colleague for doing this to him, but. Uh, uh, um, it, it is meant to be a fun demonstration of how you can overlay objects on a video. Okay. Um, and uh, um, as you can see, um, as he is moving his face through the video, right, uh, we are sort of overlaying these uh, kind of glasses and a reindeer nose, um, uh, typically used in Christmas decorations. Um, uh, we are overlaying that on his face, okay? and we're actually running this on the video. Um, in this implementation that, that I have, there are a few interesting bits that I thought I'll uh, delve into next. Um, um, but uh, essentially, sort of the, the, the outcome is, uh, uh, you know, if, if if you if you remember what we did earlier, right? We we one of my colleagues was holding uh, a, a queen of diamonds uh, card, and then on that static image we replaced uh, with, with 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 the Joker. Right? Um, this is sort of the extension of that algorithm um, to run on videos, right? Um, with the caveat and with the optimization in some way that we don't do this detection in every frame, okay? You could do it. Uh, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Uh, but for performance reasons, this tracking bit is preferred. Okay? Um, and, um, you know, if, if you try this out on your own uh, later on, right? Um, you can try this on your webcam itself. Uh, and what you'll notice is that maybe sometime if you occlude your face, right? Um, uh, in the middle of the video, uh, what what will happen is uh, it will then understand that 
uh, none of the points are still being tracked after the occlusion, right? So it will then have to redetect uh, your face, right? Uh, so so it sort of does that slightly intelligently. Okay, um, but the part of the code that I'd like to uh, show you clearly is uh, so is, is one is this here, right? So uh, we, we've just picked an image of a cartoon glasses thing um, uh, over here, but really you can overlay absolutely anything. Right? Um, we, we've done this for demonstration, but you know if you just modify this file, uh, you should be able to overlay something different. Okay? Um, beyond that, we are using uh, the standard um, Piola Jones face detector. Uh, and what that means is that, um, and this is a classical method, right? this is not a deep neural network method. Uh, and hence, um, sometimes it will fail if you sort of tilt your head sideways and, and if you uh, are in orientations that uh, is not trained uh, for, for that particular method. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. Um, the important bit here is this loop. Okay, so here is our processing loop in the video. Okay, and what we do is um, we check in this particular implementation. You can change it depending on what you're trying to do. Right. Uh, here's the important bit. So if we are not tracking more than ten points, we are in this detection mode now. Okay, where what we do is we redetect the face or attempt to redetect the face. Uh, I'll I'll go into this a little more uh, uh, in in detail later, but but if there are more than ten points that are um, currently available, right? Uh, then in this else part, we are in the tracking mode, right? And the the, the point here is really our processing in this tracking part of our loop should be faster than the processing in this detection part, right? And, and that is the whole optimization that we need, okay? Um, so going back to what happens in detect, right? Uh, remember uh, I mentioned detect, extract, match, and then track, right? Um, in the detection mode, obviously we're detecting points and faces, right? Um, so the yellow box that you see around my colleague's face here, uh, is returned directly from this face detector. Okay, that is our bounding box, right? Um, what we additionally do in the detect stage is we also detect interest points, right? Again, exactly like we did in the queen of diamonds case. Um, earlier, we used the serve features. This time, we use something called min eigen features. Okay, uh, this is a corner feature. It's um, you could have used surf here, but we use min again because it's slightly faster. Points, and then we initialize our point tracker here, uh, which is this uh, KLT point tracker, right? With these points here, okay? So that's what is done in the detect stage, right? Um, we do a few other things uh, also in terms of sort of displaying some of these uh, boxes and things like that, but this is purely visualization, right? Uh, the meat of the method or the algorithm is is over here. Okay, uh, in the so in the detect phase again, just to reiterate, we redetect the face uh, from the Viola Jones algorithm, um, and we detect interest points, and we reinitialize our point tracker. That's what we do in the detect phase. In the tracking uh, step, on the other hand. Uh, we don't have to redetect the face anymore, okay? Um, because that is com computationally expensive, right? So what we do is we just um, update the locations of the points that we've already tracked. Remember, this mode is only entered if we already have more than ten points that are being tracked, okay? If, if the number of points here becomes less than ten, that's why we have this other step here as well. Then we've lost tracking, right? And that's what happens when you occlude your face, for example. Okay. Um, and so we, 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 we are updating the locations of those points. And if we still have more than 10 points, we use the same estimate transformation, 
like we used in the previous example. Uh, we use that and um, find the new uh, location of the bounding box. Okay. Um, so essentially, uh, you know, the box around the face, we, we estimate its new location based on the uh, movement of these points. Okay. Uh, so that's what's done. Uh, everything beyond this essentially is uh, uh, is visualization again. Um, the, the, this bit here is to really um, uh, do that estimation for our uh, 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 for the thing that we are overlaying. You, you remember the the, the the funny glasses and the, and their Indian nose, right? Um, uh, so 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 we do estimate transformation twice. Um, but, uh, but that's what's happening in the tracking. Okay? Um, and that's it. And, and so we, we just run the loop and then we update the, uh, the, the visualization as we keep going on. Okay. So let me run this, uh, uh, all over again, just to show you what the end result looks like. Uh, and it kind of looks like this. Okay. Um, does this run real time is, is a good question, right? Um, so, so that depends, um, on a few parameters, right? Uh, it depends on the resolution of your image that you're, um, uh, extracting or, or you're reading. Um, uh, if you run this, for example, on, on full HD, uh, frames, uh, might be slightly difficult on my hardware or on my computer, right? Um, uh, depends on the, um, specific, uh, algorithm we are using to track these points, right? Min eigen probably is is the fastest uh, amongst um, the, the the methods that we have. But uh, uh, if you want more accuracy and this is more um, sort of mission critical, like right, safety critical, uh, you might want to use something else which is more uh, robust. Right? Um, uh, if you notice here, for example, the the, the phase estimated is is a little tilted uh, for, for for the time being, but then it gets fixed uh, again. Right? Um, and so there are these parameters to keep in mind. Um, to check if it runs real time. Now, um, if you if you try to run this on your own on your webcam uh, uh, feed, um, it is reasonably good. Okay, I, I will not claim that this is uh, you know perfect and, and runs uh, uh, with a high frame rate. Um, it is reasonably good, and, and I'll let you try it out. Um, and you should actually see it track your face and, uh, uh, at least on, on my laptop, uh, here while at home, uh, with, with a very standard consumer, uh, uh, uh processor, right? Uh, it, it, it works reasonably well. Okay. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's what I can say in terms of performance. Um, ah, so, so there's a question related to that as well, in terms of how feasible is this algorithm for running on real time video? Um. For, for a academic demonstration purpose, I think this works very well. Um, uh, are there better algorithms? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so there are definitely better ways to do this. Um, if you're building a, 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 a consumer product out of this, right? Uh, but to demonstrate topics like the difference between detection here um, and tracking here, right? And what happens in each step? Uh, I think this is this is reasonably sufficient. Uh, so 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 uh, if you're an instructor at, at a university, I'd strongly suggest uh, demonstrating this to your students and then having them explore um, improvements to these algorithms uh, or more modern methods of doing this. Um, uh, if you're in the industry and you are trying to build a, 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 a sort of a product out of uh, an application like this, uh, I would I would encourage you to explore other methods, uh, and I'll show you a, a few of the more advanced methods going forward uh, at the end of this presentation, uh, and, and you could explore those methods as well. Okay. All right, so uh, so hopefully that was that was fun and, and interesting. Um, uh, in fact, uh, let me also show you very quickly uh, this uh, drawing. Um, this will run faster on my computer and you'll see also uh, how it looks. Um, uh, in this case, we're not doing the overlay. Okay? So this is uh, clearly running much faster uh, as you can notice, right? 
Uh, so here is this simple detection and tracking. Uh, we're not overlaying the, 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 the funny mask on top, right? Uh, let me run this again just to show you. Uh, this was the same thing that was in the video, but but I'm actually running it in code in my cell. Right? Uh, and so you can see uh, that the overlay bit adds to the processing time, uh, as you might have expected, right? Um, so uh, there's a lot of interesting analysis you can do in terms of uh, profiling uh, how this runs. Uh, and I can use that as a as a way to uh, plug uh, this particular thing for the profile uh, view. Uh, so we have this um, tool here called uh, uh, Profile uh, uh, Profiler, uh, and, and these days it has uh, I'm trying to find out where the flame graph. So, so we have this thing called a flame graph uh, in the profiler, right? Uh, which kind of tells you how long a particular function uh, takes to run, uh, uh, sort of in this graphical view. Uh, and so this is, I think, a good way for you to understand uh, how real time you're actively using. It, it also gives you quantitative numbers here that you can then sort by time and then see which one is the slowest and then try to, uh, try to work through that particular implementation. Uh, but, uh, but but this is one way to identify what your bottlenecks are in your uh, processing pipeline. Right? Um, so so I'd encourage you to please. Uh, okay. Um, all right. So let me go back to the presentation here. Um, uh, again, if you have any any further questions, um, uh, that was a good time to ask. Uh, but 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 what was you know. What we did in this particular demonstration was uh, earlier we did these three things here, right? We did detect, extract, match for a single uh, pair of um, reference object and a scene. Uh, but now when we extend that to a video, um, we also had to do something more intelligent uh, by tracking and making use of our temporal correlations, right? Um, we, we, we needn't have done it, but we do it for performance reasons. Okay. Uh, and, and it's really just, just making use of the information that's available to you all. Uh, and, and so that's that's the difference. Okay. Um, and, and so that's really, again, the takeaway point for this particular demonstration is, uh, uh, you know, for most applications, you can't simply do what you've done for an image for an entire sequence of video. Uh, uh, frames, you have to uh, do things like that. Okay. All right. So now we'll try to very quickly, and, and I won't spend very much time here, uh, uh, but very quickly show you the, the next step uh, beyond. Right. So remember, we started with one frame um, and, and modified that. Uh, then we graduated uh, in the previous example to a video where we uh, overlay a, a, a mask on, on a face. Right? Um, now, what about 3D? Right? Um, there are cool applications um, around, um, uh, particularly uh, one of my favorites is uh, uh, furniture uh, in your in your house. Right? Um, imagine if you could. Um, use your cell phone um, to uh, go through a catalog of furniture um, and point your camera to your living room and um, and can actually sort of place that new bit of furniture in your room um, in the right dimensions and sizes um, and um, show you how that new piece of furniture might look in your living room before you buy it, before you even go to the store. Right? Um, this, this this is really an application which which is um, um, you know a popular um, a global furniture company does this, uh, uh, and it's very interesting that that can be done, uh, and it's just phenomenal that uh, things like this are now available to 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 to. Pretty much anyone who has a reasonably powerful uh, smartphone with a camera, 
right? And that's all that's needed. Uh, th there is one other bit of thing that's needed. I I'm not sure if any of you in the audience are familiar with this. Um, they, they make use of uh, their uh, store catalog as the reference object uh, to, to estimate distances, okay? Uh, and uh, those are the only things needed. They, their catalog, your cell phone, and a camera on your cell phone, right? That's it. Um, the, 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 the point to note here is um, in the real world, it's slightly more in interesting, right? Uh, than, than in our 2D uh, approximation. Um, in the real world, obviously, things are in 3D uh, or higher dimensions that we cannot perceive, uh, but that's uh, another discussion at another time. Um, but, but, but hopefully, we all perceive it at least in three dimensions. And, and so, uh, uh, in the process of transforming the 3D world into, into an image, um, we, we make use of um, approximations like the pinhole camera approximation, right? Uh, so there's a, a bit of math that goes on uh, uh, under the hood uh, to understand the actual dimensions or locations of these 3D points in your 2D scene, right? Uh, and, and this transformation here happens through this matrix called the camera matrix, okay? The, you know, there's a lot of interesting math un uh, under the hood here, but what I want you to remember is that the camera matrix is um, divided into these two different uh, components, the extrinsics, which is um, sort of the actual transformation from the real world to the camera frame, and the intrinsics, right? The intrinsics is what happens between your camera reference frame and your, uh, and your screen here. Where the image is captured, and you know the intrinsics include details like your focal length, your uh, number of pixels, uh, and your dimensions and things like that. Right? Um, and so through these two um, components of your camera, uh, this information helps us to, uh, you know, if, if you know the intrinsics for your camera, you can then go back to the three D world um, to to some extent. Uh, and and estimate where that actual point might be in the in the real world. Right? Um, the use of this is really in situations where you can overlay three D objects in this real world. Okay? Um, particularly if you have a marker like this, which is a unique pattern in your scene, um, oriented in a particular way. Right? What you can then do is you can approximate and estimate the locations of these points in your in your C uh, using these camera parameters, right? And uh, then come up with you know the locations of these points. Um, you know, in, in this particular case, we, we are making use of twelve known points, right? Um, and then overlay a three D shape on your C, okay? In this case, we are overlaying the uh, the backwards logo, which is the L membrane, right? Uh, so that's what we overlay. Um, to run this on a video, um, for this particular case, we redo this uh, per frame. But obviously, there could be uh, other uh, enhancements and, and, and uh, improvements we can do on top of this to make this even faster. Okay, um, but the idea is. Um, if you have a scene like this and you have a known marker like this, um, you could estimate the real locations of these markers in 3D and then overlay this thing on top. Okay. Uh, let me, in this particular case, um, I will not go into the code at all because I think the, the, the concepts around the code are, are, are things that I've uh, kind of already uh, shown. Uh, you uh, in previous examples. I just like to play the video in this case, uh, just so that you you, you see what it looks like. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to share the code here. This is the. And so you should be able to download this onto your own reference. Okay. Uh, I see a question at this point about how to use profiler for a particular function. Um, yes. So so. 
So let me quickly address that here. Uh, you can, uh, let me show you. Yeah. So profile. Uh, if I open the profiler here, uh, again, I'm using the, the desktop version of, of MATLAB, uh, just so that you can see this more clearly. Uh, you can just enter the, the function that you want to run here. Okay. Um, uh, in this profile um, area here, uh, and then you can just say start profiling. Um, depending on what function you want to run, uh, you can add that name here. Um, ideally, you will put the call to that function in a uh, in a script, right? And you will run it repeatedly, maybe like run it five times, uh, and, and, and you know, that way it'll be uh, you'll get a more uh, more accurate measure, uh, let's say, uh, the void of noise. Uh, and this is, by the way, a wall clock type, right? It's not, uh, it, it, it's not, uh, it doesn't take into account things like your uh, OS scheduling and things like that, right? Uh, so it's the actual amount of time it takes. Uh, and, and so uh, you'll have to write a script that calls your particular function and enter the name of the script here, and then just say start file, and that's how you can. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Again, if you have more uh, involved questions, I can come back to come back to you next. Okay. Uh, again, after this particular demonstration. So let me go back to this particular demonstration here, and uh, I'll not go into the code here in the interest of time because I'll also want to show you some uh, some of the more uh, fancy uh, deep learning things uh, at the end. Uh, so let me just run this, and and you'll see. Um, uh, how this works. Okay, so uh, a couple of uh, video, uh, sorry, uh, bigger windows will, will come up. This is again a recorded video. Okay? So what we are doing here is we are uh, using our understanding of this particular pattern and the intrinsics of the camera that we've measured uh, separately. Uh, we can sort of do this odometry, right? So odometry is essentially, uh, this is called visual odometry where you find the locations of real objects with respect to your camera, right? So this red thing here is the position of your camera. If you hold the uh, pattern as a fixed uh, location, okay? On the left-hand side here, let me, uh, I'll rerun this video just, just so that uh, you can see uh, it more clearly. Um, I'm gonna run this again. Um, so, so hopefully this uh, figure here on the right is clear to you, right? The pattern location is fixed, but the camera we are sort of moving around. On the left hand side here um, is the camera point of view, okay? uh, or the uh, you know point of view from the red things here, right? Um, so what we're doing here is we are estimating the location in fact particularly and the size of the cube uh, of this particular point, right? And we're doing that across the, 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 the video frames here, right? And, and once we know the locations, uh, it is fairly easy again to uh, create this 3D uh, rendering on top of it, right? Uh, and, and do the transformation of that particular 3D object uh, such that it looks like it's been placed on top. Okay? Let me rerun this one last time just to Make sure you you you, you follow uh, that this is actually 3D. Right? Notice that there's a little bit of a jitter here. That's because of of Uh, so hopefully uh, that was clear. And uh, this is in fact, uh, if you remember the cricket um, uh, analogy that I that I brought earlier, right? Uh, you know the, the the list of players who are to come next. Uh, you know there are these big uh, you know, when the camera is 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 focusing on the entire stadium from from a uh, from a drone, for example. Uh, all of those uh, player names and these pictures of them and so on. Um, 
they can be overlaid in this fashion. Uh, and this is sort of the, the, the math in some sense behind. It. Okay, um, all right. So, so, so that was um, really the last demo I had to show. Uh, and the point here to remember is uh, that the camera parameters, um, the intrinsics particularly, uh, are necessary to more accurately uh, estimate the real 3D locations of objects in a in a scene uh, with which you can then do things like this where you can overlay 3D objects on them. Okay. Um, that was the third. Now uh, for the last uh, I it's uh, 249 and I have about uh, 11 minutes. So I'll spend a few minutes on uh, on deep learning models. Okay. Um, because no talk on image and vision these days um, is uh, complete or, or uh, accurate without talking about deep learning. Um, for um, what we traditionally consider to be very difficult tasks like image classification, um, deep neural networks as of five years ago um, have, have, have have been proven to be um, slightly better than uh, than human accuracy, right? and this is why deep learning uh, is such a big deal these days. Everyone's talking about it because of the state of the art uh, results that they achieve that traditional methods could not. Okay, uh, notice this is already six years ago now. Uh, time flies. Right? Um, and 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 uh, in fact, this contest it's called the uh, uh, ImageNet Loud Scale Visual Recognition Challenge. Uh, the, the contest even ended in 2017. Okay, so so we are the the academia in some sense has um, has come to a point where they sort of are saying single image classification is mostly a solved problem, right? And they've moved on to visual object tracking and and uh, you know. Uh, instant segmentation, uh, more fancy problems uh, that, that were traditionally not solved. Um, and that kind of goes on to show the rapid pace in which uh, deep learning networks have uh, made progress these days. Right? Um, you can do fancy things like, uh, you know, these are artistic um, uh, developments of, you can combine the style from one image and structure from another image, and then kind of fuse it together. Uh, so this is a lighthouse, uh, which which kind of gives the structure to this image, and this is uh, a painting which gives the uh, style to this image. So you can combine them uh, in this thing called neural style transfer. Right? Uh, really funny things people have done uh, with this. Uh, there are in fact apps that, that that run on your cell phones these days, which can cartoonize your your uh, your, your, your picture and your selfie and things like that. So, you know, people are coming up with really, really bizarre to some extent uh, applications uh, of, of, of things like this also. Right? Um, so, so deep learning uh, very, very briefly is uh, a subset of machine learning where the feature extraction is automated, right? And um, the, the thing to keep in mind really is, uh, you know, deep learning, models scale with data better than uh, traditional machine learning models. Uh, what we mean by that is uh, typically uh, the more and more data you give to a deep neural network, um, the better its performance gets um, over a larger uh, set of data scales. Um, uh, which means that if you think your learning algorithm isn't performing well enough, if you give it more data, typically its performance improves. If it's a deep learning, uh, machine learning models traditionally they saturate at, at some point, and beyond that, even if you give more data, it, it's not necessarily going to uh, you know they, they plateau and, and their performance uh, generally does not does not improve. Right? Um, you know, typically a convolutional neural network kind of looks like this. Uh, you know, you have an input image, you have a bunch of layers in between, and that's kind of why it's called a deep neural network because there are 
many layers right? uh, and convolution obviously is, is our uh, bread and butter uh, method uh, that, that, that happens in each of these layers some of these layers, and not all of them but some of these layers. and then finally at the end depending on what you're doing uh, you've seen um, sort of uh, uh, and heard earlier in terms of uh, transformer structure and things like that um, and so depending on what you're trying to do you know this structure can can, can quickly become much more complex okay? uh, over here the demonstration uh, just, just to show you is, is a classification network where at the output it says okay i think this is very likely a goldfish i don't think it's very likely to be any of these uh, these are numbers that that come out here uh, in terms of probabilities but the highest probability typically we assign to the category here um, now i brought that up um, and that's a very simple kind of structure um, to motivate this right so so you can quickly go and build really complex um, structures or networks that can do more interesting things from the ar as well as the uh, activity analysis kind of perspective right so there's this network called posenet which is um, now uh, maybe a couple of years old um, where what they do is if you have an image with some people in it, right? Um, what you can do is you can sort of detect bonding boxes around people. And then there are other networks to do this. It's the POSNET doesn't have to do this, but I'm just showing you the uh, sort of the sequence of tasks or sequence of things that happen uh, in, in the process of, of, of uh, going through POSNET. Okay? So you can detect boxes using the object detection uh, networks or, or traditional algorithms like the aggregated channel features uh, method. Um, and then you sort of resize uh, to a particular aspect ratio and then do this here where you regress uh, certain key points. Okay, uh, And these key points are uh, sort of located such that uh, they correspond to the joints in your in a human uh, body. Um, and finally, you can sort of reposition that to your original image, and that way you can kind of figure out um, what the pose and hence pose net of a particular person is. Okay. Um, really, there's a lot of technical sort of details involved in each of these steps, which I'm not going into, but, but at a high level uh, or a sufficiently high level, I just thought I'll, I'll, I'll bring up that uh, there are sort of methods these days with which uh, uh, with a deep neural network with which you can do stuff like this where you can detect uh, poses of people and so uh, obviously this is not state of the art there are ways that you can also detect uh, uh, digits of fingers and uh, more uh, higher resolution poses than just stick figures like this and so on right but this is just something that uh, that, that that's worth uh, exploring if you in this sequence. Okay. Um, the the uh, I'll just briefly show you this one other thing also in terms of um, uh, uh, you know, if you want to play around with with, with PostNet in the MATLAB framework, uh, and I'll not claim this to be obviously the only framework that that has code to do this, um, but um, I, I'll just post uh, this link here to our GitHub repository. Um, in fact, uh, we have a GitHub group called MATLAB Deep Learning, right? um, where um, uh, anything that's uh, uh, reasonably new, uh, for example, this one's updated four days ago, right? um, uh, that, that we work on, uh, we post on, on GitHub now. Uh, and, uh, and you can sort of look at uh, some of these examples here as well, uh, beyond just some of the topics that I've uh, shown so far. Object detector using uh, YOLO V2, for example. This is really fast and, and runs, uh, uh, you know, at greater than uh, uh, real time in terms of 60 frames per second. Right? It runs pretty fast. Uh, if you're doing uh, exploring NLP models, uh, uh, transformers, and so on, at this particular repository, and so on. Um, so I posted the link to that. So given that I have two minutes remaining, um, where, you know, just to sort of summarize, uh, there's a lot of iterative exploration in, 
in in these algorithms and in these methods and and, and i'm hoping that uh, uh, you know uh, through matlab or or any other framework that that, that you uh, choose to use um, uh, you know there's, there's these three steps in terms of accessing data exploring uh, and you do this iteration over here right? uh, and, and sharing results if you choose to use matlab to do this kind of work uh, there are a lot of features uh, that, that, that help you at each stage. Um, particularly uh, uh, you know, interesting for me are these uh, uh, graphical interfaces. So this registration workflow, right? this uh, uh, reference image and the scene, and then finding the corresponding points between them that we looked at earlier. That entire thing can be done um, interactively through this registration app. Okay? You don't have to write one line of code. All of that can be done uh, interactively, uh, and you can make the app generate the code for you. Okay, that way the learning curve is 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 very flat, and it's easy to to pick these things. Okay, um, this is the generate function option in many of these uh, applications, uh, uh, which which can generate code. Right? Um, and so here are a few other reasons why you might want to consider using MATLAB for this kind of work. Um, the, the other thing that I haven't touched on, but there's a question about it, was to generate uh, HTML code or C++ code or even CUDA, right? So you can generate uh, other uh, higher performance code, for example, depending on your hardware from MATLAB today. Um, so I'll leave you, I, I know it's three o'clock, so I'll leave you with these three takeaway points, um, uh, which we've gone through uh, in detail. Um, and uh, thank you again for your attention. Uh, if there were questions that you had in mind that you couldn't ask um, for whatever reason, um, this is my email address. So please uh, reach out to me and I'll try my best to answer as soon as possible. Um, I don't see any other questions at this point in time in the chat window. So uh, I'm going to assume that there's nothing at this point, uh, but I'm going to be around till the end of this event. And so uh, do post in the chat window and I'll be happy to, to address and if that comes up. Uh, thank you again for your attention. Uh, back to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Amit. Uh, so that was a very uh, well explained uh, session and also some of the things that you drived uh, hands on. So I would encourage all the participants to feel free to post questions uh, to Amit. Uh, and uh, as we speak, I'm also pasting the feedback link on the chat. So I request all the participants to uh, do provide uh, your feedback here. And also be cautious while filling the uh, details in this form as we would be using the same details that you enter to generate the certificates as well. So irrespective of uh, uh, questions to the speakers, if uh, any other participants or attendees have anything to share with us or so, so we have also pasted the feedback link in the chat so you can um, share your feedback in, in, in the specified link and also please be cautious uh, so that uh, we would be using the same information that you uh, fill in here to generate the certificates as well. Uh, I would also request all the participants to unmute yourself and share any uh, feedback if you have uh, in the session uh, and also uh, queries if we have anything to Amit as well. Uh, we still have uh, Abhinav with us, so if there are any questions uh, in, uh, for the morning sessions as well, we would be happy to take that as well. Comments, feedback, questions. Yeah, to, to add on to that, we also will be collating the materials what our speakers have agreed to give as well as the recording of the session and uh, we'll be sending it to SPS and they in turn will share us the link where we can share it with all of you maybe in a week's time. 
and uh, in couple of days we should be able to generate the certificates of all the active attendees who had uh, come to i mean who had attended the entire session yeah chengappa i guess uh, we can conclude uh, there are no more questions which are coming up and we'll uh, we can also email the feedback link to all the participants who had attended our sessions sure sure dr abhishek we can do that uh, so yeah so we would be uh, sharing more details uh, to all the participants over the email so please stay tuned uh, to the emails and thank you uh, once again for sparing your uh, weekend time with us and being a part of this IEEE SPS forum. Yeah, thank you all, uh, uh, all the speakers and all the participants. And thank you, Amit, uh, for being uh, with us till starting to end, especially. And you were also part of our, work. I mean, entire sessions. Thanks for that. And. Uh, uh, there is some feedback from participants. Can we have a few sessions in future focusing on biomedical signal processing? Yeah, Ravikiran, definitely we can plan some of the things. So me and Shailesh will uh, see and we can come up with some uh, uh, half day sessions on biomedical signal processing. We'll plan for that and we'll keep you posted. Yeah, and uh, thanks a lot, Chengappa, for being uh, with us for a whole day and moderating the entire session so wonderfully so that it it uh, gave life to online sessions as well so thank you all and uh, we'll hope you will hope uh, that we will see you all in some other sessions of ieee signal processing society as well as ieee bangalore section thank you and we'll end the meeting if you have any feedbacks you can reply to the email also where you will be uh, to me or chengappa or to webex email also thank you bye